is the moment of the, the Srabilandas, which is moving, and this is the moment of Srabilandas, along with it may enter the Himalayas, and from the Himalayas it entered the Western Ghats, and from the Western Ghats it reached to Sri Lanka. This is the moment of Srabilandas in, in India. Then come to the Okay, can you see this? Yeah, yeah. We can no, see go, it. So, it's okay. Yeah. Yes, travel to through yeah. all these. Look, uh, we can see that. Okay, okay, okay. Then this is the Western Ghats. And that the end of the Western Ghats, at the, uh, the Tapti region of Gujarat, uh, there is one point of diversity. That is the diversity the, 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 that area. And uh, then it reached the. Uh, Baba Budan Hills and it moved to the Western Ghats through the uh, through the Western Ghats to reach the uh, extreme most end, the Agastya Mala Hills. And one of the diversity goes to the Eastern Ghats like this. Then come, then I, I during the last 25 years, I traveled all the areas in search of the strawberry and the strawberry and this. this picture is what I what uh, somebody could see from the, the, the sea. This is the Mahabaleshur from the Maharashtra. This is a Cas Plateau. This is Satara. This is Sindhu Durg, and these are Baba Budan Hills. This is Shimoga. This is Kudremukha and Kurg, then Nilgiris. Then there's a dip in the Western Ghats that is a Palkad Gap. Then the uh, Nelliambadis, and this is the highest point in the Western Ghats, Anamale High Ranges. Then Kardama Hills, where the largest tract of every forest states, then the extreme most in the south, the Agasti Mala Hills. That is the extreme stretch of the West Tankers. One can see from the sea. And this is a this is map of distribution of Strabella, this in the entire West Tankers. So this is an, uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, <coughs> the distribution map of the West Tankers, uh, Strabella in the West Tankers. Then if the in the West Tankers, all the 61 species of Bailanthus are plotted in a spot in the West Tengar. This picture will appear. See, by Strobelianthus itself, the entire West Tengars are decorated. More concentration in the southern part, Strobelianthus and the West Tengar. 64 species of Strobelianthus are plotted in the entire West Tengars by their plugins. And then this is the uh, picture, Strobelianthus. And Nilakurni, Nilakurni is actually Sobil and the Skundianus, and that is present in the southern West Show me move, move the, the slide. Slide is not that uh, Kundiana slide. You oh, yeah, not moving. Oh, there is some problem regarding the no, no network. Problem, you relax. <laughs> no, no, much, no, but I am confident about this thing. Yeah, yeah, and uh, now it's coming. Uh, is it okay? Yeah. Ah, oh, this is strawberry and the spunty anus. It is present in the nilgiris and the anamelis. These two locations are beautifully furnished by the vast flowering of the nilgiri, uh, strawberry and the spunty anus. That is nilgiri, and then this is this is three main species of strawberry and the strawberry and the spunty anus in the southern western Ghats. And Strabil and the Cecilis in the central Western Guards, and Strabil and the Skalosa or Carvi in the in the northern Western Guards. See, these three species occupy the, the grasslands present in the Western Guards. Strabil and the Skalosa or Carvi in the northern part, Strabil and the Cecilis in the in the central part, and Strabil and the Skondianus in the in the southern part. See, very beautifully, Western Guard is actually actually uh, partitioned like like anything like anything on this this is the on a, on a, on a meteorology of the western guards in the in the deccan side there is a rain shadow than the and the malabar there is a rain flood area now the entire system collapsed in all parts of the western guards all parts of india there is a plenty of rains plenty of rains and then this is the southernmost part of the western guards the Agusti Mala. And then this is the Eridical National Park, the highest point on the Western Ghats. This is the Anamadi Peak where the Eridical National Park is situated. And then this is also the Eridical National Park, the paradise of Srabilandas. Then this is the Mishapuli Mala, a very beautiful, magnificent hill in the Western Ghats where is the plenty of Srabilandas move, move the slide. You have to move it. Uh, it is not moving now. 
think there is some problem there. I think so. I don't know how that happens. Still? Yeah, yeah. It shows, sir, but we can see that no problem. But just oh, okay. we'll. Oh. Is it okay, Nilamadi, Kerala? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay. Now, this is Silent Valley National Park. It is also in Kerala state. And then we are moving to the next slide, Niligris. It is in Tamil Nadu. Plenty of endemic balsams and subilandas are there in Niligris. Then this is the Tadiyende Mall, Karnataka. Karnataka. See, all the forests are margined with the Plenty of stability on this. The thick is uh, Nelliambadi. You move the. Sir, so you just click, uh, press that uh, where whichever slide yeah, you are. Study and demol. Okay, there's a problem regarding the arrangement. Sir, so like this, if you are clicking, it is coming, sir. So, like that, if you are moving, it will be. Okay, is it study and now? Yes, yes. Karnataka. See this, you, you see this marginal shrubby area, all things are shrubby like this. And I could not see it's in flowering. It may be a new species. It may, I'm not confident about its identity. It is a new thing. Still, it is in growing vegetative condition there in Tadi in the mall. Anybody can go there and find it as a new species. Then this is dog funds. In Karnataka, Jog Falls, plenty of stubble and the sir, they are growing in the walls of this falls. Sir, click and on the slide, sir, please. Okay. No, no, sir. Still? Yes, grasslands. This is, a, this is a grasslands in Chikkamagalur, Chikkamagalur, Karnataka. I could see a strobilandus there. It is strobilandus papillosus. I could collect it after 170 years of its original publication. It was thought as extinct. And then this is Mulliangari Hills. Mulliangari Hills of okay, Karnataka. Okay, okay. 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 Mulliangari Hills, Karnataka, the highest peak in, in Karnataka state. And then this is Kudremukha. Can you see Kudre Mukha? No, sir. Uh, it's not moving. This is yeah. Kudre Mukha, Kudre Mukha National Park of Karnataka State. And then this is again, again, Baba Buddha and Hills of Karnataka State. The grassland social trolley ecosystem is there. Very beautiful ecosystem is there in that area. And then this is grassland shola ecosystem, Baba Buddha and Hills of Karnataka. Can you see this gas plateau? No, sir. Uh, it's not here. Gas plateau is here with the beautiful shrubby land. Yeah. Is it okay? Gas plateau, yes. grasslands, gas plateau. It's the highest plateau and the most beautiful plateau in the Indian Western Ghats. It is made up of many species of endemic shrubby land. There. And then this is uh, the Sintu Durg area of Maharashtra. It is also with the tabletop of mountains there. And then this is. Uh, this is uh, the Mahabaleshwar with uh, uh, iron rich soil mountains are there. And then this is uh, uh, I, my, my methodology is nothing but traveling through all these areas during, during the last 24 years. Data from local uh, areas are also collected from this area. And then 64 speeds of billions in the Western Ghats, I could collect. 64 speeds, so one fifth of the entire global biodiversity is there in the Western Ghats. Western Ghats. And can you see 64 different stems? No, no, sir, we can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, okay. Now, 64 different stems of strobilandus. Huh? Okay? Yes, yes. Okay, 64 and a shovel and the scar, 61 kinds of stem modifications, and then then 64 uh, different kinds of leaves are there. Yes. See some problems. Yes, sir. We we see that 64 This is the 64 different leaves are there because the slides are very, very heavy. That is, I think so. Yes, you sir. cannot see. And then this is the uh, 64 different flowers. Can you say 64 different flowers? No, no, sir. It's not moved. <laughs> I am checking your, your patience. 
four. This is the 64 different flowers of strawberry numbers. I can get it again by this thing. When you can see it, okay. And this is the uh, strawberry numbers, Agusti Malayana. It is present in the southernmost end of the of the West Angles. And then this is strawberry numbers, Amabilis present in the Silent Valley National Park only. And then this is strawberry numbers, Andersoni, so and the Sandersoni present in Erevil National Park only, only few individuals are there. And uh, it's, it was a dis rediscovery after 160 years. Bedroom published it in 1855. And after that, there was no knowledge about this species. And Dr. Venu from Botanics of India declared it as extinct. And I was the one who uh, found it in the forest in live condition, not in dead, in the herbaria, but in the field itself. I could get it. And then this is uh, this is a picture of Stabil and this Anderson, say, four flowers. How beauty it is. Uh, its beauty cannot be compared. Its beauty cannot be described in pictures, which is, should, should go there in the original habit. You know, can see it in flowers. And then this is Stabil and this Barbatus. Barbatus seen along the African forest. It's endemic to Western Guards. I said that most of the species of Stabil and this are endemics. And then this is Stabil and this Orita present along the southern western cuts in low land evergreen forest and then this is the is a famous curvy of the north and western cuts the entire grasslands uh, at, an, at around altitude it's 800 meters to 120 meters 1200 meters are covered with this kind of stubble and this which is which is the curvy of the western cuts curvy of this pride of the maharashtra and it's seen along the uh, along the north and western guards only covering the grasslands at an altitude of about 200 meters and then this is uh strawberry land this canaricus strawberry land is canaricus because it is present in karnataka only in the in the, in the grasslands and then this is uh, uh strawberry land this Strawberry and the consanguineous, it is present in the Nil and the, the Nelliambadi Guts, Nelliambadi Forest. It is very common there in Nelliambadi. And then this is Strawberry and the Scordifolium, which is present endemic to the Nilagris. Nilagris, the eastern side of Nilagris are covered with this kind, this Strawberry and this. And then this Strawberry and this is present in the eastern side of the Western Guts. It enjoys the a morning a morning light and it, it it is there it is there as in association with many other species and it's a dry living strawberry and the species and then this is uh strawberry and this decurrence it is present in the deep every forest in the western guards and then this uh, is strawberry and this dupini present in kerala only it is uncommon, very rare in Kerala, in along the cuttings of the rocky cuttings in the Evergreen Forest. And then this is probably on this uh, uh, foliosus. It is present after an elevation of 1,600 meters in the in the West Angles, in, in margin of the Shola Forest. And then this is this is probably on this gracilis. It is one of the largest species of the strawberry landers. It flowers once in 15 years. Once in 15 years it flowers. And it is one of the largest species of the Western Guards present along the things. And then this is Strabilandus homotropus. Strabilandus homotropus. When it flowers, then the Trola forest is in is in flowers. And then this is strawberry and this homotropus, one of the most beautiful species of the strawberry and this. And then this is uh, uh, strawberry and this homotropus again. When it flowers, the shola forest is blooming. The entire shola forest is in blooming condition when it is flowering. And then this is uh, strawberry and this uh, uh, integrifolies. It is present along the low line. Evergreen forest after Kasaragoda towards the north. In Goa, up to Goa, it is present in the lowland evergreen forest. And then this is strawberry and this Ixiosipalus, uh, <coughs> uh, which is common and only there at the Cast Plateau in Sadara district of Maharashtra state. It is very common, but it is there only, strawberry and this. 
Ixio syphilis. Then Strabil, this is Strab, uh, this is an actually Strabil. Germany, my students uh, named this species. It is from the Castle district. They named this species, uh, 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 respecting my, my name there. And then this is Strabil and the Scandini. Strabil and the Scandini. Kandan was a forest watcher who died while he was doing work. And the name I named this species along to commemorate his name in the conservation field. Then this is Strabilandus, the most beautiful plant, Strabilandus. Kuntianus, the most popular species of this species is Strabilandus, Kuntianus. And then this is again Kuntianus. This is, this species is Strabilandus, Lanitus. And when we come to know its beauty, this again is Strabilandus, Lanitus, the most beautiful of all species. Gamble named, Gamble commented that uh, it to us, the, it is the most beautiful species of Strabilandus. It is present in a short and narrow area in the in the Niligiris. It is bordering up in Silent Valley National Park, and there only it is present. So cute and so rare, also its presence. And then this is Strabilandus uh, uh, folio lausoni. It is also very rare in the margins of working forest at the Silent Valley National Park as an endemic to the Niligiri, Niligiri Hills. Hills and then this is this is Trabilandus lupulinus, very common in the southern part of the West Angles, very common, especially the, in Karnataka, it is very common there. And then this is uh, actually a picture of Trabilandus lupulinus, who can evaluate the beauty of nature we will be wondered in front of this ephemerals where we are claiming that uh, the custodians of the beauty. And then this is a very uh, uh, interesting species of Strabilandus. Its flowers is very thick and black, blue, blue black color. It is common and only there in the in the in the area of the National Park of the Southern Western Guards. And then this is this is an, a, a new species named Maimi. It is probably on the Smilabarka, uh, collected from the Uttara Kannada area of the Western Ghats. Western Ghats. And then, uh, okay, this is probably on this uh, <clears throat> Micranthus. It's flowers once in 15 years. It is endemic to the Erivala National Park of Southern Western Ghats. And then this is again Strabilandus uh, microstachia. Microstachia is rare in the Erivala National Park only. Nowhere else it's represented. And then this is a very beautiful plant, Strabilandus neoasper. It's a, a bordering the Shola forest of the Western Ghats. Very common, very common there, but uh, there only it is presented. Is the thing. Then this is the uh, strawberry and this Nilgirim six. It is named after Nilgiri Hills. It is very beautiful in the horse Nilgiris. And then this is strawberry and this Papillosus only in Karnataka, only in in Baba Budan Hills, only there. In, in some in one or two sholas of the Baba Budan Hills, it is there and it is like a tree. I can we, I could climb on the tree when I visited that place and uh, it is one of the very critically endangered strawberry and the person in, in Karnataka, Baba Budan Hills. Sorry, Babod and Hills only. And then this is uh, again one more narrowly endemic species, the strawberry landers in the in Nelgiri Hills. It is there only, there only. It is very period is 10 years. And then this the strawberry landers, Palniensis, you may hear about the Palni Hills, one of the section of the West Angles, and it is there, but uh, its presence is noticed in other areas also. And then this is strawberry landers, Pushpangadani, named after the Pushpanga then who was the director of the Tropical Botanical Garden and, sir, and sorry to interrupt this, sir. Uh, okay. Uh, it's positive of time kindly conclude within five minutes sir. Okay. Definitely. Definitely. I can conclude within five minutes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank, you, Thank you for it. This is probably on the Sreticulatus, present only in Bellari part of the Western Guards and you know where else. And then And then this is Strobel and this Rubicundus evergreen forest. And then uh, and then this is Strobel and the Saint Thomianus named after the college where I am teaching now, Strobel Saint Thomianus. And then this is Strobel and the Sicilis. And uh, 
this is also stable and the sessile is present in the caste plateau of the Maharashtra. Uh, it is also stable and the sessile is very rich in the caste plateau. This is stable and the <coughs> sessile is very the sessile is which flowered this year. This is again a picture of stable and the sessile is present in the Kurg part of the Western Ghats, and then this is of the second socialist. This is Robel and the Tristis white flower seen along the Nail Greece. And then this is the, again a picture of Strabil and the Tristis. This is Strabil and the Ursiolaris, endemic to the Shwalaf of animal hills now areas in the world. <clears throat> then this is Strabil and the Svirantur Kumarana. This is Strabil and the Violaceous, and this is Strabil and the Valkyrie. Stubble and this Ariensis, Stubble and this Ariensis, Stubble and this Whiteyanus, one of the very rare species of Stubble and this present in the Mukurti Valley Sanctuary only. And this is again a picture of Stubble and this Whiteyanus, Stubble and this Sankarianus. This species is very significant because it is the longest, it is the one with the longest flowering period city. It flowers once in 16 years. 16 years, it is person in the Edible National Park only. This again, Strabil Sungarianus. This is the Strabil and the flowering, mass flowering of Strabil and this in the, in the in Western Guards in 2018. It is a picture I could take from <clears throat> a hills where people are queuing to see uh, queuing to take a ticket to enter the Edible National Park for seeing the beauty of Strabil and the species there. And then in 2008, I could see 25 species of strawberry and bloomed together in Erwigla National Park. And, and uh, 25 species, these 25 species will bloom again together in the and then in the Western Guards only after 86 years. And definitely, definitely, I will not be there. You will not be there, but the habitat will be there because, because. Mm, because uh, because because it is the unsubstitutable beauty Air and uh, western Guards cannot be substituted by anything the habitat cannot be substituted by anything so it must be there it must be there it is trouble and reticulatus i could see it in bellary other part of the bellary is like this fully destroyed for iron or mining this also bellary hills and this is the thing the last sir, kindly place, move sir. the slide sir okay, okay 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 this is the picture uh let all plants bloom let all flowers pollinated and and i think i think we uh we are we are new generation people <clears throat> we enjoy nature we uh, take all the benefits of the nature and for all the crimes that we did towards the nature we have justification definitely we are justification we are not doing good things we are doing the we are we are justifying the things what we did we are justifying the things what we did so that is a new generation people and uh, my plea is that uh, we are the new generation i also uh, agreed with you but uh, but uh, uh, but we are we are not the last generation we are not the last generation and and what we should do to nature is that uh, it is uh, western Ghat is now a rare a bare rock on the bare rock there is uh, the last fruit of the plants or especially sobeilandas then in the last fruit there is one last seed the last seed has one request and that request is called uh, let me germinate let me germinate i am concluding with uh, these messages love and thanks to all who listen to me thank you very much i am very sorry for the uh, inconvenience and disturbances compared to my slide during this presentation so we would understand because of the high file you have uh, yeah uh, there is Most a feeling the... so it was very clear is that no problem we would understand everything there is a saying goes like this if you love for something is so deep and intense it would transform you into the object of your passion or you could metamorph into it we have just witnessed your passion towards Nilakurini and the collection of 64 species and give a eye sweeping even so technically strong presentation. Thank you very much for the beautiful show, sir. Uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and take a few questions. Uh, one question is uh, like this, any studies are available to induce early flowering through growth regulators? 
Okay, one thing, one thing, one thing. I'll, I'll end up very soon. Okay, sir. Uh, surveillance flowers uh, uh, after taking a long period of vegetative growth. Uh, induction of flowering to <clears throat> the species has not been done in any place because uh, very few species only are available with us that can be grown for our, uh, our uh, experimental purposes. Experimental purposes, And most of the species are growing in very uh, specific climatic conditions. These climatic conditions can be given to a very, very specific set of uh, shabalans only. So, uh, uh, conducting such experiments with regard to the shabalans is almost impossible. And uh, tries and uh, attempts are being done to plant the shabalans in low areas also. But most of the uh, attempts were were were, were not no, not success. Uh, so another question from T N Saha. What is the mode of propagation of these species? Only through seeds. Only through seeds. Okay. Because they, they produce seeds in plenty in the last year of its growth by flowering and they distribute the seeds to the surroundings and then they die off. The die off. They, there is no possibility of propagation of the plants by vegetative methods. And I think it, it can be done in, in, in the middle stage of their growth. So for, for example, the Stabilandus kundianus can be can be replanted in some places by plucking the seedlings in a sixth or fourth years of its growth. And attempts are being done in a rural national park. There are some attempts to, to seeding in, in, in grasslands where Swabilandas were once growing. Uh, so another okay. question from one Nitya Devi, whether the okay. crop has been domesticated or any research work has been done on this aspect? Very few species are domesticated and planted in some gardens, in gardens. But that, that planting is done uh, uh, by the strawberries, which, which, which are growing in that area itself. It cannot be, it cannot be planted in an area where the uh, ecological conditions are not available. Attempts were done in some play in some plants where it can be grown in some gardens where the ecological conditions are artificially given. I think some of the questions will answer by this uh, question because another some questions are can Strobelandis be grown under Prune condition or Ernagulam or Trishu districts of Kerala? I think the uh, this answer will go with that. And some, under... some common species, some common species are planted in some areas. Common species. Okay, sir. Uh, uh, but uh, when people want to grow an endemic and more beauty plants, that is, uh, I think, it's still uh, up to date, it is not possible. It is not done yet. Uh, sir, one more question. Uh, this is the last question. Sir, what is the viability of seeds? <laughs> <laughs> that question I tested in many field areas. See, so, so for, for example, strawberry and the scondianus, it's produce. It, one plant produces seeds of around 7,000 seeds per plant. 7,000 seeds per plant it is produced. All the seeds get down to the soil and they germinate. Almost all the seeds are germinated, except a few seeds which were eaten by the birds and other uh, frugivorous uh, animals. And, and the thing that uh, of the 7,000 species of you know, 7,000 uh, seeds, uh, around 700 species, 700 uh, seeds germinate. And of the 700 species, a handful of species will come up up to a sixth year of its growth. And towards the end of the growing, the plant, the area will have the same number of plants where the, uh, the parents were in number. See, no increase in the number of individuals, but increase in the area of its occurrence. That is the thing. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Few more questions are there. Uh, we will uh, mail you, sir, that questions, and yeah. you can, if you have time. Yeah, you yeah. Can and you, you may give my number to the audience. Yeah, sir, it's can... there. You can uh, in the screen. You can sh see your mail ID also, so all participants can mail to him also. Yeah. In, in any questions, I am I am ready to okay. answer. Thank you very thank much, you. sir. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll move on to next presentation.
uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tejasuni Prakash, Principal Scientist, Division of Flower and Medicinal Crops, ICR, IAHR, who has 33 years of research experience in flower crops improvement. As an outcome, she developed varieties in two tuberose, two carnation, 11 rose, and nine marigold varieties. Similarly, genetic stocks also developed in carnation, rose, and marigold. One variety of rose and two marigold varieties were commercialized. On her account, more than 50 peer-reviewed research papers, more than 25 popular articles and five technical bulletins. Madam is recognized as postgraduate teacher and guide of ICR IRA, UHS Bagalkot, US Banklu and YSR Horticulture yeah. University, Andhra Pradesh. She got recognition in several levels and acted as convener of technical section in the World Regional Rose Convention held at Calcutta and deputed as a member of Indian delegation to Germany for exchange of experience and information about dust testing procedures and convener joint workshop on India-German bilateral cooperation in seed sector in collaboration with PPV and FRA at Bangalore, India and also deputed as a member of Indian delegation to the Netherlands to study the impact of plant variety protection on the development of Dutch plant breeding industry and implementation of the respective act, acts of PVP. Uh, and Ma uh, Dr. Tejasuni, Madam, will be presenting genetic resources to commercial varieties, success story in rows. Over to you, ma'am. Okay, uh, coming to the rose species, if you look at, um, actually, if you look at the subgenera, that is a haltemia, this is the only one totally different, which has got the simple leaves. Otherwise, all are having the compound leaf with the leaflets. And uh, several species, mainly this under the rosa genera, subgenera, you get all the species. Um, the number of species under rosa varies, like uh, they say from 200 to even up to the 500, it is, it is there. And the question is um, rose. See, always we think whether rose, it belongs to us. This is the biggest question because most of the times it's always said that it is a temperate uh, crop and it doesn't belong to us. And uh, for every rose, uh, being imported, it is royalty is charged. That way, um, like commercially, we are not, uh, we are uh, giving, as a country, we are uh, spending a lot of money on importing the varieties. So the question comes, have we contributed to this varieties? Whether do we have the roses? So if you look at the, like whether the country has rose, this is what we try to um, map like what is there. This is mainly from the literature, something from the survey, something from even reported in the floras uh, done by different people. So if you look at that, nearly 25 species are there. And you can even look at the spread of the species along the north, uh, up to the north, it is, it is there. Not just that, even if you look at that, even in Raj Rajasthan, where supposed to be the dry condition, there also there is uh, existence of uh, species. And also in the um, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, uh, that high altitude area, it is there. So the question is now, um, why do we need it? Or how do we use it? How do we know that it belongs to us? Most of the times, if the though wherever it is originated, when it spreads, it would have brought in many uses. It would also has diversified. So if you look at the like whether rose is only for the flower, normally we think that rose means it is only for the flower. But with the now the tendency or with the lockdown experience or even during the endemic, what happened is we started look at, looking at the crop, whether 
it can be used for the different purposes uh, and whether it has got any nutraceutical values any medicinal values how the best can be made out of any of the cultivated species so if you look at the uh, literature like the about the rose species whatever i have mentioned there are mention of using the leaf root flower rootstock and it's also as having many of them having the resistant even the root fruits are being used and this is just for a glimpse of that okay uh, sorry species uh, like you can look at the part of it like as i said flower fruit leaf root every part is different parts are being used and utility of the plants also i was saying it may be for the aroma it may be for the medicinal or it may be for the food and the feed also they so different things are there one of the things i missed during the introductory session is that uh, when the director course director dr rashekar was mentioning he was mentioning about the distribution of the uh, parts spent in terms of the gender or other but i wish he could have said about the states also from which states okay so i was just thinking that because see no most of this uh, whatever we say the genetic resources particularly in the roses and all it's very difficult that one can go on survey and find out the variability it is those people who live in that area who who work there who live there they would be knowing most of the species and it's very important that that has to be brought into the mainstream this is in continuation of what i was saying that different species how the different parts are used what for it is being used i would strongly suggest that if all of these participants who have expressed the their interest in the genetic resources they should be able to track down into the local level like what are the different species exist what for it is being used how it can contribute and this is the effort i mean i'll just keep to this and this is the one particular species i want to say about this is rosa clinophila this is the particularly the one that uh, the country can really claim that it belongs to us and it has many things to contribute it has three forms if you can look at that the bengal form uh, which can survive by the ganges with the humid warm it survives in the submerged water and it can also in the dry hill where the heat and drought condition is there and also in the mount abu desert region where the dryness and the frost is there um so it's important that we collect the different forms of it and though many of these times what happens is that they would have been reported long back and uh, over the period of uh, uh, yeah sorry that uh, yes um see over the period of um, uh, urbanization or the civilization we would have lost several of the uh, several of this species and many times as i was telling you these are very hardy ones sometimes it would have been someone's backyard or someone's uh, uh edges of the farmlands it's important if you can someone can i mean people around the area can look into that uh select it collect it and multiply that and this i just want to say that rose is a complex species uh it's a highly polyploid over the years it has evolved several uh, species have contributed into the present this thing and uh, these are the species what we can claim that which has gone into the uh, gene pool of rose uh, the present rose okay and this is also another thing usually we think of the cut flower roses this is particularly in the rajasthan region uh, and uh, which is uh, everyone knows that which goes for a lot of uh, making the gulkand and the nutraceutical values so the roses you can think that it can as a food how it can be used or what sort of things we have to collect what should be looking the characters we should be looking for 
Okay. This I'll be saying about, I mean, um, the germplasm collection in rows. When we say about the germplasm collection in the rows, it may, may be the species. It may be the primitive land races. And also the indigenous varieties are farmer selection. When I was saying, showing you about the uh, Rajasthan thing, one of the things we noticed even when we were traveling through that is, there was one variety called as the Ganga Nagri. And uh, we came to know that uh, it was selected in the Ganga Nagar region. And uh, this has become the popular there because of the whatever the yield capacity or the survival capacity it is there. So it is important to look into that, the commercial one, what farmers are selecting. And specifically adopted uh, ecotypes. Uh, roses are mainly uh, grown as a garden roses. And um, uh, whichever survives in the particular region also, uh, that would be also evolved, would have evolved into different ecotypes that also need to be collected. And um, then it comes to the variety. Rose is something like uh, most of the people are into it are because the passion they have in the crop. So most of the cities have this society. So there are uh, several hobbies who are, um, um, who are uh, getting into this uh, uh, hobby of rose breeding also. So there are uh, varieties coming from the uh, public sector and the private sector private sector, not any of the industry, seed industry is commercial industries into the breeding of rose, but hobbies are into that, but that also can be contributing it to that. Then uh, uh, during the whole breeding program, uh, many things would have evolved, many uh, genes would have got mixed up, uh, would have uh, reshuffling would have happened. This would lead to the genetic stock, which would also work to save. I mean, just for the information, I forgot to put it here, the whatever the genetic stock, like whatever the combination we have made, many times it will, everything will not become commercial. So, but, uh, but they have many good characters. Uh, we have put it up in our website in, an, in the form of an ebook. Uh, you can, uh, anyone can refer to our IHR website and go to the resource section and can look for that ebook. And uh, anyone is interested to collaborate with us regarding this also, you are all welcome. Then coming to the conservation. Once you have the collection, then comes the conservation. So it may be the active collection or the, it may be the base collection, which you would be using it for the breeding program. And, um, or you would, it would be there in the backup, which may you may look into later when, when you want to have certain good characters. And because it's a vegetatively prop propagated crop, normally it's an in-situ conservation, which is essential. And uh, in-situ conservation, it can happen, um, uh, sorry, um, yeah, yeah, gene bank, I mean, uh, it's in the cultivated form, it has to happen. I mean, need not be the in-situ, most, uh, most of the time we get it from the place and uh, put it in our uh, ex-situ conservation. It can be in the open field or in the protected cultivation. And uh, coming to the management of the resources, uh, one is that multiplication. This is the biggest problem. Like uh, you should be, when you have the good collection, then it has to be multiplied and uh, regenerated and it has to be tested for characterizing evaluation documentation and has to, the distribution also has to happen. Then what, what, what is the use of collecting all this uh, genetic resource, whether it's a species or varieties? It would get into the breeding based upon the evaluation or it, it can go into the research or even that uh, like uh, different areas it is, uh, it exists. So knowing the variability, it would also help in managing the biological diversity. Okay, I just want to say, this is what I was saying about the species existence in the country. Now, if you look at the world, um, this is one of the famous, uh, uh, are the biggest collection of roses in the world. This is Europa Rosarium. You can look into the website, but unfortunately, all the informations are in German language. You cannot convert it, but you can see the roses, but they have a huge collection. They even claim that they have nearly 500 species. It was earlier in the East Germany. Now it is in the combined Germany, which is taken care of very well. Then uh, this also, I just wanted to say, I was saying about the uh, hobbies and all. There is a world, uh, every town, most of the towns in different uh, states uh, and different countries also are there. These rose societies come under what is called as the 
World Rose Federation. So this is the one you can look into the website, you get a lot of information about the variability of it, heritage roses, all those sort of things. That's about the genetic roses. And when we come to the commercialization part of it, uh, uh, as I said that these are all vegetatively propagated. So uh, the intensive, I mean, uh, not the intensive, what I would say that um, uh, the once, once you breed it, it's uh, difficult to breed, but once you breed also, uh, it can uh, automatically get multiplied and uh, people can take it. Once it goes out of the breeder's hand, it can just thrive in different places. So the important is it has to be protected if you want to commercialize it. So when you say that about the commercialization, uh, international, like if you want to protect it, it is the UPOVA. It is only in the European countries, then it comes the CPBO. And this is another one, CFORA. This is particularly, it is the international community of breeders of asexually reproduced horticulture plant. This is another, um, uh, uh, another organization which would be looking into all the uh, relevant issues related to the uh, protection of the varieties, particularly vegetatively propagated crop species. Then coming to the India, as we all know, it is the protection of plant varieties, the PPV, FRA, um, and uh, this authority takes care, uh, takes care of the protection of the variety, whatever the varieties get into the commercialization. And uh, there is a garden rose, pot rose, or the greenhouse cutflower roses, rootstock, everything can be protected under uh, the respective category. And uh, yeah, this I just want to say, like uh, the, see rose means color, okay? So the, when the flower color you are looking into, uh, this is the, um, uh, you, this is the natural mutation see the bird sports. I'm showing it in two reasons. Uh, one is that you can think the variability that can exist in the nature when uh, some variety would have come, but then there is a variation, um, uh, which if it get isolated, it can become pure. That also would have created the variability. And I also want to uh, tell you that the sports are very common, which can get isolated. And also there is a issue. In the sense, if it is from the commercial variety, you have to share the right with the original breeder. Without that, one cannot claim, but you can uh, always bring into, the, um, bring into the cultivation by isolating. This is, for example, our own varieties, Arka Savi and Arka Pride. If you look at that, this is in the plant itself, you can see that one brand, this is the original one. This brand particularly changed the color. And even in survey, we have isolated the different colors. So uh, it, when it is my our own varieties, there is no, no question of the problem with the legal issues. But if it is taken from the other uh, breeders varieties, then one has to be careful about the commercialization of that. Okay. Um, see, rose breeding is particularly, it's a big challenge. So mainly because the, there is a problem with the seed germination. It's not that uh, every variety, you may collect 101 uh, varieties and the species, but the thing is, everything will not germinate. And if there is no germination, there no hybridization, then there is no selection, then there is no way you would be releasing the variety. So it's very important that one has to identify the, which is the one which is going to set the seed. And all your breeding efforts would be revolving around those particular variety. And finally, if this mother plant, mother source, which has the good ability to the, shed the seed, shed the ability to germinate, but it has got the pure character, then all your efforts would be a failure effort. So now with our experience, now that is the time we resorted to what is called as the gametophytic selection. See all, uh, normally the breeding program, we deal with the sporophytic selection where we do the crossing, where we select the seed leaf, the selection happens in the sporophytic stage. And this is the game changing thing, what we try to do. And we did with the gametophytic selection. So when there is lot of, so this, there is a huge number of pollen. So that the, what the selection you can make, you, you have thousands of it. 
so it is this you have to think how you would be selecting the right one to set the seed that would germinate so that you can get the good variety and that is the approach and with that this is how we have created multiple varieties different uh, varieties for the cut flower varieties even for the loose flower market and i mean just i'll be sharing some of our varieties i am not dealing with the every uh, varieties because yesterday i was listening to dr prasad's class also and in his lecture he covered lot of ira varieties and all so i am not going to deal with the other varieties i'll just deal with the what the effort we have done so this is the arkas fajesh for the cut flower ivory again for the cut flower market which has got also the resistance and the pride and uh, this is for the loose flower market this is getting lot of popularity and the parimala fragrant one and the sukanya this is also fragrant one with a good oil content in it and uh, i said rose is nothing but for the garden people think for the garden so we also have varieties which are good for the garden kinnari sharmili sinchana multiple flowers are there i was telling you this is the most sought after uh, uh, variety now by different states we are getting the good demand and also i'm getting the good feedback from the markets also that they are good getting the good price for this variety compared to the existing varieties and this are the farmers field where they are very happy to grow our variety and this is in the poly house variety we have grown with the multiple uh, um international varieties this is ivory in test with the multiple international varieties testing and this is the only one which could uh, survive without the any mites infestation this is it and um, this is parimala fragrant one and uh, i was telling you rose is not just for the flower and uh, see this is what the aroma part when you, when uh, it is used for the aroma historically also when you look at that each see this is the one jirenal is the one which contributes for the aroma of it and you, you can look at this is the pushkar pink this is the normally one rajasthan area which is being used you can look at the different component of it and different uh, the level of content in ours so this is the different way of exploiting the i mean uh, making the best of the industry making best of the varieties and it also has the several uh, antioxidant um, uh, factor and it, i mean you can look at that even compared to the roast uh, green tea it is good and um, this is i was again telling you about the extraction part of it and it it can also be thought for the food color also anthocyanin content is very high in some of our line this is also another thing so yeah genetic resource then you have to uh, develop the variety you have to protect it and uh, when you are protecting you should also think that it's not just the plant breeders right there is also farmers rights one can think and one can protect about it and with that i would like to end thank you thank you so much for the great lecture you gave ma'am uh, beauty of rose needs to be protected from the stresses both biotic and abiotic here the solution for it knowing deeply the wild species of rose its botany conservation strategy and how to utilize it in breeding as well as in how to commercialize it definitely you all heard about arka savi a beautiful rose and madam is behind it thank you very much uh, madam and uh, we didn't receive so far any questions ma'am okay okay uh, ma'am we have one question by uh, dr subesh are these cut flower roses have been listed in alsmere market for international trade see the that is another game alsmere market uh, because the the trade now most of the uh, it become making a dent in the cut flower industry the cut flower poly house growers that's another another aspect totally it's not it listed in the alsmere i think it uh, the question answer is clear and ma'am again one more uh, please share the ppt like that if you are ready to share yeah i'm ready to okay. share the ppt okay we will share with you everything okay, okay thank, thank you. you very much ma'am oh, one more question one okay one more question ma'am from dr sopnendu patnaik can you please elaborate how the gametophytic selection is done um see gametophytic selection i mean uh, in the rose crop i mean you have to think that uh, 
what are the varieties which are good for as a contributor? The, see, when here, particularly, we, we look for the pollen because the seed is something we cannot have the control only. We have the only particular lines. So it's only the pollen parent we can have a choice. So you can look for the certain character. Like suppose if I'm looking for the yellow flower. So I can have multiple of the yellow flower. The easiest one, I'll say. The gamut can happen. I mean, the simple theory behind it is when they compete, the best one would be selected. So you have to make them to compete. So that you have to put them in the condition where you have to make the selection. So if it is the disease, you have to put the toxin to make the selection. So if it is for the vigor, you have to look, look into the possibility of making the, the quantity more or more number of the genotypes of the particular character. This would give into the gametophytic selection. This is in the nutshell, I'm saying the simplified form. You can contact me if you want it in detail. Ma'am, another question from Dr. K. Kaldar Babu. Uh, any black spot resistant varieties available? Yeah, black spot, uh, not the resistant. We have certain lines which are, uh, uh, one is uh, very immune one also there with us. We have registered also with the NBPJ and we also have certain lines. Anyone is interested in the breeding of this, you are welcome to um, make use of it, get into the MOU. Ma'am, another question from Dr. K. Ravindra Kumar. What are the ideal climatic conditions for seed setting or hip formation in rows? Yeah, this is another big thing. It is actually a uh, cool region, higher altitude, cool region. That is the best season. And in the winter season, when you get the good seed setting and germination. Okay. Ma'am, one last question uh, from Dr. J. Shashikant. Where we can get Rosa Kanaina germ blossom? Rosa? Canina, C A N I N A. Yeah, Rosa Canina. It's uh, um, Rosa Canina is also exists in the this core belt. Also, it is there, and um, so if if you want, I can also share with the collection. Okay. Uh, one more question, ma'am. Can I? Take? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in roses, nematodes are the major constraint. Any resistant variety are identified? Um, no, roses, nematode resistant, we haven't identified. Um, it is a problem, but which can be easily managed with the marigold cultivation of alternate crop. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay. okay. We'll have a short quiz at this time. Oh, from your... Uh, Dr. Sridhar, sir, please share the Google form. Okay. Yeah, your uh, time starts now. It's for one minute. Uh, sir, uh, Sridhar, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, please interpret the result also, sir. Make on, uh, make, uh, yeah, now it is coming on. You tell about the results, uh, how the participant performed uh, with uh, Dr. Tajasini's uh, questions, MCQs. Mm -hmm. Sir, we can stop now. So please share the uh, slides, sir. Sridhar, sir, can you please share the slide? Uh, I mean, Google form.
that many points here. Ah. Think there is an issue with the points only. Otherwise, people have given the question utilization of rose species seed many. Commercial roses are uniform because they are vegetatively propagated, that is the maximum. And rose species suitable for aromatic industry, Damasi, Damasini. Natural variation is because of mutation and protected by PPVFRA. Uh, apologies, I think the score was not uh, added, but these are the responses. I'll check what's the problem with the sports. Okay. I think. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. We'll move on to next presentation. I take immense pleasure and pride to introduce the next speaker, Dr. K. Himabindu, Principal Scientist, Division of Flower and Medicinal Crops, ICR IHA. Dr. Himabindu is the plant breeder, has many years of experience in medicinal plant breeding and developed two superior selections of Mucuna pruensis, very utilis, Arka Danvantari and Arka Ashwini, having high seed yield and L-DOPA content. Instrumental in the development of Arka Ashwagandha, a high root yielding line of Ashwagandha with higher chemical content. And Madam has identified two high yielding promising clones of beetle wine, Gaudi Bengla and Swarna Kapuri, and molecular characterization using ISSR markers in the germplasm collected in different medicinal crops. Besides all this, Madam has uh, experience on morpho morphological characterization. She is also a master in molecular characterization of the collected germplasm of medicinal plants. Madam, floor is yours, and please come. Good morning. Uh, I hope you are able to hear me. Uh, though we miss you uh, having you here personally, which we would all would love to have a personal interaction. And uh, I thank the organizers uh, for giving me this an opportunity uh, to talk to you about a uh, little bit on biodiversity, conservation, and utilization. And when I saw the topic, I was asking Dr. Rajshekran, it's such a huge topic. I mean, like within half an hour, how uh, you can do a justice, but I would like to uh, put before you uh, a, a little bit of introduction about the medicinal crops because these are our medicinal plants as a group of plants are, uh, you know, the crops or the segment which constitutes a lot of diversity, but at the same time, uh, the efforts on either on the conservation or on the utilization has been, I should say, to a minimum level. And I'm sure. Uh, and uh, though it is uh, slightly cynical, I thank the COVID for bringing the limelight uh, to the, this sector because people have started asking uh, the questions about the medicinal plants. And because now the immunity building or the innate immunity of the, uh, the body system is the focus and which comes uh, a lot through usage of the uh, you know, medicinal plants and their products. And before I start, I also would like to put before you, when I talk about medicinal plants, here we are talking about a group of complex uh, plants in terms of both in their uh, uh, part, which is used economically and also its propagation and also its utilization in varied ways. So it's not like when I say, or when I am uh, you know, using the word or referring to the group of plants, I, I think this has to be kept in mind because it's a, uh, you really cannot give a particular direction or a particular strategy for any of it, like either it's conservation or utilization, because these vary very widely depending on what kind of plant you are doing, and which is the eco-geographical region which you plan to do it. And even the conservation strategies, they vary very, very widely. So, uh, I, uh, with this, like uh, in this talk, I would like to give you a very brief overview of what is this medicinal plants, what is the diversity we hold, and why we are talking about medicinal plants, and what are the conservation strategies. I'm sure uh, you would have already been told about the basic conservation strategy. I'm only touching upon those conservation strategies which are very, very uh, unique 
or very specific to the medicinal crops or medicinal plants and also a little bit on the utilization i also would like to uh, you know put a little bit focus on what we have done at ihr uh, in different plants using this uh, uh, you know diversity in the medicinal plants and i also apologize uh, anushma because i couldn't send her a good uh, bio data at the end so i would also like to introduce myself uh, i work in the genetic improvement of the medicinal crops and uh, at ihr we are working both on genetic improvement as well as on planting material production maintaining a herbal garden and also a little bit on uh, propagation techniques and then uh, you know production technology and other things and basically i am a plant yeah, breeder now for the hello okay kindly so, mute yourself all participants kindly mute yourself yeah the thing is uh, so uh, it's like uh, i have basically a plant breeder who is uh, working in the genetic improvement and we have developed uh, uh, around six uh, Uh, improved lines in now uh, el um, mucuna pruriensis which are non itchy types with high eldopa and i have also worked before in rice where we have released one variety and also in ashwagandha and some of our lines are also uh, very well adapted uh, by both growers and industries so with this brief introduction i would like to uh, talk to you about biodiversity conservation and utilization in medicinal plants can i have the next slide so why are, i can only do it is it thank you so much yeah why we talk medicinal plants it's my like you know very uh, uh, i can call it as a favorite uh, slide because it's not that we are talking about the medicinal plants or we are recognizing its importance now it is the oldest plants and i i should say the use of a plants or medicinal plants for the either in the human health or in the veterinary health it's not a new thing it's an integral part of uh, very closely interwoven in the cultures of uh, uh, you know human civilization across globe it's not that like we are talking only in asia or india or china if you look into any local uh, civilization any local culture you always have plants which have been used to address some of these uh, health issues in the uh, human plant uh, both at the human and as well as the veterinary medicine so coming to our own india i think we have the richest knowledge and the richest plant heritage with uh, uh, i mean uh, we should uh, take it with us uh, uh, very proudly we can say this because even in the age of vedas uh, uh, i know it has been told that there is absolutely no plant which is medicine which is not medicinal that shows every other plant has a, some kind of a medicinal use and it is also mentioned even at that old uh, uh, ancestral uh, time they have also codified some of these plants with all the details and how it can be utilized i just mentioned here some of those uh, texts probably which you probably are aware which is a uh, very famous charaka samhita shushul samhita they are known to be uh, one of the uh, you know good doctors at that time and uh, similarly you have many of these uh, codified texts in different uh, um, you know areas like probably you take southeast asia you can you see in indonesia china and even uh, uh, other countries uh, you know they have uh, codified uh, uh, texts which already do, you know documented the use of these plants in the human health and uh, to know even in the modern era even the plants have immensely contributed for the Uh, health uh, area where you can see even now 80% of this global population use still plants in the primary health care and also you can see the developed or allopathic medicines 25% of them still have come from uh, plant based uh, molecules and uh, to see to show you uh, the global use of alternative medicine still this is uh, you know from the who uh, website you can see so many countries still using uh, you know uh, this alternate medicine as one of the health thing and how why we want to talk about biodiversity in medicinal crops because we know that india is uh, you know richest in the plant wealth and also when you classify the plants which are known to be used in the human health or any other health issues 
So there are like, uh, you know, though we say uh, the number may be lesser than China, but uh, the, the whole world agrees that we have the maximum diversity. 40% of the whole diverse plant, uh, medicinal plant diversity is, is present in India. And uh, when you see uh, there are 16, and uh, the other greater advantage our country has, it's a wider geographical conditions. We have, uh, you know, uh, looking at the Himalayas to the arid, the cold, arid regions, to the desert regions, to the tropical, uh, uh, you know, climate, everything, all kinds of climate exists in our India. That is one reason why we see, reason one why see, we see a very high diversity in the uh, plant uh, um, populations. And we have 16 major vegetation types and 33% species are endemic to us and uh, 9,500 spe species have been documented to have ethnomedical uh, medicinal use. And uh, among the 960 species, uh, though we know there are around 7,000 species which are supposed to be medicinal, there are around 100, around 1,000 uh, species, 960 species which are traded. And uh, among them, we classify 170 species as a prioritized medicinal plants where the trade is more than 100 million tons. And I was also mentioning, uh, when you say, uh, usually the question is like only 100 million tons and you're calling it as the major uh, uh, crops because the amount of uh, uh, the uh, produce which is used from the medicinal plants, if you have more than 500 tons, we say highly traded plants. And uh, the VC and uh, the other, uh, you know, very uh, thing or the point which is of higher concern is we know more, most of even more than 80% of the uh, you know plant species medicinal plant species which are used for the product utilization or in the raw drug or in any form of the product utilization they still come from the wild and when you classify uh, among the highly traded plants where are they coming from it's from all kinds of forest areas it's a temperate region tropical region some from cultivation some from degraded lands and we are also importing some of those plants. So when you say, uh, you know, when you have a rich medicinal plant heritage and the diversity, I was mentioning it is coming from our Vedic, uh, you know, biogeographical zones. And um, there are like many of these plants are used in all kinds of traditional systems. That is either you take Ayurveda, Yunani, Homeo, even uh, Sauri, uh, we call it as a Tibetan medicine. And among them, we are exporting uh, uh, quite a few of them as a raw drugs, uh, less as a value added products. And 48 are exported and 42 are imported. And I'm still saying more than 70% uh, of these traded uh, plants are still coming from the wild. And when you look at the trade, and we are second after China, and uh, there are, could be uh, uh, you know, varied reasons why still we are uh, uh, I mean, stuck at the second position, though we have all the possibilities and all the potential to become the global leader in this area. And basically, we still are collecting uh, a lot of material from the wild, which is a concern for both for the quality as well as the uh, conservation. And uh, uh, we are sharing around 9% of the total world export and uh, India is also one of the major exporters uh, for the plant-based drugs. And we are also you know, earning a considerable foreign exchange. And you can see uh, you know, there is a there is surge in the uh, demand for these uh, plant-based products throughout the globe. And you can see that even India is improving its exports uh, you know, more than uh, 330 million uh, US dollars we have uh, exported in 1718. And this is increasing. Every year it is almost increasing at the 12% uh, rate. And we are the major, I don't want to go into the details of those uh, herbs, as I was mentioning. These are not like, if, I, if you take any uh, segment of plants, like either it could be vegetables or could be field crops or could be flower crops, you are talking only about the few, amount, few species which are, uh, you know, commercially, sorry. Uh, it's commercially cultivated or commercially traded. But here uh, we are talking, uh, uh, you know, in terms of hundreds and thousands. 
So we have few of the important drugs which we are exporting. Uh, major is the Isobgol and the Senna. And uh, the export volume, I'm just showing you the statistics here. How is it increasing uh, year by year? And uh, as I was mentioning, why we were more concerned about the medicinal plants, the biodiversity and the conservation, basically because the increased demand for these plant-based product is putting a lot of stress, a lot of uh, strain on the wild resources because more than 80% of these are collected from the wild. And as I was mentioning, there are uh, these plants are collected for depending on their economic product. For example, if the economic product is a root, if you pull the plants, there is no regeneration. So where there is the economic product is the uh, you know regenerative product of those plants. There is you know no way you can uh, uh, regenerate those plants. This this is creating a lot of uh, you know uh, plants becoming uh, endangered, threatened, and extinct. And uh, when you have, you know, uh, I just listed out few of those uh, causes, uh, you know, how, uh, why we are losing the medicinal plant diversity. And you can also see um, what are all those, you know, contribution of those causes to the loss of the biodiversity. And uh, there are almost like 200 uh, plants, medicinal plants, which have been, uh, I know, uh, you know, listed as a red listed plants, which are of a uh, conservation concern. And I'm sure this is not in a local issue because you can see in many of these plants, you know, animals, even in fungi, this is the, you know, trend where we are losing a lot of biodiversity. And in India is not a very special thing because we are also losing a lot of, you can, I want to draw your attention. We are losing almost more than 2,400 uh, species. And you probably somebody would have already talked to about, uh, you know, IUCN and the classification, which I don't want to go in detail. Probably if not, they will be speaking to you. So based on that, you either classify these plants based on the threat, based on the distribution, based on the recurrent, uh, you know, uh, documentation. You classify them as extinct, uh, you know, extinct in wild, critically endangered and critical endangered, vulnerable, threatened, and then uh, data deficient, all those classifications. And when you come, uh, I, I was talking to you about this classification, based on the extinction risk, they classify these plants. And these are very, very important in medicinal plants because this kind of data is already limited here. And because of this, uh, you know, there is a lot of uh, concern and uh, many of those medicinal plants are becoming endangered, coming in vulnerable and then uh, threatened and some of them are extinct. And here I was showing you uh, the status of these medicinal flora, both globally and also at the Indian conditions, where you can see a lot of species are getting extinct, endangered, vulnerable. If we don't take care of these plants, which are already in vulnerable and endangered categories, probably you might not see them uh, in the coming years. Here also you can see almost endangered, we have more than 190 species, and vulnerable, we have 155 species. I'm sure the ground reality will be much, much higher because this whole data depends on what kind of uh, data you collected. And uh, probably we are already, uh, you know, losing uh, many of those important medicinal species. And why are we concerned? Because these are the basic material which are required for your health needs, for your ecosystem conservation, and even for commercial cultivation. We know that in any of these research, uh, needs the basic germplasm, which should be a diverse germplasm, is one of the very important things. And also, this assured quality production also needs uh, a kind of a good uh, diversity. And uh, these are all the very good sources and the future crops for the income and employment generations. So, why I've just given you a brief idea about the diversity, what we hold. I'm sure there's a lot of statistics we can discuss. Considering the time constraint, I've just put you here, uh, the amount of uh, biodiversity we hold. And basically, I have not gone into the details of the flora which we are holding uh, in different geographical conditions. And also how you can classify based on the herbs, shrubs, trees, and also based on the plant parts, like how many plants we can we are using the roots, how many are the seeds, how many are the flower parts, how many are the stems. So there are huge amount of classification and the data available. 
if somebody is interested, probably the organizers can uh, provide the data or we can also give them based on the demand. And coming to now, since we already shown you how much biodiversity we are losing and how uh, there are lots of concerns about how to conserve them. And I'm sure uh, I don't want to talk about uh, different conservation strategies because we, you must be already knowing these are the basic issues. As I mentioned, I will only be uh, talking about those strategies which are probably unique and probably very specific to the medicinal crops or the medicinal plants. So as you know, the conservation, you know, the in-situ conservation, ex-situ conservation, and uh, the more emphasis is also here on uh, community conservations, both in-situ on-farm and ex-situ on-farm. And we also, uh, 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 probably a slightly dif different thing in medicinal plants is we are talking about domestication and cultivation now, because these are the plants which are mostly in the wild and recent commercial interest so we are domesticating them and bringing them under cultivation is one major area how you can conserve them. And when you talk about cultivation, ultimately, because these are the plants which the quality is very, very important here, just not the yield, the active ingredients in them. And also, since you are using them in the medicine, the quality of the produce is very, very important. So we, we talk more about good agricultural practices. And also, since they are used in the medicine uh, and probably the health-based products we uh, the organic cultivation is also a kind of uh, a lot of focus is uh, on it and coming to the in-situ we have national parks protected areas biosphere reserves and there are like you know heritage sites and uh, the the thing is like we have specific uh, areas demarcated for medicinal plants conservation areas medicinal plants development areas. And also uh, one of the important or interesting thing is the sacred groups. Though we say that we are putting up plants now for the conservation, this is, as I was mentioning, the production of the medicinal plants, usage of medicinal plants is highly ingrained in our culture. And this is a concept of sacred groves, groves or you know, sacred vanas, or, uh, 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 or uh, a land which is attached to the temples where they grow some of these herbs and flowers which are used uh, for the deities uh, uh, rituals is also a, a, a type of conservation. And we can see still this uh, you know, culture is still existing in many of the uh, uh, country. And this is also one of the ways of uh, conserving the local uh, flora, medicinal flora especially. So uh, coming to ex situ, like any other group of plants, you have field gene banks, seed gene banks, and then home herbal gardens, which we are now consist, I mean, promoting it. And uh, herbal gardens now, after the NMPB came to existence, they have been uh, financing a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, herbal gardens to be established in uh, either universities, in uh, both private and public funded. And uh, there are community herbal gardens and medicinal plants conservation parks. This is also one of the initiative and in vitro repositories. So I will be briefly touching only on those things which I felt could be or different from uh, uh, you know, uh, other horticulture germplasm conservation uh, strategies. So we have uh, uh, biosphere reserves and this of course uh, conserves all kinds of species and a little more emphasis on the medicinal flora also. And uh, these are those uh, you know, efforts which are uh, started internationally in the UNESCO's Man in the Biosphere program. And in India, we have almost 18 biosphere reserves where all flora and fauna are uh, conserved. And this is also an important, uh, you know, strategy for conserving the medicinal plant flora, which are also an integral part of this whole plants, uh, whole flora and fauna. And when you come to, I was mentioning about uh, uh, specific strategies or uh, unique strategies which they have started to conserve this medicinal plants biodiversity. One of them is the medicinal plants conservation areas. It is, uh, you know, the basic idea is like if you conserve them in their native ecosystem and the evolution happens and similarly the diversity is conserved in their own, uh, you know, ecosystem. So this was the, uh, you know, uh, the idea behind uh, promoting the, the medicinal plant conservation areas. 
and uh, they have identified some of these areas. I mean, the area which uh, we are referring here to almost 200 to 300 hectares size. So they have demarcated these areas which are rich in uh, you know, medicinal plant biodiversity and where you can leave those areas untouched without any human, inter human intervention so that the natural evolution uh, happens and uh, the, uh, the diversity thrives there. So these in Karnataka, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, and uh, even in Maharashtra, and a lot of work in this conservation area has been done, uh, which is an institute called FRLHT, which is a foundation for rural vitalization of, uh, revitalization of local health traditions, uh, which is based in Bangalore. So they have uh, uh, put up these, uh, uh, what you call no novel strategies to conserve these uh, medicinal plant biodiversity. So they have identified uh, with the, in uh, collaboration with the forest uh, departments and the uh, you know state governments. They have identified uh, almost 33 medicinal plant conservation areas in uh, southern states. Uh, and uh, as I was mentioning, this uh, area is uh, quite uh, large. That is. I mean, it comprises uh, anywhere between 200 uh, to 300 hectares in size. So these are the basic idea is just leave it to the nature and let the whole uh, you know, ecosystem thrive on its own. And then the natural breeding happens and the natural diversity uh, is maintained and also uh, you know, um, left alone without any human intervention. So another uh, um, uh, thing which is I was mentioning or specific are the medicinal plants developmental areas. These are uh, different from MPCAs because these are smaller areas in non-timber forest products uh, circles or on the degraded forests which are used for the production of medicinal plants by planting locally available indigenous species. So this is where uh, it's a kind of a developmental areas, but still they fall in the uh, forest areas. Such kind of areas, uh, MPDAs, almost 12 MPDAs are established in southern India, and 21 of these uh, are established in some of those uh, Arunachal Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Uttarakhand, and uh, other areas. And these uh, basic thing is to preserve the local uh, medicinal uh, diversity and uh, even um, increase or encourage the people participation so that uh, it also serves for the welfare of the uh, local participating communities. This is also one uh, you know, strategy for the conservation of the medicinal plant diversity. Another uh, very interesting thing and is the sacred groves. And I was mentioning this is not something which we have started. It is the practice which is there in the culture. And uh, this is those uh, uh, lands which are not intervened by the human uh, you know, intervention, uh, maintained in the same way, uh, which are uh, kind of, uh, you know, consists of mostly the, uh, you know, temples uh, areas or the plants which are used for the rituals in the temples or the religious uh, functions. And these are like mostly are in the tribal wells and we have more than 10,000 of these sacred groves, which are the thriving uh, areas for the diversity. And when you talk about ex situ, we have the herbal gardens and of course, botanical gardens are also one of those uh, uh, you know, strategies. And a lot of herbal gardens um, been uh, established under uh, with the NMPB funding or in uh, both public and private funded institutions. And the uh, other thing is the gene banks, uh, which as an initiative from the DBT, they have established, especially for the medicinal uh, uh, gene banks, uh, three gene banks, one at uh, NBPGR, TBGRI, and also at the uh, Lucknow, uh, CMAP Lucknow. And uh, they also hold a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, medicinal plant, uh, you know, conservation uh, um, banks. So they also uh, conserve a lot many species, which are also important locally and also regionally and nationally. So another uh, uh, area is in vitro repositories, uh, the same as the gene banks. And then uh, we have a uh, lot of other uh, strategies like cryopreservation, preservation, uh, slow growth shoot cultures, normal growth cultures, and regenerative uh, excised root cultures. All these are followed uh, to conserve some of these plants. As I was mentioning, 
these are a very you know complex group of plants so based on what kind of a plant uh, so the uh, the reproductive uh, propagule uh, is uh, conserved at present are almost 174 accessions of uh, 28 uh, different medicinal plants are in vitro conserved and of course ihr also has a cryo preservation uh, work going on here probably uh, which is already been told to you and medicinal plants also are one of the important segment in that and 947 accessions are uh, cryo preserved at npptr so coming to uh, i have also mentioned about the exit to strategy of medicinal plant conservation parks these are especially uh, developed to conserve the regions wherever the locally uh, important species of medicinal plant biodiversity in ex situ conditions and such 16 mpcps have been established by frlhd and as mentioning it is a uh, is a agency which has taken a lot of lead in uh, conservation uh, of medicinal plant biodiversity so these are some of those strategies which has helped to you know save the biodiversity of medicinal plants and also slightly different from the other uh, crop segments which you talk more of the you know conservation uh, techniques which are utilized or practiced in the other uh, crop segments and of course i was talking uh, you know domestication and cultivation because these are not the plants which have been commercially cultivated which are being brought under cultivation so the domestication and cultivation is one uh, way uh, to you know uh, conserve the medicinal plant diversity not only conserving but this is also very important for us to capture the global market because of the quality issues so that it reduces the pressure on the um, uh, you know wild uh, resources improves the quality maintains the you know uniform quality of the planting material and also even you want to either you export or uh, use it locally or domestically the raw drug is the quality of the raw drug is maintained so uh, this uh, uh, actually growing under cultivation uh, is one of the important issue even to capture the global market as we are very it is very important and we also have lot of policy regulations uh, i don't want to go into details which are also helping for the conservation and when you come to utilization uh, uh, you know we have uh, different segments in uh, indian herbal markets where these uh, uh, herbal medicinal plants are being utilized it could be a, a you know all your uh, ayurvedic uh, siddha unani homeopathy formulations uh, otc medications herbal cosmetics herbal teas extracts flavors many things are there i just want to show you where are all these medicinal plants being used and another thing is community based enterprises which can be a, a model for you know utilizing this biodiversity for improving the rural livelihood and uh, income distribution which could be a, a, you know a way to improve the rural uh, lifestyles and there are almost three community based enterprises which i have been uh, doing and how you can utilize this biodiversity you, useful new molecules can be improved uh, developed and then uh, these are could be a uh, you know uh, a future uh, uh, lab scale uh, products like uh, you know lab farming also and in research they are utilized could be utilized in many ways and uh, what could be our future needs so more emphasis on linking biodiversity uh, sustainable harvest and economic returns and cultivation of medicinal plants higher investments in value addition post harvest processing storage which helps in you know making a better products r and d in the varietal development new molecules for drug development and conservation through modern tools like cryo preservation and iprs of course are very important and benefit sharing when you use that local uh, traditional knowledge and more stricter policy implementation because we have all policies the implementation is very slack and quality assurance traceability authenticity if we can improve this the biodiversity can be efficiently uh, you know uh, exploited i request the organizers to give me another 5 minutes uh, i want to just show you quickly how we have used and uh, the genetic resources of uh, medicinal plants at our institute we have uh, very good rich germplasm of different crop species uh, i just mentioned i won't take much time anushma i'll finish 
So we have uh, different crops uh, where we are working. We have a uh, high good germplasm and including beetle vine. And we have just run through the things just to make, give you an idea. So we have different clones. We have identified some of them as a uh, disease resistant clones. We have done the characterization, thus trait development. And we have identified some of this and we use them for hybridization. And similarly in ashwagandha, we have done 190 germplasm and we have characterized, we have identified some other superior lines. These are those uh, collections and both biochemical, as you know, medicinal plants, just yield is not enough. The active ingredient is very equally important. So you have to do simultaneous improvement of both yield and the quality. And these are the morphotypes and the chemotypes and different morphological variants and uh, you know, uh, in similarly, central also we have done, and these are the variation, or uh, we have quite a bit of, and uh, uh, germplasm in central and uh, uh, characterize them in uh, Mikuna. We have done the similar work, variations in the morphological uh, things, and then uh, Kalmeg, uh, we have different uh, germplasm, both for variability in both, uh, you know, chemical as well as the morphological traits. We are in process of developing. Uh, you know, different uh, superior lines. In addition to this, we have a lot of germplasm in Garcinia. And of course, uh, my colleague Rohini is working on Gymnema. So we do have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, germplasm at the herbal gardens, even in Amla. And then we have herbal garden, which is rich, both tree species and the RET species we hold. And we are also having a demonstration unit and also producing a planting material of uh, more than uh, 65 herbs uh, in our uh, institute. So there's some pictures for the diversity in the herbal garden. So I thank uh, 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 for your patient uh, listening and also thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Himabindu, madam, for the encouraging presentation. And ma'am has briefed about why the medicinal plants needs to be conserved in terms of its traditional history, its biodiversity, its trade, and also the economy. And conservation cannot go alone. It, it should go hand in hand with production technology and development. And madam has also stressed more on in-situ conservation as it requires specific climatic condition and also brief about ex-situ conservation in medicinal plants. Uh, so finally, sh uh, she shared about the germplasm available at IHR. So you can also utilize the rich germplasm collection at IHR. So ma'am, we'll see any questions are there. Yeah. Ma'am, we didn't receive so far any okay. questions. Yeah. Thank you so much for Thank the presentation. You. And Thank any, you. any any more information, you can always contact yeah. the organizer. Yes, okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, Ma'am, no, uh, shall we have one yeah. question? Okay. <laughs> they are typing it. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, from Dr. Binu Matthew, yeah. uh, where should we approach for establishing herbal garden? Uh, you have uh, different um, uh, funding agencies. The basic funding agency you can look into is National Medicinal Plant Board. And if you have, uh, I don't know which state you are from, you can also look into, because NMPB has a different, in different states, they have the state medicinal plant boards. Uh, um, so, uh, Ma'am, for your kind knowledge, Binu Matthew is from Mizora. Mizora. Mekalaya. Yeah. Mekalaya. Uh, Mekalaya. I think uh, um, you, you should not have any dearth of funds from the Northeastern. And I'm pretty sure if you write to a project, either to, you know, NMPB, or even the state medicinal plant boards. I think Northeast has, uh, uh, you know, specific funds, special funds for conservation of medicinal plants. And I'm sure if you can look into either NMPB or state medicinal plant boards, uh, uh, there are a clear uh, research pro farmers available for establishing the medicinal plants. And if you need any more help, you can write to us. Uh, we can give you a little more information. Okay. Thank you. So you can contact every time to ma'am's mail ID. It's uh, shared with you. Thank you very much, yes. ma'am. Uh, so move on to next presentation by one young and energetic scientist, Dr. M.S. Shivakuma, uh, scientist, 
uh, in specialization on genetics and plant breeding. ICR, Indian Institute of Spices Research, Regional Station, Apankala. And he is involved in active in the collection of co collection, conservation and utilization of fiber and tree spices germplasm. And Dr. M. L. Shivakumar maintaining the world's largest black paper germplasm counts around 3,395 accessions and also its characterization for various quantitative qualitative traits and identification of resistant sources for various biotic and abiotic stresses. He is also involved in the exploration and collection of wild spices germplasm from Western Ghats and Northeast region. Dr. Amar Shivakumar was awarded gold medal from University of Agriculture Sciences, Dr. C. V. Dulapanavar Memorial Gold Medal, H. Prayag Memorial Gold Medal, I, and also backs ICR Senior Research Fellowship. And uh, he also backed Dr. H. S. Mehta Memorial Award for, for Best uh, Research Paper, Best Oral Presentation Award in National Conference on Biodiversity and PGR for Future. And to his account, there are three book chapters, 23 research papers, and three popular articles. So let's hear from the host mouth on genetic resources in spices, diversity, distribution, conservation, and utilization. Sir, please. Yeah, is, is it audible? Yes, sir, yes. Okay. Oh, slides are visible now. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much for a good introduction. Uh, as time is very limited, around 30 minutes, I will just rush to most of the points because I have to cover around eight to nine crops, which IASR is working on. Uh, so uh, my topic will be on spices, genetic resource, diversity, distribution, and conservation. As you all know, uh, India, one of the greatest hotspots of uh, maximum diversity in uh, flora. And when we talk about uh, spices, India, India st stands at the top in major uh, spices and majorly for tropical spices, which IISR, Indian Institute of Spice Research is handling. Uh, India is one of the major hub of uh, diversity and black pepper and cardamom originated in our own southern uh, southern states of Western, Western Ghats. Western Ghats is the major hub of this variability also. And uh, India is also a major producer of black pepper, cardamom, ginger, turmeric, chilies, and other one. Mm. Coming to some of the hotspots, uh, there are around 25 hotspots in India, majorly for most of the flora. And from these, around 15 hotspots are directly or indirectly linked to the variability or diversity in case of spices. To talk about most of the spices, most of these hotspots harbor major diversity in one or the other way, maybe primary center, secondary center like that. And when we talk about Western Ghats, uh, Western Ghats can't be separated from spices because it is the land where most of our tropical spices were originated and they evolved there and they created a lot of variability within them in the Western Ghats during course of evolution. There are a lot of research articles also indicating how Western Ghats, how the individual spices, spice or individual uh, uh, diversity evolved in case of Western Ghats. And, and as you all know, spices, when we talk about spices, uh, India is known for spices. And today what we are, it may be because of spices. The spices are one of the re uh, re reasons why the Western people came to India in search of these spices. Spices are considered to be aromatic vegetable products of tropical origin that are used in pulverized state, primarily for seasoning or garnishing foods and beverages. This was an earlier definition of spices where it was used as a masala in most of the crops. But nowadays it is not the same because many of the plant-based, uh, especially nutraceuticals are coming out of these spices. Every day new molecules have been identified for which spices are gaining not only as a masala product, but also as a nutraceuticals and even in perfume industries. Nowadays, many alcoholic spices blend with alcoholic beverages are coming out into the market. So the, the spices play a very, very broad role in case of our cuisine and even in industry purpose, not only uh, masala industry, other industries also. And today I'm going to cover about all these crops except paprika, which I'm not touching. And I came to know that ginger and turmeric, the professor Sabu is speaking on uh, variability in ginger, uh, zinzibaresi. So 
is the right person to that i will restrict my these things to other crops very less information i will try to give on ginger and turmeric as professor sabu will be covering in detail on these crops and as i told you uh, western gods are about the spices origin piper nigrum and cardamom these are the two major tropical spices which are originated in western gods which harbor lot of variability in these regions garcinia is another one crop where garcinia gummigatta kokum are native to our western gods cinnamon uh, cinnamon you may be knowing sri lanka is the primary origin even western gods also harbors most of variability in case of cinnamon and curcuma langa and zinzibar even though there is no specific uh, what you call uh, origin on these things it is considered to be indo malayan region or southeast asia is considered to be the origin of these particular species coming to black pepper as i told earlier black pepper played a very important role in course of history of india uh, everything changed after these uh, black pepper become famous and you know the value of black pepper considered to be the black gold uh, even today also it is considered to be one of the important spices and uh, especially in uh, piper species uh, uh, there are around 2000 species reported all over the world so uh, especially south american species and indian species are little bit different uh, uh these are woody vines especially indian spice uh, these species are uh, woody creepers dioecious monoecious even if you go to that uh, idiki regions we will find all different kind of uh, floral developments or especially sex morphism in case of uh, spices uh, especially black pepper intermediate types as i told you monoecious dioecious and unisexuals all are uh, found in case of idiki especially elevation of around 600 to 900 and cultivated pepper originated in western ghats due because of continual evolution and vegetative propagation it has evolved and now we have improved varieties in case of spices uh, this is an uh, distribution of uh, piper species in whole world in india again three hot spots especially western ghats northeastern states andaman harbors many piper species and when we come to indian piper species as i told there is a difference between south america american species and these uh, indian uh, piper species especially this one species piper barberry which is found only in restricted area in western ghats especially near anamalai region of uh, idiki district there we found that this is only a patch which is available which is uh, uh, listed in uh, red data book as a endangered species we we uh, means we there is a specific adjust, adjustment of these species to environment so we were not able to conserve it properly recently we have collected and we have established this piper barberry a very very different species from all other piper species of southern india and when we talk about the piper's diversity in south india as i told you these are some of the important piper species which are there in western ghats especially to tell you uh, this piper long this is what we call as ipali in kannada or tippali in malayalam like that there are so many names with piper longum this is one piper species which is used in ayurveda medicine even today this goes for ayurveda medicine uh, other than that another one important species is the right one where we are seeing the red uh, berries this is piper chaba in nowadays whatever the especially this toothpaste dabar toothpaste dabar red all those things are using this piper chaba in their uh paste as a means as a alternative to black pepper this is also known for ayurvedic medicines and speciality of these particular uh, wild species wild piper species is they are very uh, means uh, niche specific they are found only in one specific area where they are adjusted to altitude and even temperature and all if you bring down to the coastal region they may not survive this is one problem what we are facing we are while conserving these uh, piper species from western ghats and when we talk about northeastern species even though south india harbors only 15 uh, or 15 to 18 piper species whereas northeastern region harbors around 115 piper species there is lot of variability in piper species especially this first one that is piper bumerifolium they are using we came to know that they are when we went for exploration in nagaland and uh, meghalaya they are using it as a leafy vegetable means not only as a spice even some of the piper species are fitting into a uh, leafy vegetable types and this is another one piper species that is piper pothiformi this for recently it was not reported earlier we collected it uh, from uh, nagaland only these are some of the species which harbor as i told you lot of nutraceutical or high value compounds which are very important in the present industry uh, in the present industry of nutraceuticals this is about piper diversity in uh, 
in northeast especially piper beetle what we taste here the piper beetle it is somewhat different in northeast there are some beetles which are very sweet in nature so lot of variability is also found in northeast and we try to map using gi system uh, this piper distribution as i told you most of the species are niche specific and they are found only in the specific altitudes and uh, these things and nowadays due to this climate change and all whatever the species we found around 20 25 years when we go exploration now we are not able to find those species because they are they are evolving or they are diminishing or they are losing to the corner so they are, we are losing most of the piper species in case of western guards which is very alarming for uh, most of the scientific community and when we talk about variability as i told you forests are the primary gene pool and plantations even plantations even though piper is vegetatively propagated especially black pepper is vegetatively propagated but seedling progenies are also possible sexual reproduction is also seen in case of piper so plantation also harbors major uh, variability and cultivar diversity as i told you uh, when we talk about cultivars uh, maybe variability is accomplished by varieties land races surf grown progenies in case few few cases natural mutation is also there these are the least of the cultivar diversity more than 100 diverse 100 uh, uh, black pepper genotypes are uh, recorded from uh, southern states especially kerala and karnataka and the naming is also very very tricky in case of uh, black pepper based on it may be based on its character it may be uh, based on its location also so many names are there in case of black pepper and when we talk about variability uh, as i told you there is no dearth of variability in case of black pepper if you see shoot tip color three different colors leaf lamina shape leaf size spike length and we recently collected a uh, black pepper genotype of around around 39 centimeter almost 40 centimeter long by a black pepper spike genotype and even fruiting percentage and even seed also many will think that black pepper is always round no it is not true even oblong seeds I means a uh, egg shaped seeds are also uh, occurring in case of black pepper and when we come into collection and conservation of these things as i told you isr holds the world's largest black pepper uh, germplasm collection we have around 1,798 local cultivars that is uh, cultivated ones and 1,659 about wild species. Wild species, their morphotypes, all those things are conserved at IASR. And we also have nine exotic types, few piper species and few are some of the varieties which are ruling in case of Indonesia, Vietnam, those things. So this is about the present germplasm, black pepper germplasm status at IASR. And uh, as I, I should acknowledge Dr. Paroda yesterday when he was telling, he told that uh, conserving uh, horticulture crops, uh, germplasm is very, very tricky and very time consuming also. It's true. What we are doing is all those our uh, uh, cultivars, around 1,600 cultivars, we are maintaining with a PVC pipe and a pot. Each is represented by each accession. Like this, we have around 14 sheds in which we are maintaining it. And we also maintain them in a nursery where whenever we need them for evaluation and all, we will keep backup of around 10 cuttings of each accessions ready with us. We use them when we are when we want to evaluate and we want to field planting. And we also maintain some core sets in PVC pipes and protected, somewhat protected cultivation because we also formed a core set uh, which are very, which are harboring most of this uh, diversity. We are maintaining those things. And we have two, three field gene banks. One is at Calicut and another one is at Pervanami that is in Calicut district. And we also have a alternative germplasm site at Chetali where we are maintaining around 627 cultivars at Chetali also. And as I told you, when we characterize most of the things, we should need a ready reckoner for uh, identification of most of the accession. So what we have done is we have come up with a catalog on black pepper germplasm where everything is given all those uh, what you call morphological qualitative traits quantitative traits quality traits and and even their reaction to biotic and their abiotic stresses are documented and made up into a one book where we can go as it will act as a ready reckoner for most of the accession this is another one uh, this one and as i told you even collecting and conserving may not be our target 
we should evaluate them and we should come up with some of the important uh, accessions which are very needed for our breeding purposes so we have characterized most of the germplasm accessions and we have identified uh, some of the accessions which are very promising in most of the tri important economically important traits which we are using in case of hybridization especially and even selection also we are using these accessions for crop improvement especially pepper improvement and this is another one database which we have developed for this piper species where if we give the collection number or the this thing it will give up uh, the primary passport data where it was collected and what was the primary passport data recorded on these things like this we are uh, we have developed a database especially for piper's uh, germplasm and when we come to utilization part that is the breeding part we majorly follow clonal selection selection from germplasm open pollinated progeny as i told you uh, sexual rep uh, reproduction is also possible in case of black pepper so we have used open pollination progeny selection and hybridization is another one important which we now targeting using these all these collected germplasm accessions and we also have interspecific hybridization there is a lot of chromosomal variability in case of piper species so we will uh, we will look for the compatible one and we have crossed with majorly targeting most of the important uh, traits for a developing a pre-breeding lens which are one one of the way of utilizing this germplasm and polyploidy breeding also we are attempting and we have also attempted mutation breeding in case of black pepper this is brief about black pepper and coming to the next important crop spice crops tropical spice crop cardamom the same way it also originated in western ghats and it is considered to be the monogenic monogenic that is only one species is found in uh, india it means that is elitaria cardamom other than that in cardamom also there are you may be heard of this large cardamom nowadays in biryani this is the most common one that is amomum scubulatum which is not cultivated in southern india because of this pollinators it has a different pollinators whereas regular cardamom is with uh, honeybees but this amomum scubulatum depends on bees bumblebees so it is major crop in case of northeastern states if you can see the variability in cardamom it is very high there are three different types of echo types we call it as we call it as malabar mysore and vaduka types based on this panical uh, growth type and as i told you germplasm exploration western guards harvest ma maximum variability in case of cardamom especially the cultivated types as i told you there is only one species so we don't have a wild species option in case of cardamom but we have surveyed cardamom in reserves this is a crh which we call as a cardamom in case of idukki district and we also surveyed silent valley and many forest ranges of kerala and even in karnataka especially agumbe district and in tamil nadu gudalur and these lower palanils there we have explored and we have collected some of the unique germplasm and this is the variability as well as telling uh, panicles variability we can see in case of branching and we also can see in case of uh, length uh, panicle length is also varying drastically in case of cardamom and about the capsules there are lot of variation in case of capsules especially for capsule size capsule length and even color the green color ca capsules and yellow color capsules and inner seeds also there is lot of variability in case of capsules and apart from uh, means iisr regional station appangla is maintaining the maximum uh, this is considered to this is nag center for cardamom we are maintaining around 622 germplasm accessions with us and other than that there are only few organizations are working on this cardamom especially mailadampara that is comes under spice board and pampadampara and mudigere they also have little bit of uh, germplasm accessions with them and at appangla as i told you uh many collections from all the stations are maintained here as a nag center and we are maintaining this uh and as i told you uh characterization and identifying the unique germplasms for unique traits is very very important in all the crops so we have characterized for most of the uh, economically important traits and we have now presently these are busy used in case of hybridization to develop a uh, resistant varieties those things this is a field map as a uh, this is one of the biggest problem with our uh, uh, horticulture crops where it requires large number or large area for maintenance and all this all 62 6622 germplasm accessions are being maintained in the field and they are being characterized in ginger and turmeric uh, i just passed through this most of the in information in case of ginger and turmeric as sabu sir will be covering most of the things uh, ginger and turmeric are two tricky crops because 
uh, sexual reproduction is very, very, very meager, may not be reported in most of the species. So variability, whatever it is there, it is only through evolution and accumulation through time. That's why we find very less variability in case of ginger and turmeric. And these crops are exclusively multiplied using rhizomes. And uh, as I told you, somoclonal variations are also uh, reported in case of ry rhizomes. And maximum variability is found in India, especially Northeast and Southeast Asia, especially Indonesia, this Myanmar, this thing. In India, Northeast states, this is considered to be the major variability center for ginger than uh, Southern states. <coughs> and 24 species are reported from Malayan region. Eight species are from Western Ghats. These are some of the important uh, species which are I will just pass through this most of the photos. Sabu sir will be giving more information on this, hoping so. These are some of the species, even though not as a rhizomatic or a spice crops, they have a wide scope as a even ornamentals also. This is one, one important species, Pectabel, where uh, it can attract, uh, you can see the pictures, it is very attractive. Like that, we have also honeycomb ginger. So, so many different species are there in case of ginger. And as a IASR being a NAC center and conservation of these zinzivers, we have established a garden of gingers where we have built a polyos inside that all the collected, especially these wild species are conserved in case of this uh, garden of ginger, a conservatory, all, all, all species information is available within this garden. And as a NAC center, uh, for this ginger, we are maintaining around uh, 567 uh, uh, ginger uh, genotypes and we are maintaining them in tubs. Whenever we need for our characterization, we will go for field planting or else generally they are maintained in tubs. Other than uh, IASR, many IASRP centers are also maintaining some of the gemplasm accessions. And these are the local cultivars which are there. As I told you, some of their we have exotic lines like Jamaica and Rio de Janeiro. These are some of the exotic uh, which we are maintaining with us. And we also developed some of the improved varieties in case of ginger. And uh, when we harvest to next planting, uh, they may, we should not mix up. So we are maintaining them in a trace uh, for around the storage period. And then we will go for planting in case of tubs. And these are some of the unique collections what we have collected. This is a bold rhizome from Nagaland. This is also a finger bold uh, full whole rhizome in from Idukki district. And this is red ginger, which is collected from Kotayan. We have so many unique lines in case of ginger also. And these are some of the improved varieties. As I told you, we don't have a hybridization or sexual reproduction in case of uh, ginger. So we solely depend on these gemplasm accessions evaluating them and identifying with the important characters and releasing them as a that is gemplasm selection is one of the major breeding method followed in case of uh, ginger and turmeric <coughs> and coming to curcuma uh, these uh, turmeric the curcuma species also uh, some of the important species occurs in india that is curcuma longa is our regular turmeric Curcuma aromatica is our kasturi manjal, curcuma amada is our uh, kasturi manjal, and this is black turmeric. These are some of the other than curcuma langa, these are three which are gaining market nowadays because of its maybe uh, mango ginger is utilized in case of pickle, and this aromatica used in cosmetics industry. So these are also some of the economically important traits. And as I told you, along with zinzibus, ginger wild, this curcuma are also having. Uh, what we call as an aesthetic or as a floriculture crops, it, it, it also has a very good uh, appearance. And this is the diversity which occurs in case of especially these uh, India and uh, nearby countries. There are around 16 species which are endemic to India, uh, uh, southern India, uh, especially Harita, Sudamonata. These are some of the species which are found only in case of uh, Western Ghats. And this is the species distribution in whole India. These are some of the other things. And being a NAC center, we are we are uh, conserving around 1,368 gemplasm accessions. And along with that, uh, an NBPGR at Trishur Center is also maintaining a lot of uh, these uh, turmeric accessions with them. Along, along with that, many ASRP centers are also maintaining 
some of the jump plasm accessions. This is not center as I told you. We are maintaining them in tubs. Cultivar diversity. These are some of the cultivars which are generally cultivated. Most of the things are uh, locally, locally evolved one, and they are cultivating. And as I told you, turmeric is till now it was considered to be the vegetatively propagated crops. But one of our scientists is able to do hybridization in turmeric and develop uh, many hybrids and. Uh, uh, say inbred lines in case of turmeric. The problem with turmeric is the chromosome because of it, uh, cloid in nature, chromosomes may will not be stagnant most of the time. So, but he is able to develop hybridization hybrids and many inbred lines which are presently in ASRP trials. And coming to the last part of this one, that is tree spices, where we are dealing around six tree spices. Uh, those spices which are obtained by trees, we generally call it as tree spices. Uh, India and uh, especially these Myanmar and all those countries nearby India, Southeast Asian countries are the major growers and producers of uh, tree spices. In India, major tree spices we consider to be nutmeg, cinnamon, clove, cocum and garcinia. Along with that, we also have these allspice presently, which I will be dealing at the last. And when we talk about species diversity in case of Western species diversity present in Western Ghats, Garcinia, we have around 10 to 12 species. Cinnamon, we have around 16 species in Western Ghats. Cysisium, that is clove related species, we have 20 species. And Mystica, nutmeg species, we have around 5 species in Western Ghats. And Jamplasm maintained at IASR nutmeg. Uh, we have around 150 accessions, which are very unique in most of the characters, which I will be telling in future slides. Cinnamon, we have around 210 accessions. Clove, we have very less, the reason which I will be telling. Clove, we have around 25. And allspice, this is what we call as Sarva Sugandhi in Kannada and Malayalam. Uh, uh, and another one is Garcinia. We are maintaining around 195 accessions in case of Garcinia. Coming to cinnamon, uh, 25 species are reported from India. And in cinnamon, Cinnamon viram, this is considered to be the true cinnamon. Cinnamon cassia, cinnamon tamala, this is what tejpat. Generally, we call it as biryani leaf. This is another one cinnamon species which is economically important. Another one is cinnamon malabatum. Uh, may not be as a commercial one, but nowadays people are extracting essential oil from the leaves of this one. And so it is also becoming one of the economic, uh, economically important species in case of uh, cinnamon. These are some of the species which are found in case of uh, Western Ghats and coming to many, many people may not be knowing this one. What is cinnamon and what is cassia? Cinnamon viram that is considered to be sir, sorry to cinnamon. interrupt in between, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, with positive time, can you wind up in five minutes, sir? Yeah, I will take the next five minutes only. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, other things is cassia, which is. Uh, we, this is a bigger one. We also call it as a China cassia. But true cinnamon is the one which is uh, good for health. This is some of the variations in case of cinnamon, different species. And uh, these are some of the endangered species which we have. Along with IASR, there is uh, Dapoli um, uh, University at Konkan Krishi Vidya Pit. They are maintaining, the TNA is maintaining, and Kerala Agri Agriculture University are maintaining some of the cinnamon species. These are some of the improved varieties. And coming to nutmeg, you may be knowing both maize and the nut and even nowadays rindi is also a very important economical part in case of nutmeg. All three parts are used in commercial value. And these are some of the important uh, species which are found in case of uh, myristica. Uh, some of the places where we generally found these myristica swamps is in case of Anchal forest ranges uh, and Shendurarni. And in Karnataka, it is found in Uttar Karnada district, and even in Goa also, some sacred grooves are found in of these mystica swamps. This is how we are, means we have collected many, many species, many genotypes from all these Kerala, Maharashtra, Karnataka, and Andaman Nicobar Island, and we are maintaining at the gemplasm uh, field in IASR Calicut. And presently, we are maintaining around 150 cinnamon species, uh, sorry. And uh, nutmeg uh, genotypes at IASR. And these are some of the unique genotypes what we collected recently. One is with rudimentary seeds. When you want to cultivate only for this uh, maize purpose, this is one genotype. And we also have collected a uh, genotype with yellow maize. Usually it will be red, but this is a yellow one. 
and this is a monoecious usually it is considered to be the unisexual where we have to plant both male and female separately but we have identified a line with this uh, monoecious type where one plant will be sufficient to give you fruit because it has both male and female and these are some of the improved varieties in case of cinnamon and as i told you we have characterized many accessions and we have identified some of the unique lines for uh, important quality traits especially and this is clove clove is considered to be self pollinated crops very very uh, means it is it uh, originated or uh, from the indonesia that is the spice island very low variability is found in case of uh, clove because of the self pollination and these are some of the unique types which we have which we registered also one is the bold type and this is zanzibar clove with little bit pinkish in nature and this is a dwarf clove instead of big tree it will develop into a dwarf one and coming to the another last one that is garcinia nowadays because of this anti obesity character this is gaining lot of importance this is one species which originated in our uh, western ghats only these are some of the species which we are maintaining at uh, iasr and i would like to tell about interspecific grafting whoever who is handling about these uh, especially horticulture tree tree crops interspecific grafting will come as a way for us when we want to conserve lot of wild species so we have you identified one of our scientists dr nisar has identified some of the root stocks which are suitable for different uh, garcinia species and we are grafting it and we are maintaining it there is lot of advantage with this grafting and conservation and this is another one spice crop which is uh, basically from uh, jamaica nowadays in kerala we are gaining this is called as all spice because it blends the say Uh, um, aroma of many major spices like black pepper cardamom and nutmeg and clove so it is called as all spices and coming to the last part of the, our crops that is vanilla even though it is an american originated very few variations are found in case of vanilla vanilla belongs to orchid family so lot of flower variation is also seen and in case of leaf morphology also there is some variability in case of vanilla and this is how we are maintaining in a, a, a vanilla is a very sensitive crop so we are maintaining under protected uh, poly house where uh, all the accessions are maintained within this poly house and uh, some of the lines which we registered under nbpgr for uniqueness these are the list we we most of the characters we have identified and we have registered with nbpgr and uh even dust characters we have also come up with uh, dust characters for black pepper small cardamom ginger and turmeric coming to conclusion part of it as i told you spices is one of the integral part of our indian cuisine and nowadays it is gaining lot of importance as a nutraceutical and cosmetics industry also so and may not be all species may not be important for us but every day research is going on and new molecules are being identified in future they will definitely help in identifying of the high value molecules which are very important for the medicine industry with this and it's our responsibility to conserve most of this species diversity which were uh, spices diversity which originated in india especially western ghats i acknowledge because all these crops are handled by different different uh, uh principal investigators i thank all of them for this and i also thanks organizers for this opportunity thank you thank you all thank you very much sir for the enlightening presentation on the spices we would understand the worst information on spices needs to be shared while you made it very crisp and clear briefed about the diversity at species and cultivar levels Uh, its collection domestication its difficulty and conservation uh, and also given importance on documentation also in black pepper cardamom ginger turmeric tree spices uh, sir we have few uh, questions yes ma'am hand okay uh, first question from dr r chitra uh, piper barberry whether it is tree or wine it's a wine ma'am very very shy nature wine which grows very to the limited height it's a wine okay uh, sir another question is what is the botanical name of blue ginger uh especially this thing i think sabu sir will be giving a clear cut idea on this one okay uh, there are so many names associated with black ginger and uh, blue ginger even red ginger also most of these mostly sabu sir will enlighten this one i hope 
Uh, okay, sir. Another question from Dr. G. Raman Nandam. Can we get the grafts of nutmeg uh, and suitable varieties for Andhra Pradesh? Yeah, yeah, ma'am. If you contact our institute, we are producing some of the improved varieties in nutmeg, which can be collected from IASR, ma'am. Mm, okay, sir. Another from Dr. K. Kaldar Babu. What are the varieties suitable for shade nut cultivation in pepper and cardamom? Uh, most of the things where some of the varieties which are not uh, which are very sensitive to sunlight especially like panuron may not be suitable for shade net remaining most of the cultivars can be cultivated within the protected cultivation now okay uh, for so more information they contact me on this number okay. uh, so that i can share some of the important varieties yeah it's uh, which are suitable for those specific regions i think everybody can see the uh, screen it's, it's email ID as well as mobile number is displayed. And another question from Dr. Manoj Mali. In hybridization of turmeric, which varieties are utilized? Especially, uh, means Suranjana is one is used as a male parent. But what uh, our Nair, sir, he's working on this turmeric. What he has found is our improved varieties are not suitable for hybridization. Only local cultivars with stable uh, chromosome numbers are suitable for hybridization. Those only were used for hybridization in case of turmeric. So one more question, your view on black turmeric as medicinal and its demand? Yeah, a lot of, especially this is another one tricky thing, especially black, uh, black turmeric, they are telling it will go for some black magic and all those things. But as a medicinal value, medicinal purpose, there is a little bit demand on this one, but as a commercial, uh, they should think and cultivate. Market is very restricted for this black turmeric. Okay, uh, from Dr. Binu Matthew, there is a suggestion to everyone. Mekhala is also rich in spices and medicinal plant species. If anyone is interested, uh, he is also ready to collaborate. And sir, from participants, there is request for your uh, PowerPoint presentation. If you are ready to share with us, we will share to the participants. Okay, ma'am, I'll share. Oh, okay, you. thank you very much, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you. We'll move on to next presentation. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. M. Sabu, uh, CSIR Emeritus Scientist at Malabar Botanical Garden. Uh, he has reviewed a taxonomic revision of South Indian Singibraceae and also 26 new taxa and five cultivars of large cardamom and three new generic records, 14 species records for India and eight new records for peninsular India were established. And he's also involved in the rediscovery of 10 species after a lapse of as many as 155 years. And Dr. M. Sabu was the pillar in establishing the largest germplasm of Indian Musaceae and Marandesia in the Botanical Garden of Calicut University. On his guidance, more than 10 theses in taxonomy and published over 100 papers in angiosperm taxonomy in various national and international journals. And Dr. M. Sabu backed Professor Panjan Maheshwari gold medal during 2010, Professor V.V. Shivarajan gold medal during 2014, and uh, recently, K. Janagi Amal National Award for ta uh, Plant Taxonomy during mm -hmm. 2018. He's also a fellow of the Indian Botanical Society for Plant Reproductive Biology and also fellow of the Linnaean Society in 2012. Uh, without further delay, I welcome you, sir. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. So first of all, uh, I take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Rajasegaran and also congratulate him for organizing and his team for organizing such a wonderful uh, seminar. So 
today i am going to present why the our indigenous bananas and gingers which are having only this uh, ornamental potential because uh, just before my talk dr shivumar has uh, shown some of these spices uh, which are included in this um, families gingers uh, the singibrace and other families but here i am considering only the diversity of um, uh, the ornamental or potential ornamental gingers and bananas and mostly they are from india or they are endemic to india and uh, here you can see my email you can contact me our email if any doubt or you can go through there is a website gingersofindia.com you can go through that website also then gingers here in the sense um, the members of the order centibrales which are having eight families of which today i am considering only the mesesia and centibrasia which was libresa from the largest um, families of this uh, eight uh, families of order centibrales and all together they are also called as gingers also even mesesia also included or called as gingers they are not the true edible gingers you can see the distribution of these gingers in india uh here you can see the western guards they are tropical in origin and so they are distributed in the tropics uh, northeast india and andaman nicobar islands and here you can see there are nearly 32 tax and 270 species in these two families the centibrasia and musaceae and one genus is endemic that is paracamphoria then coming to this um, uh, uses of gingers we can uh, there are several uses like medicine spices food ornamental perfumes cosmetics fiber rituals and dyes and because of this time uh, constraint i am discussing only the ornamental uh, value of this uh, gingers on the wild bananas so these ornamental gingers and bananas are they form a wonderful group of plants related to our edible banana and gingers and they can be grown either as outdoor plants even as indoor plants some of these species and uh, they are well known for their attractive foliage showy in fluorescence and often brightly colored bracts so relatively they are new as ornamentals and landscape plants in india because uh, many of these species they are widely used in many of these southeast asian countries and but in india very few are we are using as ornamental species then members of these families can be successfully grown as ornamental plants garden ornamental plants and they can be divided into two groups the evergreen and non evergreen forms then they can be grown in outdoor in summer as indoor plants in winter so more than 50 species 250 species are grown as ornamentals in the world and less than 25 species they are grown in india then of this majority are exotic so here lies the importance of our potential ornamental gingers and potential ornamental bananas in india the horticultural potentiality of several wild species are yet to be utilized so coming to this uh, gingers and bananas the major plus point of this group they are easy to grow and need very simple care and most of them show vigorous growth and clump formation and uh, you might have experienced the cultivation of our um, uh, turmeric and the ginger like that most of these uh, ornamental gingers also they show vigorous growth and clump formation and mostly they are disease and pest free and another important feature is um, they are tropical in origin so they are good suited or adapted to our conditions that is the tropical con climatic conditions so bright color and longer duration of inflorescence that is one plus point and also used as cut flowers with the longer waist life so because uh, many species they have long stalk so that is an added advantage as cut flowers in uh, flower waste and many show continuous flowering 
and the fragrance and attractive color of the flower so some of these flowers they are very fragrant so the if they are grown in garden and uh, and the some perfumes can be extracted from these uh, plants and they can be grown as hedge plants ground covers or indoor plants and uh, coming to the parts of attraction of these um, uh, gingers uh, mainly almost all these aerial parts that depends upon species to species uh, like the foliage they may be light to dark green in color then purple silver colored flower surface then variegated with yellow white and purple these are all some of the leafy characters which gives attraction as um, ornamental plants then inflorescence also it is a spike type of inflorescence and uh, the major attraction is they are colored bracts then flowers etc then color of bracts change from white to green to red or purple on aging and uh, they can be used as cut flowers and some cases uh, fruits are also brightly colored so they also give some attraction so some of the common uh, this uh, ornamental genera like alpinia amomum bosenbergia cot Alpinia is called as the shell gingers. This can see this shell gingers. It almost resembles like a shell. Then uh, Bosombergia, Cotleya. Then uh, it is high altitude and uh, it is suited for this, um, uh, not for our uh, climate, but uh, it is suited for a temperate climate. Then Costas or spiral gingers. Then Curcuma or hidden or surprise gingers. Here you can see the surprise gingers. Then Atlingira or tar gingers. Here you can see the tar ginger, then globa or dancing ladies, then hedicium or butterfly because it has the shape of a butterfly, uh, wings, then lasanianthus or praying mantis gingers. Here you can see this lasanianthus. So these are all good cut flowers, whereas this hedicium mostly they are aromatic. Then comfrey or peacock gingers. Here you can see the variegation on the leaves. It resembles the peacock feathers. So they can be used as brown covers. Then the sinjibar or edible gingers. Here you can see this. Uh, uh, some of these gingers, and I will show you some of the photographs, which are good. And uh, heliconias, calatias, and bananas. Heliconias and calatias. I am not dealing here, but uh, they are mostly exotic and uh, widely cultivated in gardens. And bananas, you can see that uh, beautiful uh, ornamental uh, banana flower or inflorescence. And here, uh, coming to this, um, uh, some of these, I will quickly go through some of the uh, photographs of uh, good ornamental or potential ornamental species. So you can take up some of these species and uh, domesticate it and spread in the in our gardens. So some of these Alpinia species, the Alpinia uh, galanga and Alpinia calcareata, they are medicinally important also, but uh, the flowers also are important. Then Alpinia mutica, here you can see that the inflorescence and uh, the fruits are also orange in color and uh, they remain for uh, minimum one month, one inflorescence. So these are some of the other Alpinia, Alpinia nigra and Alpinia blepharocalyx. These are all good ornamentals. And uh, this uh, Alpinia cerumbati is another very good ornamental species. The leaves are large and the waxy uh, coating and this inflorescence is also very large and they can be used as a cut flower. And uh, this purpurata or the red ginger, then Alpinia leutocarpa, you can see the lower side is purple, and viteta, the variegated leaf. And some of these uh, very variations of this Alpinia purpurata, they are red colored, then uh, ball shaped or uh, some varieties and some pink or purple colored bracts are also present and amomum ingi and this is also rawi and from um, sikkim and you can see this inflorescence which is around uh, one and a half feet and continuously they produce flowers and amomum sabuanum from eastern himalaya and this is a very interesting species from uh, nicobar islands this can be used as a ground cover small plant maybe around uh, one feet. So you can see that beautiful flower, it continuously produces the flowers for around uh, two months. So it's a very good ornamental species. And Atlingira fensley, it is another 
our native uh, lord ginger from nicobar islands you can see the variation in the color pink and white and this another tall ginger ginger elasia you can see the long stalk so one flower can be used as a bouquet and the dark red colored and purplish colored and then carcuma spargainifolia carcuma roscoiana and this is a very interesting species from andaman nicobar islands you can see that the inflorescence that can be used as a cutla both spargainifolia and roscoiana then carcuma rabdorta and these two species they are also good cut flowers and the carcuma alismatifolia there are two variations and this also very good cut flower and carcuma mutabilis and this is from uh, our kerala from the lambur area you can see the variation in the uh, comma bracts as well as the flowers and uh, here you can see the uh, rainbow ginger or the carcuma aurantiata this is common in the western coast of kerala and karnataka you can see the variation so good cut flower and rubra bracteata is a new species and also good uh, you can see the variation this is cinadora from uh, maharashtra and goa region and you can see the variation and it's a good uh, ornamental plant this carcuma uh, montana and carcuma karnatakensis and this is uh, earlier uh, shumar also discussed about this carcuma sicia or this uh, black turmeric and this is angustifolia or the east indian arrow root and this inflorescence is also very beautiful and it produces the inflorescence first and then the leaves are produced and this is pitiolata this is also from nicobar islands you can see the beautiful uh, and suda montana and uh, another carcuma this is a uh, high altitude plant Cotlea spicata. Uh, this is um, from the Sikkim and other uh, high altitude. You can see and globa or the dancing ladies. Here you can see globa shamburki. This is also a small plant that can be used as a ground cover, and it also produces the bear the flowers on this inflorescence for about uh, one and one and a half months. So these uh, two are good cut flowers: globa viniti and shavodiana. and the colors white and black are very prominent and globa another vangari from uh, misora media and these are all not at all used as ornamentals so but uh, they are very potential ornamentals you can see the color of the bracts and the flowers etc and some of these butterfly gingers they are very uh, Large flowered ones and the fragrant ones are also. You can see this uh, Edicium coronarium, and you can see the color variation of this uh, different species: Wardi, Europhyllum, and LVC. And this uh, one flower is, is enough for uh, the fragrance in a one room. It mostly opens in the evening, so to, throughout the night you will get that fragrance. And this is otherwise called as the Sarkalyana Sargandigam. That is, it is believed that Bima went in search of one flower. and uh, it is this flower then coccinium and uh, this gardenery and you can see that the magnificent uh, very large inflorescences with small flowers they are compact and uh, radiatum these are all some other species of radicium and uh, greeny and this is also from darjeeling area here you can see that uh, the beautiful flowers and uh, they used it for decoration and other things and densiflorum lvc etc and these are all good ornamental plants can be cultivated and rubrum this is another very magnificent uh, the edicium species and edicium grassley and lasania and the another genus and only three species are there and new genus we published and uh, this also you can see the inflorescence is around 1 and 1/2 feet and good cut flower and two other species uh, another new species we have published from northeast india this is uh, paracamphorea sinanda you can see that uh, inflorescence that is produced from the base and uh, the flowers are white in color and the peacock ginger that is the it will wind up paracamphorea elegans and some other camphorea species uh, that This camphorea rotunda here 
so the leaves uh, lower side is purple and the peacock like variations are there on the leaves and kanthariya galanga can be used as a ground cover and the flowers are also very attractive and zanjibar sarumet is very common throughout india and uh, it's a very good cut flower nearly 10 rupees you will get for one uh, in florescence it turns to red in color when mature so even in the flower vase also the color changes from green to and uh, remains around 3 uh, weeks and this is another uh, uh, zanjibar nisanam from this pune area it's also long stalk and can be used as a cut flower and zanjibar spectabili this is actually not from india but uh, it's a very beautiful ornamental and can be cultivated this and this is odoriferum from uh, nicobar and andaman nicobar islands and uh, here you can see that long stalk in fluorescence and the variegations on these uh, bracts so it's also a good ornamental plant as well as uh, a flower and otensi is another species from andamans and uh, this zanjibar uh, apitatum is from our north india and both are good ornamentals can coming to this um, banana plants here you can see that uh, all these ornamental bananas uh, these are all native to india uh, they are uh, shorter type with the terminal inflorescence and they hardly come around uh, uh, 4 to 5 feet and never it grows beyond that and in some cases it may be around 3 feet or so these uh, these are all good ornamental species the mesa mani and mesa Robra, and here you can see that uh, another very interesting Pelutina or uh, this Misa Marcuana, and uh, here you can see the fruits are also reddish in color. And Misa Velutina, you can see that here there is a self peeling of this flowers, um, uh, sorry fruits, and uh, this phenomenon is noticed only in this uh, Velutina. The fruits are also reddish in color. and the bracts are also very attractive and they are all terminal and erect and these are all some other mesa species and here you can see the color of these bracts and this is uh, uh, ensete another genus and uh, mesa coccinea ensete is also uh, in grows on rock surfaces and it is common in uh, our western ghats and it's also very magnificent and uh, but this is a very large plant uh, more space is required for planting and mesa velutina here you can see that uh, the variety variegata the variegations on these bracts and this is from uh, arunachal pradesh and chuni you can see that the uh, bracts are violetish in color and this also is small plant but it shows the pending pending type of inflorescence and this is another mesa inani and you can see that the inflorescence bracts uh, they continuously produce and not even a single bract is um, fall off all these bracts remain fresh for around one month or two months and the lower female flowers they become mature and form the fruits so seeds are also present so they can be used for cultivation is anseta glaucum from northeast india this is also very good um, i think it's a very large plant but the inflorescence is very big and the bracts are always they are green in color so it will produce this bracts for around one one and a half months it cannot be used as a cut flower or so but uh, it is a very magnificent and uh, elegant type of species anseta glaucum and this is another mesa aurantia ka this is from arunachal pradesh and this also terminal inflorescence and uh, it's a very good ornamental plant then i had a project from the dbt for the domestication of 10 asingibrace plants so we have done some uh, in this uh, domestication of some of the species and here i am giving the economics of growing one species that is the red ginger or the alpinia purpurea in our calicut university garden and uh, here uh, we have calculated that uh, nearly 5400 plants per acre 
can be cultivated uh, that is around 160000 including all the cost land preparation cost of planting material then planting charges and transportation there is application and uh, this one uh, biofertilizers installation of irrigation maintenance etc and now the rate may be much higher because this we are calculated maybe around four five years back then the returns from this um, one acre is uh, first year there is no income because uh, it will take one year to establish and produce or uh, form a large plum and second year uh, you'll get a minimum 24 flowers <coughs> per clump or one flower from one tip and out of uh, 5400 plants and uh, minimum we can calculate rupees five per flower and uh, it becomes around one lakh twenty nine thousand uh, sorry one uh, one lakh twenty nine thousand six hundred uh, in flower census, so total into five, six lakh forty eight thousand. Like third year, uh, we'll get nearly forty eight flowers. The clump becomes larger, and again for four thousand, five thousand four hundred plants, and it comes around two lakhs. And fourth year, nearly fifty uh, uh, in flower census or cut flowers we'll get, and it will come around three lakh twenty four thousand number, and it comes around sixteen lakhs. So average annual expenditure would come around one lakh. So this is a rough calculation. There may be variation uh, from this calculation, but uh, this is a very good plan for cultivation. So you can uh, do this uh, with many of our indigenous um, plants. So sorry then, to interrupt uh, growing in uh, gingers and bananas, it is very uh, easy because uh, there is no need of any, uh, I think, um, description or something like that, because everybody grows this uh, ginger and uh, turmeric. So they grow best in wet, humus rich, well-drained soil. And uh, we place this rhizome at soil level and cover with garden soil and sand and compost. Then mulching is very important. Uh, that will keep uh, the soil cool and moist. And regular watering to avoid wilting also is so sorry to interrupt. The propagation the techniques of this um, the Echinia cariana, we have uh, the this is first time we are reported in this uh, vegetative propagation of this uh, stem cuttings of the, this Echinia cariana. And uh, the bulbils are present in some cases, seeds can be used for propagation, etc. Then we are conducting some waste life experiments and uh, by using this benzyl adenine uh, 1 to 10 milligram per liter and also sucrose and best result we got in this um, s5 b5 that is the sucrose with uh, five percent sucrose and the benzyl adenine five percent and also we added 200 milligram of eight hydroxy phenol sulfate for antimicrobial agent as microbial agent so we can enhance this 13 days of uh, control to 23 days here you can see this, uh, some of the experiments, the plants used in Jibar, then uh, Alpinia, Karkoma, Orangia, etc. Excuse so me, Dr. Sabu, sir. So here you can Sabu, see sir. this uh, SYP. Pardon? Sir, sorry for the inconvenience in between. Sir, okay, uh, out of paucity of time, uh, can you uh, conclude within five minutes, sir? Okay, okay, no problem. Okay. Oh, okay. This uh, 15 days, and uh, here you can see this place, 11 persons of other uh, species. And some of the uh, flower arrangements using only gingers. And uh, off season flowering also, we have done uh, with the night break and uh, by giving intermittent light. And uh, off season flowering uh, January to February. And normally it flowers in September or July to August, but uh, we got it. Then some of the diseases and uh, person diseases of these uh, plants and some of these uh, insects. And uh, we have a large, uh, largest conservatory of um, these gingers in India and third in the world. Here you can see the ginger villa. And uh, uh, this is in Calicut University Botanical Garden. And Swiss House and Ginger House. And these are also in Calicut University Botanical Garden. And uh, recently established in Malabar Botanical Garden also one ginger house. This is the just overview of that one. And some of these um, bananas, wild bananas are also cultivated. And this forms the largest conservation conservatory of these uh, wild bananas in India. And some of these, they are grown in the wild, in the botanical garden. So I should acknowledge these uh, many funding agencies and uh, 
uh, there is forest departments for the collection and other things and this is our ginger team and uh, it's a long time work so thank you very much and uh, uh, if you have any doubts or questions you can call oh so thank, thank you very much thank you very much mm -hmm. sir it was a beautiful journey of museum yeah. and ginger genetic resources appealing collection of alpinia amomum curcuma hericium and uh, also camphiria gingiber and uh, how it can be utilized as spice as well as or ornamental you you briefed about it thank you very much sir we will take up some of the questions sir uh, uh, from dr chitra uh, two questions have come whether seed set is possible in red ginger Sir, can you hear me? Uh, no, not yet uh, recorded. Uh, Only sir, through. Pardon? Uh, sir, do you okay, think the uh, this uh, seed set is uh, so far? Will not. Pardon? So please continue. Am sir. I not audible? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, so far, uh, we never came across this uh, seed setting in Alpinia purpurata or the red ginger. And uh, it can be very well. Uh, Bulbils are produced from this inflorescence, and that can be used as a propagule. And also, these rhizome cuttings are also they will come very easily. And uh, sir, from one Dr. G. Narayan Swami about marketing of red ginger flower. Uh, and almost all these um, uh, ornamental species. They are mostly they are present or used in uh, metropolitan cities. So if you have a collection center in your area, so you can market it and uh, you can send it to some other areas. Oh, mostly sir. it is used in um, hotels and other things. So under question from Dr. Manoj Mali, which species of red ginger will be most suitable under Maharashtra condition? Maharashtra, this Alpinia uh, purpurata, all colors are they are uh, cultivating in Maharashtra, in Bombay, Thane, etc. Uh, some farmers are cultivating this species because their market is uh, more in Bombay and uh, other metropolitan cities, Chennai and Calcutta. Sanitha from Dr. Saitaya, where to get the black turmeric and its coast? Pardon? Where to get this black turmeric material and its coast? Uh, it is mainly present in North and Northeast India. And uh, we have a few collections of this uh, black turmeric. And if they require, they can contact and we will uh, give them some samples. Mm, so another uh, Dr. K. K. Ravindra Kumar want about the NCT Glaucum banana seeds. Yeah. He asked for uh, whether can you share with him. Banana and Sate Glaucum so far uh, we have no seeds at present and it can be uh, propagated only through seeds because no suckers are produced in Nsate, both Nsate Glaucum and Nsate uh, Superbum. Uh, so at present we don't have. Okay, sir. So you can contact somebody from Northeast India, especially Tripura, Meghalaya, uh, Manipur, and uh, other areas. You will get the seeds. Okay, sir. With this, we'll conclude this uh, presentation. And thank you very much, sir, for providing the answers also. Okay, okay then. Thank you. We'll move on to next presentation. With great pride and honor to introduce Dr. Madhavi Reddy, Principal Scientist and Head, Division of Vegetable Crops, ICRI Asia, an eminent chili breeder, developed dust guidelines for chili, bell pepper, and paprika. And Madam is the pil Madam is pillar in the development of four high-yielding chili F1 hybrids such as Arka Mekana, Arka Harida, Arka Shweta, and Arka Khyadi, and also developed chili OP varieties Arka Apir and Arka Supal. And she's also developed bell pepper F1 hybrid Arka Adulia, resistant to powdery mildew and five chili F1 hybrids, resistant to chili leaf curl virus. This variety is the first of its kind. And Dr. Madhavi Madam is recognized as nodal officer for dust testing of chili, paprika, and bell pepper. 
and she is a recipient of icr award for outstanding interdisciplinary team research in horticulture sciences twice during 2010 and 2016 and also recipient of isvs dr harbhajan singh memorial award for best research paper during 2012 and ppv and fra certificate of appreciation during 2017 and madam is confirmed conferred as fellow of national academy of Na agriculture sciences new delhi national academy of horticulture sciences new delhi and indian society of vegetable sciences varanasi madam floor of yours thank you very much for the nice introduction yeah at the outset let me congratulate the organizers In the year of International Year of Fruits and Vegetables, for organizing such a, a very important topic, okay. such an important topic. Uh, coming to my topic, this is on vegetable genetic resources. It's a very vast. Uh, Vast subject covering large number of uh, crops. Um, because of time limit, I will be covering a uh, few important vegetables. I, as we all know, consumption and utilization of genetic resources is very imperative for health and peaceful society. Which um, this statement is has been given by Norman Borlaug. This shows the importance of genetic resources uh, in our daily life. coming to the vegetables in india india is the world's largest second largest producer of vegetables of uh, around 191.77 million tons uh, during 1920 the productivity is 18.5 tons here i would like to show that the requirement of vegetables is 300 grams per capita per day however the availability is 170 grams and the gap is still 130 grams this is not that we we are producing the vegetables it is not that we are uh, producing less for our population and minimum requirement we can meet but the problem is the consumption low consumption is uh, of fruits and vegetables is um, it is not a constraint but need to address the necessary changes in consumer behavior and availability in affordable prices and distribution of availability normally the vegetables or fruits there will be a glut where we will be wasting lot of vegetables if we distribute it properly the cultivation i think we can um, make it available uh, for everybody in the country uh, with proper planning average uh, vegetable consumption is well below the recommended minimum for good health uh, in most of the countries in the world both developed and developing countries it is below recommended uh, this thing many of the countries although the dietary supplements are available um, but for more sustainable nutritional availability it is good to eat balanced diet with sufficient fruits and vegetables vegetables are the good source of health promoting phytochemicals that reduce the risk of obesity and chronic diseases including diabetes cardiovascular diseases and cancer so vegetable production apart from uh, um uh, producing good income apart from giving good income to the farmers it also very good uh, food and uh, provide good food and nutritional security our uh, vegetables are major source of vitamins minerals dietary fibers which is very important and antioxidant substances and these are some of the vegetables which are very rich in beta carotene vitamin c uh, lutein and zeaxanthin lycopene vitamin e and uh, i have given the table what are the vegetables which are rich in uh, different antioxidants um for sustainable food production the preservation of genetic resources plays the maximum uh, very important role and for any crop improvement program also uh, in the multidisciplinary approach the genetic resources are the basis of plant breeding which is very very important without the genetic resources or the diversity we cannot uh, uh, improve any crop in that matter uh, so the um, uh, genetic resources play very important role in crop improvement program uh here the germplasm collection maintenance and characterization collection of cultivated and wild species the valuable reservoirs of useful genes and diversity intra and interspecies crossing to widen the genetic base which is very much required and development of the prebreeding lines 
I'll be explaining later what is the pre-breeding lines. And research and technical groups involved in the vegetable crop improvement maintain the germplasm. We, once we collect, we do have to maintain the germplasm um, uh, collected from various uh, places. And uh, depending upon the crop, we have to maintain um, uh, either the isolation distance or um, selfing or like that, we have to maintain the germplasm properly. That's very important. Not only the collection maintenance is equally important. And local collections are a previous source of land races derived from early introductions from the primary and secondary diversification centers. And the larger collections, including local and international acquisitions available in several countries. And the two main challenges in genetic resources are the phenotypic and molecular characterization of the acquisitions, what we have collected and uh, availability of the uh, information. These are the major constraint, actually. Uh, coming to the centers of origin of vegetable crops, you can see India is a rich vegetable genetic resource diversity, both for indigenous as well as exotic origin, like chili, tomato, um, which we are extensively cultivated, and chili, uh, we are almost all second in the world in the, cultiv in the cultivation, in the area as well as production. Uh, though it got introduced uh, from Central and South America. And we do have a lot of uh, vegetables which have been originated by in the Indo-Burman region. So this is a diversity map of the Brinjal, um, which is uh, originated from Indo-Burman region. And, uh, again, the distributional uh, map of Kukume species. This is the distribution map of Kukume species different species availability. This knowledge uh, will be a very great use for the breeders to collect the germplasm and maintain and use in their breeding programs. And uh, again, in our institute, we also developed one genetic diversity map of Moringa, which is becoming very important crop nowadays. As per WHO recommendations, Moringa is gaining a lot of importance because of its nutritional uh, qualities. And the next is the curry leaf. This is also, um, coming up in a very uh, large scale on commercial cultivation. Of course, earlier every in every house backyard we used to have, but now people are cultivating commercially. This is the genetic diversity of brinjal, tomato, chili, and vokra. I put in one slide. Uh, you can see the variability in the fruit size, color, shape, and uh, of course, uh, biochemical characters. Um, and also, we also look for the biotic and aerobatic stress tolerance. This is the av um, availability of uh, diversity, genetic diversity of these crops. Uh, though um, there is no diversity, improvement will be a big, huge challenge. Uh, so diversity is the uh, very important uh, criteria for any crop improvement, vegetable crop improvement program. This slide, I would like to show the genetic diversity of wattle gourd and pumpkin. Uh, look at the uh, variation in the size and shape and uh, color of the rain and all. Uh, then genetic diversity of ridge gourd and bitter gourd. Bitter gourd is a very, uh, nowadays it is becoming very popular. Many of the was Indian population, as you know, we are all majority of us are diabetic. For them, this bitter gourd is a very good source. And of course, ridge gourd also, there is a lot of variation existing. And even the cucumis species, if you see Akokumis melo and sativas, the cucumis sativas, it is originated from India, Indian region, and this has a two year number of 14. Whereas the cucumis mellow, it is true and number is 24. A lot of variation is that though they belong to the same genus, the cross compatibility issue arises here. And the color variability in tomato and watermelon, we can see. And not only the rain, uh, not only the flesh, even the rain color, also a lot of variation is there in watermelon. Even in tomato, you can see the lot of variability in uh, color. And genetic variability of dolichos bean and uh, vegetable copy. Um, I'm just showing uh, how variable they are and how, uh, depending upon the consumer preference, we can select the type which we want and also the trait of interest. Apart from that, um, not only the uh, germplasm, the though chili got originated from South and uh, Central Asia, it got introduced to our country 500 years back due to its cross pollinating nature and continuous cultivation since then. A lot of land races also evolved in our country. This is a, such a picture to show. These are the Indian chilies which are being uh, cultivated by the farmers. Um, so the land races also evo uh, gets evolved though they are exotic and now India is considered as a second center of origin for, uh, based on the availability of the variable uh, germplasm in the country. 
months one is the collection maintenance and uh, um, maintenance and evaluation next starts if the germplasm uh, next starts is the creation of the variability if the germplasm variability is available as such it's well and good but again depending upon our objective we may need how to create the variability with the available germplasm there is a gene pool concept which has been um, coined by Harlan and Devitt in the year 1991. There are the gene pool number one, two, and three, and four. This is the recently, uh, this is the revised form. The first GP1 is the one where the all cultivated species will be there, and the GP2, uh, where there is some barrier in cross compatibility. If you have knowledge like this, it's very easy to create the germplasm with the available uh, sources. Why this uh, gene pool concept is important? This is gene erosion, genetic erosion and genetic pollution resulted in loss of genetic diversity and uh, biodiversity. Immigration may also result in the addition of new genetic variants to the established gene pool of the particular species or population. As you know, high rates of gene flow can reduce the genetic differentiation between the two groups, increasing homogeneity. For this reason, gene flow has been thought no constraint specialized uh, spe uh, speciation by combining the gene pools of the groups and thus preventing the development of differences in genetic variation that would have led into full speciation. So endemic species can be threatened and extin extinction through the process of genetic pollution that is controlled hybridization and introgression and genetic swamping. The abundant species can interbreed with the rare species swamping in its gene pools. So the gene pool, con uh, in the concept, we have to remember the points. Most commonly used gene pool in the breeding program is GP1, uh, which is a very uh, conveniently we can use this one. But gradual loss of viability uh, from cultivated and their wild forms the cause the genetic erosion. The germplasm collection of crop species consists of large number of lines, varieties, and related wild species of the crops, uh, crop called gene bank completely fertile seeds produced from primary gene pool. There won't be any issue within the GP1. We can um, produce fertile seeds. The partial fertile seeds will be produced crossing with GP1, the secondary gene pool, that is the GP2. And a great difficulty in hybridization produce sterile hybrids uh, crossing with GP1 is called tertiary gene pool. The G4 is also uh, called as gene ocean. The transgene is related to GP4. This is the gene pool concept, which we, one has to uh, keep in mind uh, in the crop, uh, vegetable crop improvement program. For example, in capsicum anum, uh, this is the um, uh, gene, uh, gene uh, pool concept in the capsicum species established based on the hybridization mainly. If the, we have this knowledge in the future, when we want to cross or we want to introgress some genes of interest into the cultivated species, uh, this concept will help us a lot. Uh, similarly, in uh, onion also, there, and there is a very clear uh, uh, hybridization based on the hybridity, uh, hybridization, this thing, the gene pools have been already formed. And this is the gene pools cultivated in cucurbita species, which, which is of great use, and uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary gene pools, you can see here. Next, very important one is pre-breeding. Pre-breeding is the bridge between the genetic resources and the crop improvement. The pre-breeding is, uh, nowadays the pre-breeding is gaining a lot of importance. Even all private seed industries, they are recruiting pre-breeders. The pre-breeding is identification of desirable traits or the genes from unadapted materials that cannot be used directly in the breeding populations. And to transfer these traits to an intermediate set of materials, that breeders will be further used to develop new varieties. In the genetic resources, if the cultivated type of germplasm is there, that can be directly used in the crop improvement program. If I want to transfer any gene of, of uh, useful trait from the wild relatives, then, there is, then the uh, concept of pre-breeding will come. So next comes the first is the collection. Next is the, the next I have explained about the uh, creation of uh, variability. Here now uh, we can look into the conservation. Once we have the good germplasm, there are a lot of uh, international and national institutes as well as the private industries um, are, are preserving the indigenous cultures, land races and wild relatives in medium and long-term storages. 
in that IPGRA earlier it is called now it is called BioVest International, which is located in Rome and Italy, plays a major role. And for vegetable scientists, World Vegetable Center, Taiwan, and of course NDPG and New Delhi. These are the main uh, places uh, internationally and nationally uh, where the germplasm is being preserved. And depending upon the uh, this thing, short term uh, use, uh, storage, medium and long term uh, storage. Normally, vegetables, the seed and pollen will be stored. Um, Biovestry International is a global research for development organization that delivers scientific evidences, management practices, and policy options to use and safeguard agriculture biodiversity to attain global food and nutrition security. Working with partners in low income countries in different regions um, where agriculture biodiversity can contribute to improved nutrition, resilience, and productivity and climate change adaptation. BioVest Inter International is a member of CGIR group, uh, a global research partnership for food secure future. In 2019, BioVest International joined International Center for Tropical Agriculture as the Alliance of BioVest International and CIAT uh, to deliver research-based solutions that harness agriculture biodiversity and sustainably transform food systems to improve people's lives. Next is the World Vegetable Center, which is located in Taiwan. Uh, more than six, 65,000 accessions of 656 species collected from 158 countries. What is the timing is coming? Okay. Um, uh, 158 countries, the World Vegetable Center Gene Bank includes globally important vegetables such as tomato, onion, peppers, cabbage, and more than, more than 10,000 accessions of traditional vegetables. Each year, center distributes 10,000 seed samples to the researchers across the globe. Over the past four decades, this has led to the release of hundreds of new vegetable varieties with particular impact in developing countries. The center works closely with the health sector to overcome the effects of malnutrition in developing countries to promote the health benefits of vegetables as a part of balanced diet and to develop specific health related properties in particular. This is the role of uh, uh, WEC Taiwan. And of course, in India, we have NBPGR, uh, that is National Bureau for Plant Genetic Resources. It is playing a pivotal role in the improvement of various crop plants and diversification and development of agriculture in India through germplasm introduction from various institutes and organizations. It is located in New Delhi and the Bureau has uh, 10 regional stations located in different uh, phytogeographical zones of the country. And uh, an All India coordinated network project and underutilized crops are also is also located in, uh, in the Bureau. So the vegetable crop germplasm that is being conserved at IHR across the crops around 23 crops, around 8,401 germplasm accessions are being maintained. Next comes the utilization, germplasm utilization. The vegetable genetic resources in nutritional security and vegetable breeding. The vegetable genetic diversity is a decisive factor to address the malnutrition. Collecting efforts in hotspots of vegetable diversity, mainly the Africa and the Asian countries are required to conserve this germplasm before it is being replaced by the modern varieties. And vegetable breeders need access to a wide diversity of genetic resources, predominantly farmer varieties, land races, and crop wild species. Diverse and readily accessible genetic resources are vital in crop improvement programs oriented towards high and stable yields, resistance against biotic and abiotic stress, and specific consumer preferences. Genomic assisted breeding is increasingly facilitating the in introgression of favorable genes and the QTLs with the complex inheritance pattern from wild species into cultivated species. Breeders use molecular tools to identify specific genes responsible for resistance against biotic and abiotic stresses and desired horticulture traits are health promoting factors in wild and cultivated germplasm. So the vegetable um, improvement efforts has led to the development and release of numerous vegetable lines resistant to specific pests and diseases, heat tolerance and rich in health promoting compounds. There are some wild germplasm accessions that's, uh, that's very promising uh, for various traits in tomato, uh, mainly for begum viruses, Solanum pimpinellifolium and Solanum peruvianum and chinens. Uh, these are uh, accessions are having good uh, tolerance to begum viruses. And uh, um, the, for verticillium and uh, fusarium, um, TMB and um, 
tobacco mosaic virus and uh, nematodes and corky root diseases and alternaria alternata uh, habricides salanum habricides is a good source and cmv and clavibacter and uh, botrytis uh, botrytis there are the different accessions of wild species which are uh, very good use for in the crop improvement program and there are some traits introduced are in progress into introduced means from the cultivated one and in progress from the wild species into lycopersicon cultivars there are so many reports and uh, these are the different um, traits which got in progress and introduced from different species and you through markers they got um, the gene pyramiding uh, is being done to bring all the useful genes into the cultivated types and there is a germplasm accession promising for various traits in chili a lot uh, for a lot of major diseases resistant sources have been identified and uh, there are traits in progress into the capsicum species is for capsicum proteins the hypersensitivity reaction to tobacco mosaic virus and from chinans the hypersensitivity reaction to uh, pepper mild mortal virus these are the traits which got in progress into capsicum uh, anum cultivars uh, across the species and these are the germplasm accessions promising for various traits in okra for different biotic stresses what are the accessions like uh, um, uh, bell muscus and many hot and uh, plant introduction number for different diseases already the literature is available which can be used in our crop improvement program apart from major diseases uh, for even uh, for insect pests a uh, lot of sources have been already identified and published and for abiotic stress also in okra different accessions have been identified and for other other than this uh, for horticulture traits such as fruits per plant number of fruits and branches per fruit and color of the pod which is very important and attractive smooth and green fruits these are the sources identified this is in general about uh, three major crops i have taken um, because due to short of time i cannot i could not cover other vegetables uh, with this uh, vegetable uh, coming to our institute uh, in different uh, crops of around 29 crops we are working 143 varieties we have released so far in that 112 are op varieties and f1 hybrids are 31 uh, like in tomato you can see arka samrat and arka rakshak which are very uh, uh, popular and high yielding uh, hybrids which are having uh, resistance to three diseases to, uh, tomato leaf curl virus bacter wilt and uh, early blight tomato leaf curl virus is yeah, resistant genes uh, of, that is a ty2 gene which we have used it got in progress from um, uh, peruvianum species of uh, lycopersicum salanum peruvianum and a chili uh, we have many varieties which we could uh, um, develop using cgms maize sterile system and which are suitable for very uh, varied market segments here again the powdery mildew resistance we could in progress from uh, capsicum bucketum species uh, coming to brinjal bacterial trust bacterial is a big problem we are releasing many varieties and hybrids which are having resistance to bacterial with uh, this uh, brinjal this is a uh, dingrus multiple uh, the multiple purple that is a land race received from uh, philippines which we used and we could transfer this resistant gene into brinjal so like this uh, different genetic sources we have used and developed uh, high yielding and highly adaptable and uh, uh, preferred uh, vegetable varieties in different uh, vegetables like tomato chili brinjal onion watermelon and now uh, in watermelon uh, we are uh, Uh, introducing uh, genes for uh, watermelon bud necrosis virus from citrullus colocynthus that is a citroid group and uh, of course okra vivm b resistance uh, we could anamica we could uh, introduce the resist vivm b resistant genes from abelmescus tetrophilus and there are quite many examples like that which we have used and developed many varieties uh, across the crops these are all the varieties the list i have given uh, these are the pictures where you can show some of the popular uh, Uh, varieties which having good resistance to biotic uh, stresses and also having um, good mark um, yield and uh, marketable preference even in brinjal bacterial resistance is one of our major objectives in chili we are looking for cmv cvmv and uh, chili leaf curl virus resistance of course powdery mildew resistance also we have in progress from capsicum backetum here the um, from again uh, bell pepper we have uh, good varieties and recently we released our cartelia hybrid in bell pepper Uh, here again the powdery mildew resistance from uh, hot peppers again we transferred into bell peppers and uh, the uh, we have lot of leguminous vegetables uh, in french bean and pole beans and cowpea and uh, yard long bean and uh, we, we have good varieties of uh, pepper green pea which are having very good resistance to powdery mildew and uh, also suitable for uh, heat uh, heat stress conditions 
and uh, we have uh, good varieties of dolichos bean, both bush as well as uh, pole types. And we also uh, developed watermelon varieties uh, like um, Arkamanic, which is having triple uh, fungal disease resistance, and uh, Arkamuttu and Arka Akash, this is a hybrid, and Arka Shyama, very recently we released, it is an icebox type, and Arka Siri, this is another uh, variety which we developed, uh, muskmelon variety, and um, um, there is Arka Bharat, uh, patti pan variety and uh, arka suryamukhi this is a fruit fly tolerant uh, pumpkin variety arka chandan very rich in vitamin e uh, like that we have a series of uh, vegetable varieties which we have released from our institute this uh, bottle goat varieties shreyas nutan and ganga these are having good tolerance to uh, gummy stem blight and uh, ridge goat also we have excellent uh, variety arka prasan and arka vikram is an fn hybrid and arka bharat is a interspecific uh, uh, species which we have developed and uh, released as Arka Bharat. It's in spine goat, which is becoming, gaining very, uh, very much popular. It's becoming. And we do have uh, uh, okra varieties, and Arka, Arka Nikita is a FN hybrid, and Arka Nishant, it's a um, that radish, radish variety and a carrot is with potomilo tolerance and we have huge number of onions which are suitable for different uh, markets, multiplier onion and uh, onions for kharif and rabi seasons. And a lot of leafy vegetables have been uh, released from our institute uh, which are having low in oxalates and uh, uh, multi-cut varieties and Arka Isha is having a very good uh, aroma, uh, coriander variety. These are the some of the uh, outcomes uh, using the genetic resources what we have we are be, uh, maintaining at IHR. To conclude my talk, uh, for any genetic resources, as I explained to you already, GP1 is a very, very important, the gene pool 1. Uh, the genetic resources may plays the major role in that GP1 is a, a primary a gene pool which can be used directly in the crop improvement program. And the GP2 and the GP3 uh, the gene pools can also get introgressed into our cultivated species through pre-breeding and this can be in turn transferred into um, um, culti uh, that can be uh, um, introgressed into the cultivated species and so that we can develop good um, a number of uh, varieties which are having resistance to various uh, major diseases and also it is now time to uh, stacking or pyramid the genes from the uh, gene pools and into the cultivated species, uh, both for biotic and abiotic stresses. Uh, so the future uh, uh, um, future will be the elite lines and land races and wild relatives through the conventional and biotechnological interventions and also uh, pyramiding the genes, we can develop elite varieties and hybrids um, in vegetable crops for the betterment of the um, people. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Madam, for the enlightening presentation about vegetable genetic resources. We understand the most information on vegetable needs to be shared while you made it very lucid. Uh, brief the diversity of cucumbers, chili, and its land races, dolicos, bean, curry leaf, moringa, and elaborated about gene pool concept pre-breeding, pre and also about the collection, creation of variability in germplasm, how to conserve the vegetables, and how to utilize also. Thank you very much, uh, Madam. Um, madam, let's check whether any queries has come. Madam, so far no uh, questions have come. Uh, if anything is there, we'll mail you, ma'am. Okay. Sure. Thank you, sir. Uh, ma'am, uh, one uh, from Dr. K. Kaldar Babu. Uh, he is asking, can you please tell the pungency and oleoresin content in the released chili hybrids and varieties of IHR? If you can send me the email, I will send. Oh. It varies. Uh -huh. varies with the variety. Okay. It is up to 1 lakh SHU. Okay. You okay. can uh, send mail to madam and uh, get the I will send content. the characteristics okay. of the hybrids released. Okay. That's all, no? Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. And for all the participants, it's sorry for delaying your lunch for half more hour. We have one more lecture. Uh, and you can break, uh, the lunch break will be from 1.30 to 2. 2.30, sorry. So I will uh, introduce next speaker.
It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. V. Neeral, Principal Scientist from ICR Central Plantation Crops Research Institute, Kasakot, who had more than 25 years of scientific service in ICR. Madam is actively involved in the enrichment of national active germplasm site with coconut genetic resources from diverse geographical regions and trade specific germplasm. Not only collection, she also developed coconut descriptors and IPGRA catalog of world conserved coconut germplasm and also established an international coconut gene bank for South Asia. Dr. Neral is also involved in the most difficult task of developing improved coconut varieties, including dove, dove tender, nut varieties, dual purpose, tender nut and copra varieties, comprised to hybrid varieties, tall or semi-tall varieties with high yield tolerance to biotic and abiotic stress. She is also actively involved in registration of four coconut varieties with PPVFRA, such as Kalpa Pradipa, Kalpa Denu, Kalpa Mitra, and Kalpa Reksha, and also eight trade specific coconut germplasm with ICR NVPGR. Uh, Madam is acting as nodal officer for the PPVFRA Dust Center for Coconut. On her account, there are 100 publications, including technical articles, research papers, books, book chapters, and technical bulletins. Uh, Madam's active participation in the coconut jump blossom and characterization and this experience will surely enlighten us. Without further delay, I'll welcome Dr. Neeral, Madam. Over to you, Madam. Thank you, Dr. Anushma. I hope my screen is visible. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. A uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, of course, I've been uh, given a topic on diversity of uh, plant genetic resources and plantation crops. Uh, but considering the paucity of time, of course, uh, I will limit my. Uh, uh, presentation to the diversity in the case of coconut, aricanut, and cocoa, which are the mandate crops of ICR uh, Central Plantation Crops Research Institute. Uh, all of you will agree that uh, in spite of the fact that we have a lot of uh, field crops, fruit crops, vegetable crops, still plantation crops are important and uh, they sustain the livelihood of uh, more than uh, uh, 1 million growers and they also contribute to the uh, economy through agricultural exports. In addition, they're also uh, sustaining the livelihoods of uh, uh, what is that uh, backward and ecological fragile regions and uh, socially and economically weaker classes. So conserving the plant genetic resources and plantation crops is even more important considering the climate changes that we are witnessing in uh, uh, recent uh, years. So I will just limit my presentation to the diversity, which is there in the three major crops, the status of the conservation, characterization, and how the data is being managed. Uh, of course, I'll be just touching it in uh, a very brief manner. And uh, the types of germplasm which we are conserving includes ecotypes, or in some cases, the land races, uh, varieties which are obsolete, as well as those in cultivation, then we have breeding lines and also trade specific genetic stocks that have been developed. In addition, we have wild forms and wild relatives. In the case of coconut, we do not have wild forms or relatives. But in the case of aricanut and cocoa, we do have uh, relatives and related genera as well as uh, species which are concerned. I will first uh, uh, tell the status of the uh, genetic resources which are conserved. ICR CPCRA Castrogoat hosts the National Active Germplasm Site for Plantation Crops, where we are conserving uh, aricanut, coconut, and uh, cocoa germplasm. And as of now, we have about 455 accessions of uh, uh, coconut and 182 accessions of aricanut and 515 accessions of cocoa. And all these germplasm are conserved predominantly in the field gene bank. And we have the field gene bank of uh, coconut, which is located at Castrogoat and also at our uh, uh, center in Kidu. And we have alternate uh, gene banks located in our centers at Mohit Nagar, and uh, that is in West Bengal, and Kahikuchi in Assam. 
Uh, we also have some germplasm which is located in uh, Cary, that is Port Blade, the World Coconut Germplasm Center. Uh, uh, coming to Ericanet, we have the National Field Gene Bank located at our regional station in Britain. And we have alternate field gene banks again located in our research centers at Mohitnagar in West Bengal and Kaikuchi in Assam. Uh, coming to Coco, we have the National uh, Gene Bank located at our uh, regional station, Britain. And we have alternate gene banks which has been developed in our regional in our research center at uh, Kidu in Karnataka. And uh, we have uh, two more centers recently established, one under the TNA, TNU, that is Tamil Nadu Agriculture University at uh, Coimbatore. And we have one under the YSR Horticulture University in Andhra Pradesh, which is uh, located in, uh, uh, what is it, uh, in uh, the Vijayarai Center. So, so we have uh, main predominantly field gene banks, uh, both a main gene bank and an alternate gene banks. In addition, we have also uh, uh, trying to have complementary conservation strategies. And uh, right now, complementary conservation of germplasm, we are taking up in the case of uh, coconut, where pollen is uh, uh, cryoconserved. And similarly, the somatic embryos in the case of coconut are also uh, 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 conserved in liquid nitrogen for long-term storage. Uh, in addition, the core germplasm, which we have identified, we have about 40 accessions which are identified as core germplasm. That we are also conserving the DNA from this, uh, 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 these accessions and the cryogene bank in collaboration with the National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources, uh, New Delhi. Now, coming to the status of our coconut genetic resources, I mentioned that we are conserving the coconut genetic resources in the National Field Gene Bank. Uh, where we have about 132 exotic uh, germplasm, which encompasses uh, uh, all the germplasm from the major coconut uh, growing regions. About 28 countries are represented in this 132 exotic accessions. And uh, we also, India also hosts the International Coconut Gene Bank for South Asia and Middle East. This, of course, is uh, hosted in our uh, uh, regional research center at uh, Kidu in Karnataka. Uh, where we are hosting uh, some 91 accessions, which includes designated germplasm from the host country, and also uh, germplasm from the member countries, that is uh, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, and also germplasm which has been collected through prospection from the Indian Ocean Islands. And uh, all this germplasm which was collected uh, for establishing the International Coconut Gene Bank from other countries were collected as somatic embryos, which were uh, got in sterile media, then under uh, uh, under laboratory conditions. Under tissue culture, they were, of course, uh, uh, developed into plants and then planted. And uh, the genetic resources are being characterized with using uh, descriptors. Descriptor traits, about 70 different traits, which encompasses vegetative, reproductive, and also fruit and uh, uh, tender fruit characters. We also have uh, taken up some characterization of biochemical parameters and also the uh, molecular profiles, mainly based on SSR data. And uh, using these uh, thing, we have identified trait specific uh, accessions and uh, about 10 different uh, germplasm lines have been registered with NBPGR for specific traits. And as of course, uh, Dr. Anushma had mentioned, we have also registered about uh, six different uh, coconut varieties with PPVFRA. Uh, coming to the diversity of coconut genetic resources, basically we have two categories of uh, uh, populations which are easily identified. They are uh, referred to as tall coconuts and dwarf coconuts. And uh, talls and dwarfs are visible, are visibly, you can identify based on the relative uh, differences in the height. So the growth habit, one is lower, the height increment is lesser in the case of dwarfs, whereas it is uh, more in the case of dwarfs. In addition, there are certain associated uh, traits which go with this. Uh, the dwarfs in general are self-pollinated, whereas the dwarfs are mostly cross-pollinated. Again, uh, you will find that uh, the uniformity is more homogeneity within the dwarfs. So you'll have, a, uh, for example, a green dwarf will have all palms showing green color. Whereas in the case of dwarfs, you'll have mixtures of greens, browns, and uh, uh, in some cases, of course, the yellows also. 
and generally the fruit size of gourds are small to medium uh, are generally small to medium whereas in the case of patols you have extremes from very small to even uh, very large fruits and uh, the pest and disease incidence in general is more in the case of gourds as compared to patols so the biotic abiotic tolerance is higher in the case of uh, uh, the tall germplasm and uh, naturally the root distribution is very sparse in the case of gourds whereas here it is uh, more dense and uh, the productive lifespan also is more in the case of talls as compared to gourds so generally what has been under commercial cultivation earlier has been tall populations and the derivatives are hybrids from them but as it was generally they used for ornamental purpose or for homestead thing but in recent years there's been a change in focus uh, with the growing uh, realization or uh, demand for tender coconut water as a health drink so as a result we have a demand for dwarf varieties which give uh, early bearing and of course uh, good tender nut uh, uh, water coming to the other variability you can see that there is variability in different features of the farm be it the stem the inflorescence the fruits the in, uh, flowers or even the way the canopy is uh, seen even the uh, the germination of the seed nut also you have differences with the southeast asian populations in general being early germinating as compared to uh, south asian or the indian ocean populations which are considered to be more primitive and hence <coughs> late to germinate and uh, coming to the gross morphology you will see here the inflorescence which is generally branched in normal coconut but you will see there are certain uh, variants like the spikeless type or spiketa where you have unbranched inflorescence with a central spike having a, a lot of female flowers so there's a tendency of femaleness in the case of uh, spiketa so that's why it is a mutant population which is derived from the primitive type and you the another variability which is very visually very discernible is the differences in the size from very small we have the mini micro to of course the uh, micros uh, then the uh, normal population which is medium sized and very large fruits as you see as we see in the case of san ramon or uh, the andaman jane so if we have a lot of diversity in the case of uh, uh, fruit size then shape then color you will see there are shades of yellow orange uh green or uh, brown and uh, you see there is a range even in the internal uh, uh, central nut you find there are differences in the shape the size and we have this variant one where we have the micro type which is just about uh, 10 cm uh, this is referred to as the mini micro which was collected from the lakshadweep islands and we have the san ramon with very large uh, fruits you have more than 350 grams of uh, dried under sperm <clears throat> and again if you see there are differences in the thickness or thinness of the shell the endosperm and also the texture of the endosperm you have something called the soft endosperm or uh, buttery endosperm types also referred to as macapino which is more uh, commercially utilized in the case of philippines so of course it is found in uh, different countries uh, including india where of course it is uh, referred to as the tairtenga <clears throat> then you have the normal endosperm which is, will be firm in addition we have something called the sweet endosperm where the fiber content in the case of in the endosperm is less so it is very palatable it's referred to as mahachanaral from uh, ratnagiri or maharashtra state uh, which of course is not amenable for production of uh, uh, copra uh, in addition of course we find uh, the ball copra commands a premium uh, price in different markets but uh, not all varieties are suitable for production of uh, ball copra uh, we know that uh, varieties like the lakdev uh, micro or in fact the tiptoe tall that is also very uh, good for production of uh, uh, ball copra but the varieties like the cochin china or the southeast asian uh, coconuts in general uh, give very poor quality of ball copra they cannot be stored because they is the germinate so in addition you will just see that even at the molecular level there is a distinct variability in the coconut populations you find that the southeast asian and the pacific types are more related uh, and they're uh, diverse from the indian ocean or the uh, african coconuts uh, or the south asian coconuts which are supposed to be more primitive and uh, molecular data has also identified that the center of domestication has independently occurred 
in Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands. So in spite of the fact that uh, coconut is only monospecific, there is no other related uh, uh, species, we still find that in spite of the, uh, what is it, it, different populations cross easily, there are no crossing barriers in coconut which have been reported so far. Still we find that there is a distinct, identify, a distinct identity in terms of uh, molecular diversity. Though of course we have uh, evolved populations where we can see that there has been a admixture or there has been a com combination of different uh, genotypes. So that's the basis for where uh, variability has occurred, uh, even in the cultivated uh, types. And uh, coming to Arikanat, which is another important crop, the uh, center of diversity in the case of Arikanat is mainly uh, Southeast Asia, and to some extent, of course, in uh, South Asia, but predominantly the diversity has been observed in Southeast Asia. We also have uh, Arikanat, uh, Arika species in uh, uh, Australia and New Zealand, of course, one or two species. Uh, unlike coconut, in the case of Arikanat, you have related species and also genera, uh, of which only Arika Ketechu is the one which is under commercial cultivation. Though, of course, Arika triandra has, is cultivated, referred to as wild Arikanat, and in uh, uh, natural uh, cultivation by uh, uh, utilization by uh, farmers, especially near the forest uh, regions of Western Ghats. Uh, in addition, the other Arika species, uh, there is an attempt to use it in the uh, breeding program, especially Arika triangra, which has been found to easily cross with Arika ketachu. We are crossing it, to, uh, especially with the uh, idea of uh, transferring uh, resistance to diseases like the phytophthora resistance. But that Arika triandra is being crossed with Arika ketachu because Arika triandra, if we find that there is lesser incidence, or uh, in fact, a very uh, no incidence we can say of fruit rot. So that is how these different species are being used in the breeding program. Uh, so this is a normal Arika ketachu, uh, called a supari or bitter nut. And these are the other species, Arika triandra, where the nuts are very small in size. And the main thing it is, uh, it produces uh, uh, the succulent type. You will find from one clump some three or four. And we have this at a Norman bee, which is of course a related uh, genera. And uh, this is also another related uh, actinoritis, which is under uh, mainly used for ornamental purpose. And Arica microcalyx, which is another uh, palm, which is uh, not in uh, commercial uh, cultivation. So we have these uh, genera which are conserved in our uh, gene bank, which is mainly at the regional uh, station uh, Whittle. And uh, we have about 23 exotic collections from Southeast Asia. Uh, whereas the rest of them are indigenous accessions from different uh, states, almost all Arikana growing states, we have the populations conserved in our uh, uh, gene bank. And the variability which we have uh, recorded includes in terms of habit, uh, uh, tall and uh, dwarf. Of course, the dwarf in the case of Arikana, unlike coconut, is very rare. Uh, we had the Hiraheli dwarf, which was the first reported dwarf, which has been used uh, in the breeding program for development of uh, dwarf hybrids. And uh, more recently, a dwarf uh, population or uh, germplasm has been uh, identified in Andamans. Uh, so this is the Andaman uh, dwarf with very, very compact, uh, uh, what is it, very uh, closely spaced leaf scars. And uh, generally the yield of uh, dwarfs, the fruit yield of dwarfs is very less as compared to the talls. Whereas this, uh, whereas Andaman uh, dwarf has a relatively more yield as compared to the Hirahili dwarf, and uh, the fruits in general are more roundish and uh, very compact. And uh, we also find very, we find variability, as I said, in the case of the height. We also find variability in, in case how the inflorescence appears. Some are very drooping, some are more uh, uh, erect, and uh, of course there's differences in the size of the inflorescence and uh, the number of nuts. There's also differences in the color in shades of orange, yellows, and uh, in the shape from round to oval and uh, size differences also. We have a very small uh, uh, germplasm which we have collected where the uh, weight of the fresh fruit is less than uh, five grams. On the other hand, we have very bold ones where the uh, fresh fruit is more than uh, 50. And uh, this is a very oblong type. In addition, we have intermediates ranging from oval to fully round, 
and you will see that there is a differences in the color also from different shades of uh, yellow and orange. And uh, we also see that there is differences uh, in terms of uh, very rare types where variegation is seen. You can see that green and yellow variegation. This was identified in a farmer's field in uh, South Kendra district. And uh, we found that this variegation also continued into the leaves where you could find uh, uh, yellow green stripes on the leaves. And uh, we have studied the biochemical features and uh, including how it is for uh, developing uh, tender, uh, for processing the tender nut. And we find there is a difference in the color as well as the biochemical parameters of variegated uh, aringa nut as compared to the normal aringa nut. We also have found variability where there is a, uh, there is a sort of uh, a bulbils emerging from the inflorescence, but uh, we are trying to trans, uh, establish those bulbil plants in our uh, uh, in the institute uh, farm. Uh, we have not been able to establish it so far, and uh, we also have rare incidences where the in, in the inflorescence get uh, converted into uh, what is it seedling uh, tissue. And that is like from a single, uh, uh, in place of a single inflorescence, you have a single seedling which is emerging. Similar uh, type we have seen in the case of coconut also, where uh, the inflorescences are getting converted into seedling tissues. And uh, in, as in the case of coconut, where we find that there's a difference in the oil content or copra quality. Similarly, in the case of aricanut, we find that uh, there is a differences in the chali uh, quality and also in the tender nut uh, uh, processing uh, features of arica nut. And uh, we also see that there is differences in the auriculin content of different uh, germplasm. And the auriculin content, of course, varies in the leaf, root, uh, inflorescence, as well as root tissue, with majority of the auriculin being seen in the case of root. And interestingly, the dwarf arica nut has uh, drastically much more auricular content than any of the other accessions which we have uh, studied, uh, which of course we'll be trying to study further to see its correlation in terms of abiotic or biotic uh, stress uh, tolerance. Coming to Coco, uh, we have about 515 accessions, as I mentioned, with the vast majority being of exotic origin, about 444 accessions of exotic origin. And uh, all these are conserved in the field gene bank with alternate gene bank, as I mentioned, in Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, and also in the north, northeastern state, that is Kai Kuchi, and in the northern state of uh, uh, West Bengal. And in the case of Coco, basically, the uh, diversity is referred to as different genetic groups, the most common being Triolo, Trinitario, and Forestero. Of course, Triolo and Forestero are the two extremes, where the Trinitarios are supposed to be the hybrids between the Triolos and Forestero's. Uh, Creolos are supposed to be the primitive uh, cocoa uh, with very rugged uh, uh, pods, uh, attractive red color, and uh, very good flavor components. However, these are supposed to be um, a very uh, poor yielding and also sensitive to biotic and abiotic uh, stress factors. And so they are found in cultivation in very low numbers. On the other end, foresteros are the more robust type. Uh, generally uh, green, which turns to yellow, and uh, with a very smooth uh, uh, pods and uh, high yielding, though of course the flavor is not good, they're more bitter. However, the tenatorials are hybrids between these two. So they are intermediate and it's under cultivation and different. In addition, of course, you have certain genetic groups but in low numbers referred to as the upper and lower Amazons up and foresteros, and also the Amelinados, which are of course uh, more roundish and uh, melon shaped. Uh, with a smooth skin. And in addition, the diversity in cocoa is also referred to by the countries of origin. So we have uh, uh, accessions of uh, referred to as Brazil collections, Costa Rican collections, or Ghana collections, Trinidad collections, Nigerian collections, Malaysian uh, collections, and so on. So most of this germplasm, we have it in our uh, uh, collection and the National uh, Gene Bank, uh, which is being characterized for about 80 different uh, parameters, including uh, the inflorescence, uh, the fruit, the leaves, fruits, uh, uh, and other uh, parameters. So you can just have a look at the variability. You have differences in the flush color, uh, different shades of uh, green to reds, 
you have differences in the pedicel color from uh, greenish to reddish uh, tinge. Then you have differences in terms of the length of the pedicel. You have differences in terms of the shape of the pods, both in the basal constriction as well as the apex. And uh, you also have differences in the color of the pods. And there are differences in the ridges, how they are, whether it is single, wedged, or paired. You have uh, considerable differences in the ridge thickness, which of course uh, we have seen it's also uh, influencing its resistance to T mosquito bug. We find that wherever the husk thickness is more, the damage because of uh, T mosquito bug is naturally uh, lesser. And uh, there is differences in the bean shapes as well as the bean color and size. Uh, bean uh, size, of course, is a, as all of you know, is an important rate in the case of uh, uh, cocoa, where an index of one or more, bean index of one or more is uh, desirable from the industrial point of view. And uh, the, well, predominantly, most of the uh, beans in the case of uh, cocoa are uh, black or brownish. We find in rare cases, it is uh, uh, whitish, which on processing turns into cinnamon color. So, and these white ones are supposed to be more of the, having a very delicate flavor. Though, of course, they are found in very few collections. Of course, we have uh, imported some collections with white bean characters for enriching the germplasm phase uh, in, in, in the institute. And uh, all of these are conserved and the characterization data is being recorded. Uh, we have come out with the descriptors of the germplasm. Of course, in the case of coconut, India was the first country to come out with coconut descriptors. We're in about 74 different accessions, which are conserved in the few gene bank were described. And uh, a different, uh, with the photographic uh, plate of uh, the palm, the fruits, and uh, individual uh, nuts, interesting the endosperm being uh, indicated. And subsequently, of course, the, uh, the an international descriptor, world, uh, descript, world uh, descriptor of the world conserved geoplasm was also brought out. Uh, here, I would like to mention that uh, uh, India is one of the countries which has been uh, conserving and characterizing uh, coconut genetic diversity uh, since uh, the 1920s. And uh, being a very important country, we were associated with the establishment of the COGIN, that is the Coconut Genetic Resources Network, which was uh, established by IPGRI uh, way back in 1994. And India was one of the founding members of this uh, network. Uh, of course, uh, IP, afterwards, IPGRI was uh, went into Bioversity and uh, COGIN also was part of Bioversity. But now uh, Bioversity has delinked itself from the Coconut Genetic Resources Network. And right now, the international coconut community is hosting the COGINT. And COGINT has taken up an initiative of establishing international coconut gene banks. And so we have five international coconut gene banks in different regions of the world. Uh, we have one in, uh, uh, in uh, Indonesia catering for, uh, uh, not in Indonesia, in Philippines catering for South Asia. In India, catering from South Asia and the Middle East. We have one in the African region uh, at uh, Cote d'Ivoire. We have one in the Latin, uh, in Brazil for the Latin American or uh, Americas. And we have one in the Pacific uh, region that is uh, located in Fiji. So all these are under the umbrella of cogent. And uh, the basic idea is to ensure that it's conservation of important germplasm and that is uh, germplasm exchange across uh, regions. Uh, though of course, uh, exchange has been limited because of uh, different uh, uh, what is it, interpretations regarding uh, resource uh, and uh, sh uh, sharing and uh, sharing of the returns among different uh, communities. So this cogent has also developed the coconut genetic resources database in association with uh, Sirad France, wherein data from uh, 24 uh, gene banks located in different countries has been entered into the gene bank. Of course, right now it is being upgraded and uh, uh, you don't find it, it is uh, available in the public uh, domain. But it has information on different uh, descriptor traits for uh, more than 1,800 accessions, which are conserved in 24 gene banks. 
coming to Arikanat, of course, Arikanat descriptors have been developed at the Institute for the Conserved Germplasm, but uh, unlike coconut and cocoa, we don't have any uh, in international authority which is working on uh, Arikanat. In the case of uh, cocoa, of course, we have the cocoa net, which is hosted by Biovacity. And uh, the cocoa net, uh, which is right, has also developed the International Cocoa Germplasm Database, which presently is being ho hosted by the University of uh, uh, Reading. And uh, information on genetic resources of different uh, regions and countries is, can be searched by querying this particular database, which is available in the public domain. And uh, both the co uh, cogent as well as the coconut, cocao net, they have come out with a, uh, uh, what is it, uh, an inventory of gem germplasm resources. And they've also developed uh, a, a, a plan for uh, conservation of uh, coconut genetic uh, resources. There's a roadmap how to conserve the resources, how to utilize them, and uh, uh, take it forward. So uh, this is in brief regarding the um, uh, genetic resources of uh, plantation crops. And all the germplasm which has been conserved are being used for crop improvement program. And uh, we have come out with uh, improved varieties of coconut, arecanut, and cocoa. And in the case of uh, coconut, Arikanat as well as Coco, we share the germplasm through the AACRP programs for multi-location evaluation. And as a result, in the case of Coco, we have, in the case of coconut, we have more than 54 varieties which have been developed, which are selections from germplasm and also uh, hybrids developed uh, by crossing different uh, accessions. So we have uh, dwarf into dwarf, uh, dwarf into tall, tall into dwarf, and also tall into tall uh, hybrids. We have dwarf into di dwarf hybrids, which are under evaluation, uh, which of course will be coming out in uh, uh, a few years after the evaluation is done. So there are about 54 varieties which have been developed for coconut for different regions. In the case of Arikanut, uh, we have uh, about uh, 12 varieties from the from CPCRA. We also have varieties developed. Yes, I'm just ending in another two minutes. Okay. We have Arikanut varieties from the State Agriculture University, mainly from Karnataka, uh, which also includes two uh, hybrid varieties using the Hirehali work. We have two hybrids that have been developed at least for commercial cultivation. In the case of uh, Coco, we have come out with about 10 different varieties and the Kerala Agriculture University, which is uh, very active in the case of the Coco breeding program, has also developed about 10 different varieties. Uh, most of them are clonal selections, and we also have some uh, hybrid progenies which have been developed for cultivation in different uh, regions of the country. So this is in brief. In case you have any further uh, clarifications, of course, you can get back to me for uh, further information. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for the great lecture you gave. Uh, for the clear demonstration on collection, genetic variability, characterization, documentation of coconut, arecanut, and cocoa. Uh, Ma'am, we have a few questions uh, for you. First is from Dr. C. Subesh. Uh, first of all, he is congratulating you for the exotic collections. And he has a query like, is there any possibility of this in landscaping a softscape element? Uh, I think you're referring to coconut. Anyway, in the case of coconut, uh, we have varieties which can go for uh, landscaping in the sense that the yield in terms of number of uh, nuts or copra content is not high, but based on their attractive color and shape. In fact, uh, uh, our uh, sister institute at Cary, that is Port Plate, has come out with three varieties. That is uh, Cary Omkar, then uh, Surya and Chandan which are recommended for ornamental planting. So one is yellow colored, one is uh, orange colored, and another one is also orange colored. And most of the dwarf varieties, in addition for being used as a tendonet varieties, we can also go in for ornamental, uh, uh, for use in landscaping. Ma'am, another from Dr. K. Ravindra Kumar, how to claim that named varieties are uniform and same as uh, the coconut is highly Cross pollinated and seed propagated. Uh, Dr. Ravindran, yes, it's a very, very good question. Uh, 
uh, as you will agree that being cross pollinated and we do not have any clonal uh, what is it clonal propagation methods in the case of coconut uh, true to type planting material in fact is a challenge so uh, what we try to do what we suggest or at least try to see is we can get the nuts from identified farms and again we go in for progeny selection so that there is some amount of uniformity in the seedling population and even when we do go in for hybridization uh, we select the mother palms produce the hybrids again do selection at the seedling level before giving out the uh, planting material for cultivation uh, unless we have some uh, techniques for clonal propagation there, there will be a problem of uh, some amount of segregation uh, so we go in for uh, stringent mother palm selection and also selection at the nursery level so that we reduce the variability and uh, but one thing is there uh, many of the accessions which we have conserved have been uh, obtained as seed nuts from different coconut uh, growing regions but we still find that it retains the basic character of those nuts for example sandramon is a big fruited population from uh, philippines uh, we still find that the sandramon palms which we have those are open open pollinated progenies collected we still find that trait being uh, uh, being maintained Though of course, there'll be some variability between them. Ma'am, another question is how to uh, explain dwarf coconut varieties or hybrids available for cultivation? Uh, in the case of uh, dwarfs, of course, uh, there are uh, right now, uh, we have released about uh, three varieties uh, for commercial cultivation. One is the COD, very popular orange colored one. Then we have Kalpasudia, again, uh, orange fruited one, which has been recommended for cultivation, uh, and Kalpajoti. This is another variety of dwarf, which has been recommended for cultivation. These are notified varieties, Kalpasudia and uh, uh, Kalpajoti. Then we have Kalparaksha, which is another dwarf variety, which is recommended for cultivation in the root disease prone areas. So in addition, I told you that there are ornamental varieties that is uh, as Kari Chandan, Kari Surya, Kari Anup, Anup, Annapurna, and uh, Omkar, which are dwarf varieties recommended for uh, ornamental uh, purposes. And hybrids, of course, we have dwarf into tall as well as tea into, uh, tall into dwarf varieties, which are recommended. Some of them are notified like Kalpa Samruti, Kalpa Shreshta. They are notified hybrid varieties for cultivation. Uh, in different states. So actually some of the hybrids, uh, I, I don't know for which state you are uh, looking for. Uh, one is for uh, Telangana state, ma'am. Uh, for Telangana state, of course, uh, it is more uh, since the dry climate. In fact, right now we don't have any variety which has been screened in the state of uh, Telangana. But considering the uh, performance, since it's a dry thing, maybe you can go for cultivation of Kera Keralam, which is, of course, a tall variety, not a hybrid. So that is one variety which you can try, including Kalpataru, which is also for a selection from a population on the interior uh, region of Karnataka state. So maybe Kera Keralam and Kalpataru could be something which you can try out for uh, adoption. Thank you very much, ma'am. If there are any queries more, you can uh, write to madam also in the mail. Uh, thank you very much, madam. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Raj Shekharan and team for this very timely and good uh, program. Thank you. Uh, now we will break for lunch. Uh, and uh, we'll back at 2.30. 2 uh, and be everyone, please be on time. 2.30 itself. 45 minutes break. Thank you. T? Dr. T. Dr. T. Hazarika, backed postdoctorate from Michigan State University, USA. Dr. Hazarika is involved in the development of horticulture in Northeast India since last 17 years. He documented a number of wild edible fruits of Mizora, Northeast India. Besides germplasm collection, conservation, and documentation, Sir is also involved in standardizing INM packages for banana, mandarin orange, azam lemon, and strawberry, standardized bioregulators for papaya and strawberry, developed suitable planting density for strawberry in Mizora. Dr. Hazariga was awarded DBT Overseas Associateship Government of India. He guided 37 PG and 9 PhD scholars 
and organized 10 numbers of international seminars or conferences and invited sp speaker for many uh, many number of national uh, training programs on his account the uh, 63 research publication one book 20 chapters two seminar proceedings and three technical bulletins and he's also a life member of four professional societies uh, let's hear from the host mouth on horticultural genetic diversity in in northeastern india sir please <coughs> Is my slide visible? Uh, yes, 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 visible. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I'd like to offer my sincere thanks to the organizer for giving me the, that uh, platform here to speak something about the, that uh, horticultural genetic diversity of uh, Northeastern regions. And actually, I'm going to deliver my lectures on conservation of horticultural genetic diversity in Northeastern regions, research strategies, and the future challenges. You all know that Northeast region comprises of eight states of uh, India, which is very rich in biodiversity, rich in cultural, and it is a region which is full of ethnicity. The cultural diversity of this region is seen from these pictures. All the eight states have different cultures, but this region is one of the very rich region of India, which is very rich in cultural as well as in all other aspects. Yes. So this region is also that one of the that it falls in the that uh, one of the 36 mega biodiversity hotspots, and it is characterized by the that fragility and the marginality. And there is uh, that uh, diverse biodiversity. There is variation in the, that ethnicity, and there is different social setup as well as the, that uh, cultural. That uh, different in the, that uh, different cultural setup is there in each and every states. In addition to the, that other plants in this state, this, this region of India India is rich in that diversity of tropical and subtropical fruits. Out of the, that uh, total food diversity in India, it is believed that, that one third of the that, uh, total uh, food diversity is there in this northeastern state. In the, the horticultural crops, actually, there is quite variation in the horticultural crops of these regions. Yes, there is variation in the plant types, morphological variations. There is variation in the that shape, size of the fruits. There is variation in the physiological characteristics. There is variation in the adaptability. Yes, this region is uh, diverse, as I told you in the beginning. It is having that tropical, subtropical, and temperate climates in different states. And in addition to that, at uh, major horticultural crops, this region, there are lots of underutilized horticultural resources in this region. So I'm going to show some of them in my that, uh, next slides. And most of the horticultural crops, although it is not yet properly documented till now, but still, all of them are very rich source of vitamins, minerals, with respect to that. In addition to that, that uh, carbohydrate, proteins, and fats. If we see that, that uh, habitat diversity of these uh, horticultural crops in these regions, basically they are there in the that, uh, primary forest. This region is that, that uh, is one of the region which is having maximum forest coverage in, in, in our country. Most of them are still there in the primary forest. Some of them are there in the secondary forest. And the, the region is actually that full of agroforestry systems. Many fruits and vegetables, many horticultural crops are there in the agri agroforestry systems. Some of them are still there in the abundant land. And the, most of the horticultural crops, you'll find it in the home gardens. Yes. Home garden or bari is one of the important components in northeastern regions. Each and every household have their that uh, bari or that home gardens which is also we can call as nutritional garden in the backyard of their home, where they used to grow a very good number of that wild edible fruit or underutilized fruit crops in those home gardens. Yes, if we see that at citrus diversity, the region is full of different species of the citrus. It is believed that this region is the home of this citrus. In each and every region that there are different types of citrus species are found in these regions and it is believed that 
this region is that a probable home of this citrus species. The Nokrek biosphere reserves in that uh, West Garu Hills of Meghalaya. That is that bias that reserve is that uh, conserve mainly for the conservation of the citrus. That is known as that uh, that citrus zinc sanctuary. Even the citrus indica, one of the primitive citrus species of uh, Northeast uh, India or world, it is still found in the Nokrek biosphere reserves of Meghalaya, well, Gar West Garo Hills of Meghalaya. There are lots of species of uh, citrus are found in these regions. The major citrus species in these regions are mandarin orange is the number one. And among the different types of mandarins, Hase mandarin is considered as the that, uh, most uh, common mandarin species or most uh, commercially grown mandarin species in these regions. In addition to that, other citrus species, pamelo is there, then lemon. Yes, Assam lemon, the name of the variety is named because of the state of Assam. Citron, citrus medica is there. Some species of sweet oranges are also there in these regions. Then sotkara or hotkara, one of the that uh, endemic citrus species, citrus macroptera, which is at present is uh, one of the most demanding citrus species is also found in these regions. Then rough lemon, citrus zambiri is also found. That uh, wide diversity of citrus zambiri is also found in these regions. Yes, if we found, see that the germplasm resources of these northeastern regions, in citrus, there are 17 species, 53 varieties, and seven probable hybrids are, have been reported from these regions. Yes, these are the, some of the reported species of this, that the germplasms in these northeastern regions. Yes, I'm just showing you that uh, as per the that, uh, reports of this uh, Sorma et al. 2004. So these are the uh, common species of citrus found in these northeastern regions. Yes, if we see that at uh, that uh, mandarin, now that uh, from the November to February, if you visit the northeastern India in each and every states, you will find that lots of mandarin people used to that uh, sell in different parts. There are lots of diversity in these mandarins. Yes, next to mandarin, another common species is that uh, pamelo. Which is most commonly grown in the that backyard of the that uh, each and every houses. That uh, citrus maxima or that uh, grandis, one that uh, very biggest citrus species, and which is that uh, red, uh, the two types of uh, mandarin, that pamelo diversity is there in Northeast India. One is that uh, pink flesh or red flesh, another is that, that white flesh. And in pink flesh, that it is a very good source of anthocyanins. In addition to that, all the pam pamelos are very good source of that bioactive compounds. Yes, a number of varieties are there in the that, uh, Northeast India, that pamelo varieties. So these are the named as per the that location where it is available. The state or the that, uh, particular that uh, location where it is available. As per that, actually, these are the that locally that named. Yes, another species, common species in Northeastern region that is called, that, that is the that citrus zambiri or that rough lemon. Yes, even in the, that uh, state where I'm uh, that uh, staying, that uh, in Mizoram, lots of diversity of this uh, jamburi have been reported. A good number of rough lemon varieties are there. Basically, that uh, two types of rough lemons. One is uh, sweet in taste, another is that uh, sour in taste. So sweetish pulp, only one variety is there in Northeast region, that is Mithatulia, and acidic or that uh, sour taste, a good number of varieties are there. Like, so Maidong, Kata Jamir, then Cho Jalia. These are mostly that found in the that, uh, the, that the first three are found in Meghalaya. Then Sinduri Nemutanga, it is found in Assam. And uh, Kasai Lemon, it is very primitive that uh, rough le that uh, lemon species found in the that, uh, Kasai village of that Ukrul district of uh, that uh, Manipur. And the most peculiar characteristics of this species is that the single plant bears more than 5,000 numbers of fruits. Yes, grapefruit, another species is also found in the that, uh, Northeast India, but this is not very common species in Northeastern region. Yeah, one of the very common species that is Assam lemon. If you visit that uh, Northeastern states, then each and every household have in their that, uh, backyard these uh, Assam lemon plants. There are lots of that uh, Assam lemon, the most peculiar characteristics is that you will find that, that uh, flowering and fruiting throughout the year. This species, Throughout the year, it used to produce the flowers as well as the fruits. But during winter season, 
the intensity of the dead fruit is a little bit less, but you will get that even fruit production during the winter season also. A good number of varieties of Assam lemons are also there that uh, Pati Lebu, Godha Pati, Kata Jamuri, Ilasi Lebu, Gal Gal. Then actually that uh, most of them are produced that uh, flowering throughout the year. But there is one species that is uh, that one variety that is uh, so young found in that uh, Meghalaya that produces that uh, fruit flowering only once in a year. And one is that uh, sweet is, uh, that uh, sweet lemon that is uh, called as that uh, Pani Jamil. Yes, in lime also you'll get it that uh, quite the variations. Basically, that uh, two types of limes are there: Obhayapuri lime and Korimgans lime. These are the two names of uh, two places, two districts of Assam where these two types of variations, variabilities uh, in uh, that uh, limes have been reported. Yes, another good species is there that is Citrus macroptera. Actually, Citrus macroptera is one of the very uh, that uh, good source of uh, that uh, that uh, bioactive compounds. And uh, even the state of Mizoram, it is found in that uh, that uh, lots of uh, that uh, macroptera variation have been found in that uh, in the state of Mizoram. And uh, even that uh, from our that uh, published reports, we have proved that uh, recently that uh, proved it that uh, this species is one of the endangered species. But it is very good source of that a very good amount of uh, that uh, bioactive compounds as well as that, that it is a very good source of these antioxidant uh, properties in this species but even you know that uh, although it is a very good source of uh, nutrition as well as that, that uh, bio bioactive compounds but it's still that, that people are not aware about its uh, that importance the people from bangladesh and myanmar they used to come and collect the fruits from this uh, from the state of Mizoram. It is co very common in the state of Mizoram and Manipur. And they used to take it back to their states and they used to that uh, prepare that, that uh, medicines. Even in that uh, in Mizoram, that uh, from this uh, particular fruits, that uh, they used to produce that, that uh, juice. And uh, that juice is uh, very good against that. that uh, it is having that that uh, and that uh, gastrointestinal that it is a uh, it is used as medicines against the that, uh, gastrointestinal problems and even that uh, the that its uh, peel portion is dried by the Miju people as well as the that Manipuri people and they used to put it in the dal or in that uh, other preparations so to make that uh, good uh, flavor it's a very good that uh, good flavor is there in these particular foods Yes, another common species that is Citrus medica, that uh, commonly known as that uh, citron. Yes, in citron also that a good number of uh, species are there that uh, like uh, the varieties like Bira Jora. Jora is the actually its uh, local name. In Assam, it is known as that Jora. We have the species, we have the cultivars like Bira Jora, Bon Jora, then Mitha Jora, Jare Jamil. That first three are found in that Assam, then Jare Jamil, So Made, So Mongong, these are found in that uh, Meghalaya. Even that we have that, that uh, citrus and that uh, lemon hybrids like uh, Gurapati Libu, then Kata Jamil, Pati Libu, Pani Jamil. These are the, some of the that, uh, hybrids between the citron into lemon. Yes, citrus medica, these are the, that, uh, one of the that, uh, monoembryonic species. And we have that, that lots of variations in this particular species. We have that, that uh, the varieties name I have already that mentioned like Birajara, Bonjara. Yes, another species is there, another citrus species that is uh, Ilasi Nimbu. The species, which uh, if you squeeze it, will get the flavor just like that of the cardamom. It's a very good ingredient for this uh, lemon tea. If we add it to the, that lemon tea, then it will give the, that flavor just like that of the lemon, uh, that uh, lemon as well as that will get the, that flavors just like that of the, that uh, cardamom. It's also one of the that, uh, but nowadays. People are not having that at uh, commercial cultivations. One of the that species which is found only in Santi in the that, uh, states of that Assam and other parts of the that, uh, northeastern regions. It's, you see that if we publish this, uh, that if uh, that we see that, that medicinal properties of this uh, citrus species, each and every species is having that medicinal properties. Yes, we have uh, even that uh, published there that uh, the genetic diversity and uh, the distribution and the eco uh, geography and ecobiology. And there actually we published that at ethnomedicinal properties of uh, each and every that uh, citrus species of northeastern regions. 
it has been proved that uh, proved from our that uh, reports that uh, it's an average species is having that, that medicinal properties. Yes, this is Citrus indica, the primitive Citrus species, which I have already mentioned that found only in the that Nocrack biosphere reserves of Meghalaya, West Garo Hills of Meghalaya. It is, uh, but now very recently, it has also reported from this uh, that uh, that uh, Ornashal Pradesh also, locally known as that Memong Narang. Very that uh, sour in taste, and uh, but this is a species is believed that from who is that that all the that uh, present day forms of uh, that uh, citrus species have been evolved. Citrus latipus used mainly for that. Uh, it is also found in the that uh, Khasi hills of uh, these uh, northeastern regions, and it is also used as that uh, rootstocks. Citrus asamensis. Actually, it is uh, known as that Ada Jamir. In Assam, that Assam is actually Ada means uh, that uh, ginger, Jamir means that citrus. Even in that Miju, uh, that uh, Manipur, uh, sorry, that uh, in Meghalaya, that uh, Khasi also, that it is called that So sign. So means that uh, fruit and sign means ginger. So it is that, that uh, ginger fruits, ginger citrus, you can say. Uh, having that, that uh, very good flavor, just like that of the, that uh, ginger. That's why it is known as that ginger citrus. Isangensis, citrus isangensis. One species which is uh, that uh, having the, that uh, cold hardiness, cold hardiness property. If we use it, uh, it is commonly used as a that root stocks, but it is having the, that uh, cold resistant properties. To develop the, that uh, cold resistant hybrids, these species have been widely used. Citrus limetta, another species found in the that, uh, Garu Hills of uh, that uh, Meghalaya. So it is actually that uh, it different from distinct that uh, morphologically that uh, it is distinct from the that uh, sour lime, but it is believed to be that uh, one that uh, uh, hybrid species of that one. Then Megaloxi carpa, it is commonly known as that sour pomelo. It seems like that of the that uh, pomelo, but very uh, taste wise it is very sour. So that's why actually it is not uh, edible uh, that uh, not uh, edible in commonly in common. Then citrus limetoids. Another species of this uh, Garu and that uh, Joentia hills, commonly known as that uh, uh, Sarbodi Nimbu or Mitha Nimbu. Yes, as I have shown you that, uh, told about the Kasai lemons, this is the Kasai lemon plants. You see that number of fruits, so that uh, vigorously it bears. More than 5,000 numbers of fruits are there in this particular one single plant. Which is actually the name is given as per, from the that uh, Kasai village where in the Ukrul district of Manipur. The exceptionally that uh, high yielding varieties without any chemical, any manures, any insecticide, any fungicides. Even the cultivation of these species have been tried in other districts, other villages, but it has not been successful. Ilasinimbu, I have already discuss, discussed here. Yes. In banana. Next to citrus, one of the another species that at banana in Northeast India. So you know that both that at uh, Musha Ecuminata and Musha Balbishana is there. Yes, I am showing you that uh, the pixars, that is uh, the bhim call commonly that uh, grown in Assam, that uh, locally known as uh, bhim call Musha Balbishana group, and uh, one of the seeded bal uh, that, that banana, that uh, seeded but very tasty. The sweet, uh, the TSLs as well as the that, uh, sugar content is very high. And this species is even used to produce one that uh, that uh, baby food that is uh, low. now it is uh, marketed because of its high carbohydrate contents that uh, that is called that uh, bimbita. Bimbita is prepared from this that uh, bim calls. Yes, in addition to that, these are the that, uh, other cultivated and uh, wild types of this uh, banana in this uh, northeastern regions. We have a very good number of cultivated bananas, local bananas, and we have a that, uh, good number of uh, non-cultivated that edible bananas. Yes, these are the that, uh, cultivated that uh, some of the that, uh, bananas in northeastern regions. Yes, we have the that, uh, NSAID glaucum that is commonly called as that saishu, musa rubra, musa ornata, then sangthir, then we have that some other bananas like uh, these are the actually some banana species commonly found in the that uh, Mizoram. The names are actually that uh, Miju names: Lairuk, then Bai Balha, Kol Balha, Bon Pol, then that uh, Bonaria. Bonaria means that wild. So this is the, that that uh, about the that uh, banana. Yes, 
In pineapple, if we see that there are basically two, uh, that, uh, two types, Q and Queen are that uh, commercial ones. In addition to that, we have that uh, other varieties like Mauritius. That is another location species, but not very common varieties. Zaldap and Lakhat. There is also one that uh, two that uh, indigenous cultivars of this Assam. More particularly, you will find this Zaldap and Lakhat uh, cultivars of uh, pineapples in Assam, but not in very extensive scale. We have that, that extensive cultivation of only that uh, that uh, Q and uh, Zion Q and uh, that uh, Queen cultivars. All that uh, in the that states of even nowadays you might be knowing that Tripura uh, that uh, got the, that uh, organic uh, export zone of this uh, for these uh, pineapples. Even they used to uh, that uh, send the, that they have the, that agreement with the that King Fisher Airlines. They used to send the, that uh, pineapple every day to the that uh, Delhi markets, especially that uh, up to the that Delhi hut. And they have the, that that uh, they used to send there that every day produce to the that uh, Delhi from organic pineapples. Yes, that fruits that you will have will have that lots of diversity of this uh, that uh, jack fruits in northeastern regions. Even that uh, our studies have been proven that there are that uh, variation in the that uh, morphology of the fruits, variation in the that uh, plant characteristics, as well as that, that even seed characteristics. So lots of variations are there. In addition to that, that common cultivated jack fruits, we have that, that Artocarpus lacosha or that uh, mango jacks in these regions, which is growing in that uh, wild in mango many wild species are there in these regions like uh, many wild species that uh, like uh, mangifera that uh, silvatica are found in the, that uh, in these regions then mangifera fotida it is found in the that uh, assam and urnashal Pradesh. mangifera cassiana mangifera pentandra these are the, some other that uh, wild species which is found in the that uh, assam yes yeah, some possible that uh, new introductions but the crops actually which are now that uh, commercially viable in this region so i'm just uh, highlighting some of them passion fruits although it is it was grown that uh, in uh, that uh, wild stage before but at present it is grown as that uh, commercially especially the states like uh, three states that uh, mizoram that uh, meghalaya as well as that uh, manipur now lots of uh, commercial uh, com that uh, cultivation of passion fruits is there mostly that uh, purple one and even that uh, the processing industries also that they have come up with the, that uh, to add up this uh, passion fruit uh, cultivations but that is also not yet up to the marks yes so these are some of the that uh, new introductions like uh, cashew nut avocado also that uh, have good potentialities in northeastern regions Yes, grapes in the state of Mizoram. That uh, that is also another that recently introduced food crops, but having that uh, good uh, potentialities in uh, grapes, especially that that uh, Bangalore grapes. Sorry, that uh, Bangalore blue. That cultivar now it is that uh, Mizoram is having that at uh, fifth position in grape cultivations in the world. Sorry, that in the in India India. So. In Mizoram, that some states are that uh, com having fully commercialized with respect to that, that grape, culti grape cultivation. Even they have started to product for production of this that wines from this grape. There is one that uh, particular brand name that uh, Joe wine. That uh, Joe wine is uh, for the, that uh, grapes cultivated from this uh, state of Mizoram. Kiwi fruit is also that another possible new introduction, which is having that uh, wide potentialities and commercially grown in the that, uh, states of uh, Manipur, Nagaland, and Mizoram, even in old national produce. Yes, strawberry, a very good uh, that uh, commercial crop for this uh, northeastern regions. Even these are the that, uh, pictures I have shown. It is uh, our departmental uh, farm pictures, our students' works. We got that very good result with uh, that uh, strawberry. Yes, kiwi also that, uh, as I mentioned, that having that uh, good potentialities. Yes. In addition to that, that uh, other commercial fruit crops in northeastern regions, there is wide potentialities of this underutilized fruits. This region is very much famous for this underutilized fruits. Yes, God has gifted a good number of underutilized fruits in this particular regions. We have that at Evergo Carambola, Artocarpus lacosha, Garcinia, then Dilenia, Tamarindus, Becoria, yes, but this although we have a very good number of underutilized and wild edible fruits in these regions 
but uh, most of them are not yet to be not yet documented that uh, we have that that emblica lots of emblica species are there then cesium cumini phylentas acidas we have that uh, star emla then even in fig also a good diversity of fig are there in northeastern regions a very good number of species are there in figs I can semi is one of the one of the that, uh, common space. Even in cesium also, we'll get it. Lots of species of cesium in northeastern regions. Yes, some other that uh, underutilized fruits, Carissa carandas, then Becuria remiflora, then Delenia pentagina, one of the that uh, fruit having that uh, anti-cancerous properties. Azel marmelas used against that uh, stomach problems. Anona squamosa. Although it is commercial in many parts of the region, India, but in northeastern region, it is not yet uh, that uh, that uh, grown commercially. Then Mimosops ilengi. Yes. So some of the uh, that uh, wild edible fruits I am just showing that uh, Becuria sepida. Then we have the Delenia indica, yeah, which is uh, that uh, elephant apple, commonly known as one of the very big fruit, and which is known as that uh, local local shampoo. If we extract its seeds, with its seeds, we can even, it is used as that uh, shampoo. It's having that uh, saponin. Hylentas is the star amla. Yes, many of our students worked on this. And it is one of the that, uh, fruit having that uh, good uh, potentials and resource of this uh, bio uh, and that, uh, bioactive compounds. Yes, Garcinia pedunculata the biggest uh, garcinia in northeastern regions even if you visit northeast you'll see that in some shops you'll get it dried pieces of uh, this uh, garcinia pedunculata the black colored and it is having that uh, very good uh, medicinal properties if you have any that uh, stomach problem like like uh, diarrhea or dysentery you just uh, uh, soak the that uh, dried uh, pieces in the overnight in water and morning time, if you consume that, that uh, water, you will get it. We, we can that get relief from this kind of diarrhea or dysentery problems. Yes, another important species that is uh, Garcinia lancifolia. We have that at uh, lots of variation of with respect to that at uh, fruit uh, morphology as well as that at uh, plant characteristics in this particular that uh, species. Very common in that uh, Mizoram Garcinia lancifolia. Yes, another species like uh, Garcinia that uh, Xanthocaimas, which is commonly known as that uh, Tapotangaina some. Then yes, these are the that well wild edible fruits. All of them have the, that uh, medicinal properties. Even we have uh, documented some of the that uh, medicinal uh, properties of these wild edible fruits from different states. Like we documented the wild edible uh, medicinal properties of wild edible fruits from that uh, Meghalaya, then uh, Mizoram, then as well as the, that uh, Manipur. As, and uh, Nagaland. So all of them have that at uh, lots of medicinal potentialities. Yes, the region, this is the region actually which is having full of uh, that uh, horticultural resources. But most of them that have not in the, not yet been properly that uh, exploited. Yes, we have that at uh, gaps in the that, uh, plant resources and diversity conservation. With respect to that, that knowledge and information, the traditional knowledge of the that local peoples it have been transported that uh, transferred from that one generation to that other generations but there is no not yet properly that uh, documented of this they are that uh, local that uh, knowledge is till now that no yet pro that uh, no proper documented uh, documentations with respect to this uh, that uh, wild edible fruits as well as that uh, other horticultural resources of northeastern regions yes there is gaps in the pollution planning policy plan and implementation of the that programs there is gaps in the that lab to land uh, that uh, programs and uh, thirdly there is a gaps in the that diversity related research and development the re genetic diversity research is uh, lacking in this particular regions so that's why it is highly that uh, required that uh, need based research needs with respect to that Commercial species as well as the, that uh, non-commercial that uh, underutilized horticultural resources of northeastern regions. So that's sir, why this region uh, still needs. Yes. Uh, sorry for interrupting. Uh, sir, can you conclude within five minutes, sir? 
Yes, yes. I'll conclude. I am coming to the conclusion. Okay. Thank you. Yes, yes. I'll conclude it within five minutes. Okay. So yes, it is the high time to conserve all the horticultural resources. The collection and evaluation of the germplasms is very much required with respect to the depth, all the depth, uh, commercial as well as the underutilized horticultural species, with respect to horticultural traits and processing qualities. It is the high time to do the depth rootstock breeding programs, with respect to the depth salinity, drought resistance, as well as that other depth uh, resistance capacities. We need that, that uh, we have, it is the high time to that, uh, get that, that uh, do that, that research and production of that, that superior quality food with uh, that uh, good size, good TSS, and good color. Even that uh, development, it is the high time to do that, that research on this, uh, the, that uh, resistance capacities to that, that uh, pest and disease controls. So yes, the future R&D that uh, strategies, which is uh, very much that uh, urgent for these regions. So we need that uh, thorough assessment of the, that uh, indigenous genesis, genetic resources. And we have to that uh, use them in the that, uh, strategic breeding programs. All the that uh, underutilized species or the, that uh, the species which have not been properly documented, it is the high time to do the, that uh, nutritional value analysis. With respect to the, that uh, OREC, to just the, that antioxidant capacity. It is a high time to include that do that at, uh, that uh, to do that at research with that at high value the species high with the with respect to the kiwi cashew nut because these are the avocado strawberry these are the new introductions but not yet been done in all the states then strategic production of that at uh, quality seeds also that is also that uh, highly recommended then production and acclimatization of the data plants produced in vitro all the data plants needs that in vitro research strategies then we have to do that at a research on this year round production of this indigenous nutritional that nutritious fruits and vegetables and it is the high time to convert that at homestead gardens to the nutritional gardens because although we have that at uh, homestead gardens or backyard gardens, as I showed in that in my first pictures, but it is the high time to convert them to that at nutritional gardens. Because people are not aware about their nutritional value of these wild edible fruits as well as that at other fruits. So that's why the awareness should be created as soon as possible with that at all people of northeastern regions, so that instead of cutting that at uh, the trees of uh, underutilized fruit crops they will be more concentrated on planting more and more fruits in the, of this particular species which have not yet been properly documented. So at conclusion, I just want to say appropriate national policy action plan and program is very much required for sustainable utilization of this species. Then secondly, the documentation of all the species, their chemical constituents, nutritional values, then habitats as well as that, that uh, raw materials should be undertaken as top priority and the prior pilot program should be taken for plantation domestication and cultivation in order to conserve all that that, uh, that uh, underutilized and uh, non-documented species of these regions the top priority should be given for in situ conservation of all these species these are the some of our published papers with respect to that, that uh, some that uh, underutilized uh, species of this uh, northeastern regions. So with this, I would like to that uh, conclude my speech. So thank you, thank you very sir. much, all of you. Uh, the presentation was a virtual, beautiful journey throughout northeast India of genetic diversity of seed, of citrus, banana, mango, and and underutilized fruits. Its uses and also new introduction fruit crops such as passion fruit, grapes, kiwi fruit, and strawberry. And so it also urged for the need of its conservation and documentation and as well as the characterization. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, with, with this, we'll go ahead and take a few questions. Uh, so one question from Dr. Uh, J. Rajankam. Any heirloom or seedling progenies or varieties available in Manco? Yeah, in mango uh, actually that uh, yeah. In northeast yes, India. Okay, okay. 
In mango, actually, as I have mentioned, that uh, the local species, but uh, not yet uh, properly that uh, that uh, they are actually not exactly varieties. We cannot say that they are some of the that, uh, local species. So available in that uh, wild species, they are very small in size, but uh, taste-wise uh, it is uh, good. But uh, not yet uh, documented this uh, species found in that uh, Tripura and Assam and the uh, Pradesh. Okay. Oh. Sure. Uh, Dr. El Mukunda asked for sweet uh, sweet orange diversity in Northeast India. Yes, madam, actually, yeah, that uh, you have sweet already, orange is not yeah. a, yes, not a common species of Northeast India. There is not mass diversity of uh, sweet orange. Okay. Most of them are that, uh, uh, that uh, planted uh, sweet orange under the initiative of uh, that uh, state governments. Like in Mizoram, that you will get that, that diversity of this uh, Valencia as well as some other species. But most of them are that uh, brought from other places and uh, that uh, uh, budded plants or that uh, seedling progenies have been distributed to the that, uh, farmers and they have planted in their that own gardens. But there is not mass that uh, diversity in this particular sweet orange species. So one more query from Dr. Praveen. Um, after you are identifying some germplasm or some uh, germplasm or accessions of different crops, you are sending it to any NRCs or botanists for identification or how you are identifying the species? No, these are the uh, species what I have shown. These are already that uh, some known species and some species sent to that uh, the, in Silong actually that uh, in Silong that uh, they have that they used to identify that, that uh, species okay you are taking some expert uh identification. Yes, yes, yes yeah okay so another from dr k kaldar uh, he requires some 20 seedlings of elechi nimbu uh, whether it's available with you or not. yeah actually yeah good question but uh, <laughs> we don't have availability you can what you can do that assam agricultural university they have one citrus research station at uh, Tinchukia. I think one of your participants I have seen from that station. So you can contact that station and uh, from there you can get the, that uh, seedlings because in Northeast India, the station purely dedicated, uh, dedicated station for the research and development of this citrus is that at, uh, only citrus station, Assam Agricultural University, Tinchukia. So you can contact them, definitely you will get uh, some seedlings of Ilasinimbu. Uh, thank you very much sir, for this. Um lecture as well as answering the queries thank you very much okay thank you so doctor i'm K very much thankful to all, all the organizers to give me that, that opportunity to give me my speech on the genetic diversity of northeastern regions which especially that at uh, horticultural crops and uh, i'm very much thankful to all the, that uh, that uh, participants uh, for their that uh, patients hearing as well as the, that uh, for their that uh, queries i'm very much uh, satisfied with the, that uh, questions you raised uh, really you have asked a uh, very that uh, good questions thank you to all thank you sir. it's time for a short quiz uh, uh, sir dr sridhar kutam sir okay uh, there is two forms are there. You can first start from the topic from Dr. M.S. Shiva Kumar first and we'll give two minutes time for. So your uh, time starts now. Uh, Sridhar sir, please show the response.
so can you explain also sir this graph shows the summary of the responses as of now i see 20 responses and the average class score is 2.22 and the range is from 0 to 5 so green is the correct answer and okay, how many yeah. people have su submitted the correct Responses for the question is in these detailed graphs. So the class is doing well uh, for the, some of the questions. None of the questions except for the first one. Yeah, Why? except for the first one. <coughs> Originated this. So we will stop graphs. the poll, sir. Yeah, next we will we'll just stop the poll. And this is for the uh, Azarika's question. It's it's going to start only, no, sir? No, I, it's both. Both, okay. So no need to give time uh, for that other uh, next one. I think uh, people are doing this. So then uh, we'll give some time. One, uh, one minute we'll one give minute. then. Yes. So for yes. Azarika, sir, response. Out of 134 participants, only 27 responses, and now 32. Not even one by four. So we'll take this also into consideration. Yes. We'll give you a certificate. So we'll stop now. Okay, sir, please show that profile. Sir. <coughs> Didn't I even... Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Just one. There is only 53 responses. Uh, is there any problem? You let us know what is the problem. Please put it in the chat if you're finding any difficulty in filling the Google form response. Okay, sir. so it uh, will go to next presentation. Thank you, Sridhar, sir. Uh, it's my proud and privileged moment to welcome my ARS batchmate, Dr. Pooja Bora, scientist from ICR Central Island Agriculture Research Institute, Port Player, Andaman and Nicobar Islands. She will be delivering lecture on horticultural genetic diversity in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Dr. Pooja is actively involved in domestication, propagation, and utilization of endemic or native fruit species and crop wild relatives from Andaman and Nicobar Islands. She was recognized to receiving ICRJRF and DST INSPIRE Fellowship for Master's and Doctoral Degree programs and also DBT BioCare Fellowship from DBT New Delhi. And Madam has also backed US Gold Medal and Dr. J.C. Anand Praise from US Bengaluru and also prestigious ICRJRF Nehru Outstanding Doctoral Thesis Award in Horticulture during 2014 to her account 61 research papers and review articles in national and international journals 
Madam is also recognized as a serving editor of two journals and reviewer for a number of international journals, including Elsevier, Spring, Springer Nature, Taylor and Francis, Current Science Association, ICR, etc., and received outstanding reviewer award from the Elsevier journal Science and Horticulture. And Dr. Pooja is adjudged as the best young scientist during 2018-19 of ICRI CIARI port player. So. Uh, Madam, please. Thank you, Dr. Linka, for introduction. Thank you. I'll share the screen now. Is the screen visible? Yes, yes. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, course director, Dr. Ashikaran, sir. Uh, Pooja, can you make it into slideshow? Oh, you yeah, have already done that. Oh. It's a slideshow mode in my screen. Is it not the same there? Yeah, no. here it is not in the slideshow mode, Pooja. You just check it. Uh, I think what you can do is share the screen, not the slide. Then you'll have this. Okay, I'll do it again. Unshare and then share the screen. And then go for the full screen. Presentation mode. Is it fine now? No, you can completely unshare. Present, present. Stop yeah, the I stopped sharing it. Yeah, I stopped that and I shared it again. Okay. Is it fine now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so, respected course director and all the organizing committee members, I will be giving my presentation on uh, horticultural genetic diversity in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. So, uh, when Andaman and Nicobar Island, uh, this Andaman and Nicobar groups of islands, they are located in Bay of Bengal, and uh, they are those tiny dots in a uh, map of our country which generally go overlooked. But despite their uh, small, uh, tiny uh, size, they play a very important role strategically as well as uh, in terms of uh, flora they host. So they are amongst the 22 agrobiodiversity hotspots of our country. And uh, these islands are a group of 572 islands, out of which only 38 are inhabited. And these islands, by, if we go by biodiversity, then these islands could be basically grouped into two different categories. One is Andaman group of islands, which has flora similar to Indoverma region. And another is Nicobar group of islands, which has flora similar to Sunda land. And these groups of islands are separated by a 10 degree channel, which is nothing but a water channel in sea, which is located at 10 degree altitude. So if we look at the diversity, ethnic diversity present in our islands, it is the native inhabitants belong to six major uh, tribes. And uh, however, only 10% of island population is comprised of tribes. Out of this, uh, uh, out of these six tribes, four are housed in Andaman group of islands and another two are Nicobar groups of islands. All the tribes have been, uh, uh, been, have been brought to mainstream uh, mainstream development except sentinel East tribe which is still a hostile tribe and uh, if we look at the floristic diversity of andaman and Nicobar islands there are about 2600 plus species of angiosperms supported from these islands and more than 300 of these are endemic to the islands and another 1300 species are there which are not endemic to our islands but they are not reported in other parts of our country and except Andaman and Nicobar Islands, they are reported only from other countries. And there are 60 plus species which contribute as a food source for tribals. So that's how you can see that food basket of tribals is very, very diverse, diversified as against ours. However, due to a climate change scenario, there have been threats to island biodiversity. You can see uh, there have been news uh, recently, a study by IPCC says that soon in uh, near future, Andaman and Nicobar Islands might not be inhabitable due to increase in sea level. And uh, climate change brings frequent stronger storms and loss of corals and many, many health hazards. And we have also started facing the heat of climate change. Last year, there was complete monsoon failure 
further there is increase ever increasing tourist footfall in fact in past four years 65 percent increase in tourist footfall has been observed here and for infrastructure development to uh, gain connectivity with southeast asian nations modify um, forest laws have been modified and deforestation is taking place at a faster pace than in past if we look at the composition of horticultural genetic diversity of islands it can be categorized into three major categories First is commercially cultivated species, another is underutilized species, and third are crop wild relatives. However, these categories are dynamic in nature and based on scientific development in a species, it could be it could be placed in one of the categories. So, uh, coconut is one of the major crops. In fact, it covers more than 50, about fifty percent of total cultivated area of the islands. And uh, I have just given glimpses of diversity which is available in coconut. So you can see there are horn coconuts, which are shells, which look like having horns. Then there is Makapuno coconut, which is having liquid endosperm, which, uh, which doesn't get solidified even at maturity. Then there are big coconuts and there are coconuts having persistent petioles. And then in 2017, our group uh, identified a new species, a new uh, germplasm in coconut, which has edible husk. So here husk is edible, it's, uh, it's, it doesn't get toughened during maturity and just like a raw papaya, it can be eaten. So next comes underutilized species and crop oil relatives. This is the major, major group which I'll be talking about. And uh, this is what Andaman is known for, diversity of species which are not found elsewhere. So first species, uh, first genus which I'll be uh, talking about is Garcinia. It is one of the important genus of the islands. In fact, uh, it is one of the uh, islands are one of the hottest biodiversity hotspots for uh, Garcinia. And uh, Garcinia genus is uh, known for its medicinal value, particularly in the wake of increasing awareness about anti-obesity compound hydroxycitric acid, which was isolated from Garcinia gamigata initially and later was identified in Garcinia coa and recently by our team in Garcinia dhanigarensis as well. So these species uh, are known for their medicinal values as well as edible values. So this is seashore mangosteen or Nicobari mangosteen. You might all be aware about mangosteen, which is known as the queen of fruits. And in nature, it was uh, developed as a hybrid, as a natural hybrid between two species. And this Garcinia syllabica is one of those parent species. It is consumed by Nicobari stripe and fruits, are, fruits look like uh, mangosteen, but smaller in size and bit sour. Next species is Garcinia dhanigarensis. Due to its similarities, to a resemblance of its fruits to kokum, we have named it as Andaman kokum. It's an endemic species which is distributed way uh, in a very small region in the South Andaman Islands. It has very attractive colored fruits and both peel and pulp are edible. It has been found to be a rich source of anthocyanins and it is suitable for very, very suitable for processing. And it's a fast growing species compared to other Garcinia. Third is Garcinia andamanica, which is also called white madau because of the white color of its sap. It is also endemic and uh, we have reported it from different islands. Uh, in Andaman group. Our fruits are large and uh, fruits look very attractive like uh, tiny oranges and edible part, both rind and pulp are edible. And again, it is suitable for processing into uh, dehydrated powders and its powder uh, has similar flavor as that of dry raw mango powder, that is Amchur. Next species is Garcinia coa, coa mango steel. It is a native species of our islands. It bears orange colored fruits. And it is again sour in taste. It's also found in northeastern regions of our country. And we tried processing it, and it was suitable for processing into dehydrated rind and osmotically dehydrated products. Next is Garcinia kidia. It's a rare species, also called kidia mangosteen. Fruits are orange in color, and they are found to be very rich source of carotenoids. Yesterday, you might be seeing the variety of uh, the uh, varietal diversity in jackfruit, wherein copper or orange colored fruits are available. So carotenoid content of these fruits in layman language is much uh, higher than the, those jackfruit bulbs itself. Here also again, rind and pulp are edible. Taste is sour and aromatic. And uh, again, uh, it is Garcinia dulcis, one of the sweet species and one of the largest fruits of the genus Garcinia. It's edible part is pulp uh, and it is again suitable for processing. Uh, other than Andaman, it is also found distributed in parts of Assam. Then this is Khatafal or Burmese grapes. Due to its resemblance with grape bunch, it's also called grape, uh, Burmese grape. And it is distributed in uh, uh, eastern as well as northeastern parts of our country besides our islands. It's found to be a good source of vitamin C and fiber. And 
it is one of the underutilized species which is commonly traded in islands during summer season and it is uh, consumed both by aboriginal tribes as well as settler communities this is chalta or dalinia indica one of the largest flower bearing fruit species and here calyx is edible and it is one of the examples wherein uh, its association with ethnic uh, festivals has uh, you know helped the cause of its conservation because it is used in uh, during saraswati puja special dish is prepared out of it and that's why uh, trees are not cut uh, uh, trees of this species are generally not cut then this is another species uh, called mangrove date palm phoenix paludosa it has been categorized a near threatened species by iucn it is naturally distributed in mangroves and it's a mangrove associate species it bears sweetish sour fruits and is consumed by tribals and it grows in soils of very very high salinity so it could be a source of resistance uh, to salinity for other plants then there is pandanus species uh, commonly called kevra there are two species pandanus lerum and pandanus anemanensium these fruits are consumed by tribes in fact it is called famine food because during the times when supplies are not uh, regular so nikobari tribes especially they dry the uh, they boil the pulp and dry it and process it into the form of flour and just like wheat flour they prepare chapatis or other baked goods out of it so it is one of the fruits which grows near sea shore and it is very very useful for tribes then there is nipa fruticans or nipa palm it is again a mangrove associate species you can see the palms growing around the sea shore it serves as breeding site of crocodiles and other aquatic animals it can tolerate submergence and salinity as you can see uh, clearly it has been found to be a source of sugar and biofuel and in other southeast asian countries sugar has been extracted out of this it is again consumed by nicobaris tribe and a champagne tribe uses it uh, uses it as hand brush then there is thadi fir thadi means bay so uh, it's a species which grows in areas where no uh, no other species can grow in fact the photograph above photograph is of the region where tsunami what uh, the during tsunami sea water ingress and due to which no other crop could be grown successfully there it's a rich source of anthocyanins and it can grow in soils up to 9 uh, up to salinity uh, up to ph of 9 or 10 and it grows very luxuriantly and bears fruits minimum two times in a year and it is ethno medicinally important and however it has invasive nature and uh, we recommend it to be grown as a potted plant rather than a crop next is flecorcia montana or governor's plum it's a native genus of our islands however it exhibits alternate bearing and that's why it has the issue of uh, promotion in cultivation however excellent flavor is there it uh, has a tss of around 18 to 19 degree bricks fruits are highly perishable but trees look very attractive and they are in bearing it has brittle branches so it cannot be grown in areas where wind velocity is very high and uh, next is sigica malacans it is malayan rose apple it's a malay malay malayan species and also distributed in particularly in nicobar group of islands which have similar climatic condition as that of southeast asian countries like malaysia fruits have bland taste but they are very very attractive and it is suitable for blending into juices bears very prolifically avroha bilimbi some of you might be aware about it it is a common plant in home gardens has coliflorous bearing and it here it is mainly used by people from andhra they uh, process it into different products and it produces fruits more than twice in a, more than once in a year and there is bread fruit it's again a uh, naturalized species but i have uh, given example here because it is consumed by nicobaris as staple food and it is cultivated and shipped to tribal islands from other inhabited islands so people grow it and then export it to or send it to tribal islands so that's how they get uh, marketing uh, markets for it and it is again suitable for processing as we all know and then this is atlanzera fensley it's a rhizomatous species and its fruits are consumed by champagne it has large capsule size uh, capsule uh, in the uh, capsule form fruits and it is used by settlers as well basically used by champagne tribe and its juice from its different plant parts is used as a bee repellent during collection of honey so if you uh, uh, if you extract the juice out of it and sear on your hands and face so honey bees will not be attracted to you next is grevia calophylla or mariam ghatta it is uh, another native species of our island it is used for fresh consumption and used by both tribal as well as settler communities then there is wild cashew or semicarpus karzi it is an endemic species to our island however against uh, uh, as against uh, cultivated cashew here nuts are uh, fruits are not uh, 
edible and only uh, people from Ongi tribe can consume the fruit because it's very resinous fruit and they are uh, they are habituated to it. And uh, in Ayurveda, it is called Bhallataka and it is one of the anti-tumor, anti uh, uh, it has anti-tumor compounds. It is valued for its uh, this property in Ayurveda. It can be a potential rootstock for cashew. Then there is Anuna glabra or pond apple. As the name suggests, pond apple, it grows in damp places. It's also called alligator apple because alligator uh, uh, like to feed on it. It as against other Anuna species, it has a faint orange colored pulp, which is very aromatic. Taste is not sweet. It is a sourish blend, a bland taste, but it can be uh, processed into different products. And its seeds contain fatty acids, which could be utilized for various, various industrial purposes. And in uh, areas where water stagnation is an issue, so it could be used as a rootstock for other custard apple species. Then there are wild mango species like Manzikara nicobarica, which is an endangered species found in Nicobar group of islands. And then there is Manzikara camptosperma. You can see on uh, right side down photograph, there is a fruit of mango, which is completely flattened or irregular in shape. It has very less pulp content, but it could be used as a rootstock for cultivated mango. Then our group of islands are very rich in diversity of wild network species, one of which is Myrist Andamanica, which is endemic to islands, and against Nema Andamanica. Both the species are endemic to our islands and are, have been categorized as vulnerable by IUCN. And uh, we uh, developed some regeneration protocols for these species and uh, planted it back in their in situ uh, places. And then uh, there is Horsfilia glabra, source of energy, and Nema malayana. Uh, Nema Malayana is another species from Nicobar group of islands and you can see most of these species. Maize is completely covering the kernel and maize is very thick in texture and uh, it is not lacinated as against uh, common nut milk. Then there is wild areca nut, areca triandra. So it's not, uh, nuts do not look like our normal areca nut. But these nuts are used by native tribes, particularly Jarva tribe, for masticatory purpose, just as we use areca nut. And stems are also used by who used uh, during their uh, different uh, health conditions. Uh, so this was all about diversity. Uh, in uh, I just gave a glimpse of diversity because its a topic is very vast. So I thought I'll be sharing some of my experiences with you, what we have done, what, what kind of work we are doing at our institute. So here I'm giving examples of six species, how did we approach for conservation and utilization of those species for different purposes. First case study is blood fruit or hematocarpus validus. We identified this species as a candidate species for homestead cultivation. It is native species of our islands and distributed in North and Middle Andaman and Nicobar, and in some parts of Northeast also where it has been categorized as near threatened or critically endangered. Fruits are dark red to purple, and uh, in our studies, we found that it's a good source of anthocyanins. And edible part is pulp, but pulp constitutes around 22% of the total fruit weight. However, it has very good marketing opportunities in islands, and it comes to market and is sold at 250 to 300 rupees per kg during the season. It is preferred by Bengali community. And ethnomedicinally, if we see, its roots and leaves are used for various purposes by the tribal communities. And it is a distinctive anthocyanin profile because uh, generally most of this uh, plant uh, in plant kingdom, most of the species are uh, rich in cyanidin. However, this species has been found to be found to be rich in uh, a pelargonidin compound. And uh, this study was published in JFST last year. And uh, because of this, uh, and you can see it bears coli, it has coliflorous bearing fruits are directly born on the stem. And since it looks like grapes, almost each bunch is around one to one and a half kg in weight. And uh, downside, you can see uh, coconut water, which has been enriched with this fruit as a colorant. So it could be suitably used as a natural colorant by localites. And uh, so the st conservation strategy was this fruit is not cultivated here. People are bringing the fruits from wild and selling it in local market. It is completely destructively harvested. So what we did is, first of all, we went for in-situ conservation as well as ex-situ conservation in the form of field gene banks, and we popularized it through Sarka Sitem conservation. So on the left side is a photograph of our nursery where regenerated plants have been kept. On right side is one of the forest plants inside our campus wherein this plant has been planted. It's a big uh, woody liner, so it needs support of big trees. 
Then for in-situ conservation, we went to uh, Chiriadabu Biological Park here in South Andaman. And with the help of Forest Department, we planted it back in its natural habitat. And for circus system conservation, obviously, uh, we uh, convinced people from different islands to grow the species in their backyards and we promoted it as a backyard crop. And I'm very proud to share that we have reached around 250 farmers through this. And now the species is around 500 plus plants of the species are planted in different parts of our islands. So second case study is Garcinium honeygarensis. We saw that we uh, identified the potential of this species as a commercial crop, not a homestead crop because this species uh, has a very good uh, potential for uh, process, uh, processing and being a tourist destination, process products of this species could have a good market and it could diversify the cuisines of our islands. So we standardized different processing methods for it. We mass multiplied it. However, we haven't been able to uh, uh, multiply it vegetatively because it has very, very limited distribution. In our past five years of exploration, we have been able to find, uh, we have been able to report only nine plants of this species in the whole islands. And out of those nine, three are male plants. So such is the scenario of these plant plants are very tall, 15 to 20 meters tall, and it is not possible to go for vegetative propagation there. So we have planted these species in our uh, gene bank, and now the plants by next year, it will be ready for, uh, suitable for taking uh, short tips for grafting. So these are different products which are developed, sweet and rind as a chewy snack, and then refreshing syrup, which could be diluted in one is to four ratio. It's very, very rich in anthocyanins and phenolic acids. And uh, another case study is Musa sabuana. It is an endemic species. I hope uh, Dr. Sabu might have described this species in his presentation. So it's an endemic species reported from our uh, islands. It's a wild relative of banana, and you can see it has specific feature of green bracts instead of red bracts in case of other banana species or banana varieties. It is endemic to our islands. It has fertile seeds. Generally, wild banana species are not having uh, are not reported to have much of viability or germination, but this species has around 200 to 230, uh, 250 seeds per fruit, and it has orange colored pulp, which is rich in carotenoids. It's a threatened species. And uh, it is seed fertile. And uh, for its conservation, since it does not have any uh, direct economic value, it has value for breeders as well as uh, being a threatened species, it is ecologically important. So uh, in-situ conservation was one of the method which was uh, developed, uh, which was uh, the approach which was adopted for it. Uh, other than that, field gene bank was established and micropropagation was also taken up to conserve the species. And you can see seed, uh, through seed germination, we uh, standardized different pretreatments and uh, substrates. And we, with the simple interventions, we were able to you know, improve its germination from near 39% to 90.47%, which is, I think, a very uh, big feat. This is the view of field gene bank of endemic musa species, which, have been which has been established in an Arikanet garden. And this is the view of micropropagation studies. Now this study is under, uh, it has, uh, this paper is under review. So it was a first attempt on in vitro multiplication in this species. Uh, we raised the cultures and we have received IC number for the same. We shared the material with IHR uh, very recently. Next is case study four, popularization of mango ginger. Uh, generally, Kurkuma amada is called mango ginger. Here in our islands, we have another species called Kurkuma, Kurkuma manga which is also uh, having raw mango-like aroma. So we wanted to develop it as a commercial spice because in uh, island hoteliers, they need uh, some diversity for their cuisines and it uh, gives very uh, attractive and very uh, unique kind of flavor to the curries. So uh, for uh, beginners, I would say it, is, it looks like ginger, smells like raw mango and plant looks like turmeric. It, uh, it's, it belongs to the same family as that of ginger. And uh, traditionally it is used uh, Amada species particularly is used for pickle and other purposes. When we determined volatile composition of its rhizome, we found that cyclofenshin and beta myrcene were the compound which were in a major proportion here and myrcene was the compound which was responsible for its raw mango-like aroma. So uh, we developed simple value addition techniques like mango ginger paste and mango ginger dehydrated sheds which uh, are being used to popularize the species among the people and now some small uh, groups have started taking up its processing in the islands. So that is one way you can uh, commercialize a species and it becomes a commercial species from its underutilized status. Uh, this is the case study of woody pepper. It's uh, generally when uh, we 
you know hear about pepper it's all about berries and leaves but in this case in this uh, species wood is edible and it's, uh, that's why it's called woody pepper it's a novel it is being promoted as a novel spice here wood segments are used in curries just like drumstick is used in sambar so it uh, destructive harvesting takes place here and first harvesting takes uh, takes around 3 years from uh, planting however since it's a wood so it has shelf life of just 4 to 5 days and again it is uh, very sensitive to water logging so it can be uh, planted only in upland hilly areas and uh, this is how it looks like so these are the pieces of stem sold in local markets of our islands and on left side we have photograph which is wherein uh, it is being grown on it has been trained on a mango plant a big mango plant and uh, right side we prepared a powder out, out of it and that's how we improved its shelf life and that's how we can promote an underutilized species underutilized species are generally known to be very regionally adapted and having very low shelf life but if we can develop some technologies like that then definitely market could be improved and cultivation can be promoted and since we don't have much cultivable area in the islands so we promoted it as an intercrop in arikanad gardens generally it was uh, uh, generally standards like jackfruit and mango were being used for its cultivation however uh, since coconut and arikanad are the major plantation crops here we tried growing it on coconut uh, we tried growing it on arikanad and with some simple interventions we were able to do that further it has problem of propagation and we uh, Uh, tackled that problem by introducing one uh, new method of modified serpentine uh, uh, layering, which is called radial serpentine method, through which we have we've been able to produce a good number of plants within very short period of time. And that's how we have tackled the issues. We are still in the process of making it uh, commercial and a uh, uh, you know an exclusive project on it, uh, funded by DBT is going on here. So in future, we'll be coming up with a commercial spice which can be grown in other coastal belts also. and last case study is that of burmese coriander it is uh, called cilantro or mexican coriander or spiny coriander and scientifically it is called eryngium fetidum belonging to family apac it is a high value crop here it uh, you know uh, generally in market its value is around 400 to 500 rupees a kg and during covid times in fact its value improved to 1000 rupees a kg and uh, only few people were growing it in their arikanat or coconut gardens or beds but the issue is uh, it is sensitive to <clears throat> once rainy season starts here so due to high water logging condition it cannot be grown in low land areas and that's how we uh, intervened and we thought it would be uh, after some time people will lose interest if it uh, remains only with uh, farmers and uh, we introduced some systems we developed one uh, technique called carry pro dhania in which uh, in pro trays you can grow the crop and within two and half months you can harvest it and uh, it has grown in protected conditions so spininess is also reduced and uh, juvenile time could be increased so this method has been uh, uh, released uh, this technique has been technology has been released by our institute then another method we developed our um dhania this pro dhania and uh, from each pro tray we could get around 500 to 600 gram of produce at the end of two, uh, one cycle two and a half months and to promote it among urban people we recently developed a technology which has been commercialized just two months back and this is a snapshot of uh, the news coverage in icr website so uh, this is dweep hangings where in hanging curtains of burma dhania some structure was made for hanging cultivation of this and just like curtains you can uh, uh, you can you know uh, keep it in your balconies or open spaces or portico and you can grow uh, you can get your green supply regularly it is a a very good technology for urbanites and uh, all these uh, that's uh, that was all uh, about uh, the approaches which we are uh, which we are you know um, following for different crops and uh, different methods how we are conserving those and uh, this is the horticultural plant propagation unit a nursery which is uh, housed in around 1000 square meter of poly house and uh, here we are having uh, so 30 plus underutilized species we are sorry we are multiplying here because supply of planting material is one of the major issues in popularization of underutilized species uh, if you happen to visit our islands and visit our nursery uh, this is the motto and this is the you know uh, board which will be welcoming you that we are proud to be a part of islands green brigade we want to be uh, this island should be known for its uh, varietal wealth its species wealth and uh, we should be able to give some 
good uh, new crops and new species out of our islands to mainland India and other countries as well. That's how we popularize our underutilized species people from different schools, community, community uh, gardens, churches, uh, religious places and farmers and uh, people from tribal departments. They visit us and take plants for uh, afforestation from our nursery. And uh, within two years of its existence, it has done, I think, justice with its existence. Uh, so finally, uh, I would like to end my presentation with the, a small calendar. I'm sharing the link. So if anybody is interested, we can, uh, uh, you, can you know, you can download this calendar. It's free of cost. It's, it was an e-calendar, uh, which was prepared during this January 2021 on underutilized fruits of Andaman and Nicobar Islands. So 12 selected species of high value have been uh, depicted here with their uh, short introduction. So. That's all about my presentation. If you have any uh, questions about this thing, you may please ask me. And thank you organizers for giving me, a, giving me an opportunity to be a part of your program. Thank you. Thank you, Pooja. Uh, kindly share that link in the chat box. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, the presentation was a virtual trip all over Antamana and Nicobar Islands in genetic diversity of Garcinia, Bakuria, Delania, Phoenix, and so on. And we can very well appreciate the diversity of fruit crops in the island, most of which cannot come up in mainland. And congratulations for the conservation and utilization efforts you are taking up and also the value addition for the live, livelihood of many even in the mainland also. So we have a few questions, Dr. Pooja. One is from okay. Dr. Rajangam. Uh, is there any known ecotypes with more flesh content in island? Uh, no, uh, yeah, noni variety, noni uh, diversity is available in our islands, but and we have uh, ours is the institute which has released four varieties of noni for salinity tolerance and other traits, but uh, um, those uh, pulp content is more in case of. Uh, some varieties but there is not uh, that big difference in flash content because it's a very seedy species and when we uh, select uh, you know genotype for salinity or other tolerance in that case obviously flesh content where these economic traits uh, get compromised so that is not what we have we were uh, focusing here so salinity tolerance was our objective and we got that but definitely uh, if diversity is uh, studied or some more collections are made, we don't have any uh, uh, project on that now. It was that work was done 10 years back, but then definitely, yeah, it could be uh, obtained because diversity for Noni is available in Andaman Islands. And another question from Dr. K. Kalda, uh, the okay. availability of Burmese coriander seeds at your station. Yeah, yeah, you can just write to our director and we'll be able to share the seeds. However, I would like to uh, send a word of caution. Seed germination is just 25 to 30% here. So another method of propagation in this species is through its uh, runners. So even if you get a few plants, within uh, no time, you will be getting a lot of runners out of it. And that's how you can multiply it. But for uh, availability of seeds, yes, it is available with us. You can write to our director. We'll be able to share the seeds. Uh, Pooja, yes, sir. congratulations, uh, great work, and uh, I really appreciate you, the hard work which you have done. And uh, I was just wondering, is it possible yes, uh, for us in the mainland to take any of the species and uh, get it like how you did there? Is it possible? And another thing I like is, uh, uh, one is you are, uh, uh, <clears throat> first you are, uh, uh, the species you are identifying, which uh, is having potential. Second is uh, you are conserving it. Third is uh, you are linking with the uh, livelihood. So really a wonderful work. And uh, I think uh, uh, it is a model for any other scientist who are uh, you know working in the horticulture. And I was just wondering, is it possible for us to take any of the species and uh, do it? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you so much for your encouraging words. Uh, I just would like to inform that this blood fruit, it was taken up uh, by people from uh, Tamil Nadu last year, from 90 districts, people had come for SCSP program. And uh, to them, we gave this. And after one year, we took feedback and the plant is growing well there. So blood fruit is one species which can be very well taken up there. 
Okay. And among other species of Garcinia, except Garcinia andamanica, which grows near water streams, and it needs specific, it has specific requirement for climate. As other species like Garcinia kidia and Garcinia salabica can be very well grown in mainland. And we are trying our best to popularize this woody pepper, which as an intercrop. So if it uh, succeeds, now till now growth parameters are very good, very encouraging. So within another one year, we will be able to tell you whether this species will be a suitable candidate for growing in other coastal uh, states of our country. But crops like Garcinia, Kidia, and Hematocarpus validus, it can be grown in non-coastal areas as well. Very yeah. uh, easily it can be grown. Okay. And uh, uh, I was uh, earlier I was wondering why you choose, uh, uh, you know, carry to uh, start your career. Now we understood the reason behind it. Uh, yes, know, I, sir. Yeah, yeah. I really appreciate your guts and uh, the hard work you put and uh, wish you all the best in all your endeavors. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Pooja. Thank you, Linda. Uh, uh, Srita, sir, we will take up one quiz. Okay. You can start your filling the Google form. We'll give three minutes. But, uh... Number of responses are very less. We have uh, 134 online. To issue the certificates, we will take uh, your uh, performance in the online quiz. Yeah, we got 50 responses. So either you can show the answers. Pooja's uh, presentation was very receptive. I think uh, good number of responses. Except the last question, I think uh, most of the questions are. I think there is some confusion in the last question answer. Yeah, yeah. Fifth question answer. Uh, sir, uh, sir, that answer you have yeah, given is wrong. It is, it is my wrong ah, yeah, yeah. answer here. Yeah. So, so uh, it, we can stop, sir. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, so we'll move on to next presentation. The next presentation from Dr. Meera Pandey. Dr. Meera Pandey is one of the most eminent mushroom researcher in the country. Madam was assigned to work in Mushroom Lab in 1986 and since then Dr. Meera has been taking forward the work on mushrooms. Since 1993, Dr. Meera has steadily developed further the infrastructure through the help of many externally funded projects funded by NHM, NHB, RKVY, DST and DBT. Madam made the foundation of mechanized spawn production lab, the first of its kind in the country, which could increase the spawn production manifold scattering to the need of not only the mushroom growers of Karnataka, but also of the neighboring states of Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Tamil Nadu and Kerala. Dr. Meera has been the pioneer in documentation and conservation of wild indigenous edible mushrooms and has conserved and domesticated 12 indigenous mushrooms of which four have been commercialized. She has been highlighting the importance of diverse nutrition through the addition of new edible mushrooms like milky, shite, king oyster, lion's man, split gill, macrosa, ban, uh, tuber oyster mushroom. Dr. Meera's endeavor has always been to use mushroom technology as a biological tool to proactively engage with the national socioeconomic development and nutrition related issues of the country. She hopes to carry forward this mission through her active association with many NGOs, SHGs and rural developmental agencies in different parts of the country. Uh, Madam, please take over the presentation. Mira, madam. So we'll go to next. Okay. Uh, there is some uh, network issue. Good afternoon, everyone, and I hope uh, I'm audible and the screen is visible. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, and um, thanks a lot, Dr. Rashikra and, and the entire team for uh, conducting this wonderful training, and I was uh, listening to Dr. Pooja as well, a wonderful lecture. I wish there was uh, some work on mushrooms also from Andamans because it's a heaven for mushrooms as well. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, the uh, kind of work uh, we have been uh, doing in, in case of uh, uh, mushroom conservation. And uh, uh, mushrooms are the macrofungi. Uh, they are uh, the group of larger fungi where the fruit bodies are visible to the naked eyes. That is why they're also termed as macrofungi. And uh, they belong to the kingdom of uh, fungi, which has got about 1.5 billion, uh, about 1.5 billion species. And uh, about 10,000 of these are prime edible mushrooms. And out of 10,000, 2,000 of the species of more than 30 genera, they are uh, prime edible mushrooms. And we have a cultivation technology of just about, about a dozen of them. So rest, 1,990 species are still collected from the forest areas and consumed and also the wild mushroom and trade, in fact, is worth around $5 billion industry. Uh, the ecological niches of mushrooms are uh, varied. They are found in all kinds of ecological niches. We have them in the polar regions. Then we have mushrooms in the deserts. These are all edible mushrooms in the Thar Desert of India. 
Productions and this is Telphysia from the Sahara Desert. Then uh, we have many, uh, many uh, very important and um, uh, highly prized truffles from the desert. They're called as desert truffles, which are in fact auctioned during the seasons. Then we have mushrooms which are also found in the wetlands, uh, which which uh, which uh, which have got various uh, uses. And we have got mushrooms which are also um, in association with lichens. Uh, the conservation, whenever we talk of conservation of uh, mushrooms, in fact, conservation of fungi in general is, uh, is, is in a fungus takes a very back seat as far as conservation is concerned. Uh, fungi are very, very important. Now people are slowly realizing it that, you know, what role fungi play in our lives. They can be very beautifully used for agricultural waste management. They can be used as food source, as source of medicine, for increasing the carbon content of the soil, for bioremediation and microfiltration. These are few processes where the fungi have played a very important role and which are getting commercialized for this role. Now, when it comes to threats to the macrofungi, uh, a lot of factors are there which are, um, you know, causing many of these macrofungi to uh, get extinct and the land use changes. In fact, the destruction of habitats is one of the major reasons, which includes the land use changes and the farmland changes, the kind of, you know, um, the kind of fertilizers. Now, which are, the kind of uh, uh, fertilizers, the high nitrogen, which is being used these are all causing a lot of, uh, you know, and damage to the habitat of these fungi. Then the uh, fungi in the desert regions are also getting threatened because of the uh, climate change and other related facts. And in fact, in all, almost all the um, habitat and ecological niches because of the climate change, a lot of impact is happening on the mushrooms. Uh, when it comes to uh, studying the wild mushrooms and conservation and their utilization, now uh, uh, it, it follows uh, more or less the same basic uh, rules as follow for the higher plants. Uh, the documentation is based on the uh, you know the documentation is based on the passport data, and the passport data of any species is generated you know through these factors uh, you know taking the GPS data you know, uh, noting down its habitat, seeing its mycorrhizal association, that is uh, the kind of trees it is associated, uh, associated with, its morphological characters, which help you in its uh, uh, identification, the spore prints, the spores of the fungi are almost analogous to the seeds of higher plants. So the kind of uh, spore it has and it, its uh, structures and many of the microscopic characters uh, this forms the essential first step when we are trying to conserve any mushroom. Uh, when we talk of uh, morphological characters, the shape of the mushroom itself, you know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, guides and uh, a lot of uh, performer have been developed. The shape of the mushroom, the shape of the cap, it, its margins, what kind of margin it has, what kind of dorsal uh, view of the cap it has, these all aid to the identification what kind of gill region it has. This is a sport bearing fertile, fertile region of the mushrooms. What kind of gills they have. How is the gill attached to the stalk? You know, different kinds of attachments. Then the spores, what kind of spores it has. What is the shape, the size, the color of the spores. These are all which get into the identification. The shape of the uh, whole mushroom itself and the stalk, how the stalk varies in different species. What are the essential characters of annulus, the frill-like structure on the stalks, and the base of the uh, stalk, you know, whether it has got any kind of a, a covering at the stalk, because these are the major characters, you know, which many times, especially this character differentiates between the poisonous and the non-poisonous mushrooms. So these are the various characters based on which uh, the mushrooms are identified. When it comes to conservation, both in situ and ex situ conservation is done. The in situ conservation is in the natural habitats and the establishment of mycological reserves or use, use, use of ecological corridors. And the ex situ conservation, which we also work in the different labs, and IHR has been one of the pioneering institutes working in this direction, is uh, having dedicated uh, mycological mushroom culture banks 
and uh, developing the uh, pure culture of these mushrooms and then conserving those cultures you know for posterity and for further studies and um, in this direction of course ihr has been a uh, pioneer institute but apart from that we have the uh, dmr solon and then we have intech chandigarh and then there is agarkar institute in pune where uh, and the nba are varanasi where these uh, you know these are the conservation uh, dedicated conservation uh, centers for fungi and uh, the uh, maintenance of the cultures is done either through subculturing water conservation grain conservation lyophilization or cryopreservation these are the different kind of techniques which are followed because um, you know fungi they they have to be uh, you know they are they are they are very finicky so you have to be at it as far as its uh, maintenance is concerned it's it's quite challenging to maintain the cultures then uh, there are there have been instances where many of these mushroom species are being lost in fact totally are be getting in, ex, extinct and there are many cultures uh, globally and there are many communities which for whom the mushrooms are very very important features not only as a food but also as a resource of medicine and as a resource of global trade so there are nations who have been publishing what is called as red listing of fungi which started uh, in uh, 1990 uh, which started by germany in 1982 followed by 1992 uh, where 11 countries and now there are 31 countries to it and each country is able to produce its own uh, red list of fungi which are uh, you know which are on the verge of extinction and uh, due care is given for conservation uh, so this this kind of work is also being done globally and the action plan for the conservation of fungal diversity it, it includes understanding and documentation of the fungal diversity you know developing a working list of the species which are available conserving that you know fungal diversity then identifying the species which are which are the areas in which those species are found you know demarcating those areas for endemic conservation and also protecting the over exploitation in india also we have got a particular case of the mushroom called as termitomyces you know this is one species which is um, present in the wild which is uh, known to grow in association with termites and right from kanyakumari to kashmir this we have around 65 species of termitomyces which are found in different kinds of soils and they are edible known by various different names edible in all these states and in fact over exploitation is happening because until now this species has not been able to conserve because making a culture of this species itself is a very very challenging uh, case then the other uh, important uh, uh, factors i mean in, uh, action plans which are being taken is promoting education and awareness about indian fungal diversity now this is totally lacking absolutely lacking in our uh, system of uh, you know conservation education Uh, we talk of conservation of many things but then when it comes to the conservation of fungi or con conservation of microbes in general and mushrooms it is it is absolutely not there so this is an area where i think uh, it's it's very important that we promote the idea of conservation in totality then the importance of fungal diversity because the importance of mushrooms uh, you know how they are uh, important in the health or in our everyday lives so that is very very important so a proper a dialogue a proper fungal conservation dialogue or communication has to happen which is which is not happening and this has to far, you know in fact start from the educational institutions and then um, building capacity for indian fungal conservation because there are not many labs working on on the fungal conservation in fact uh, if i say in southern india ihr was the pioneer institute and not many labs are working on on fungal conservation so this is uh, uh, this is very very important that uh, every university must have uh, a laboratory on on fungal conservation and studies on on fungal conservation and uh, since mycology in general um you know has taken a back seat all the mycology was the you know is is the mother science from which pathology has evolved but today uh, mycology is uh, is is almost at a back seat and we do not have many trained mycologists in the country where where this is this is becoming a very important uh, issue uh, for for fungal conservation and uh, a lot of network of fungal conservation activity needs to be strengthened both at the national regional and the international levels uh, 
When it comes to in the Indian mushroom diversity, as uh, I mentioned that IHR has been one of the pioneer institutes as far as the conservation of mushrooms is concerned. And we were more interested in the tropical and the subtropical species. And we carried out explorations in the Western Hearts of Karnataka. We carried out explorations in Gujarat, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Sikkim, and also in Andaman Islands. And we were doc able to document almost uh, 500 species uh, from these areas, which are economically important species. And they are variously being used in different forms by the local communities. And uh, I will be presenting a few of them, which we have been able to kind of conserve and do some work about it. Now, this is a pink uh, oyster mushroom called as Pyrotus uh, eos and uh, Pyrotus jamur. And uh, this was collected from the Western Ghats of uh, Karnataka from Shimoga. And uh, this is what it was in wild and we brought it and we studied it and we, gave, we, we have not only now conserved it, now it has become a commercial species. And it was uh, released from the Institute as Arka OM1 and now this species has been cultivated commercially. This is a short duration crop. Uh, the whole crop takes about uh, 23 days in total. So uh, this is a very good and a very, very beautiful pink color. So it has got a very good market appeal. Then this is also called as, uh, we have named it also as a cherry oyster because it was found on a Singapore cherry tree, which we had collected locally in Bangalore. And again, a species of Pleurotus. And this is the only Pleurotus species which forms asexual spores. And it forms Corinia, a very distinct character uh, about this uh, species. The fruit bodies are very large, thick, the flesh is very thick, and it is an excellent shelf life. One of the best shelf lives as far as mushrooms is concerned. This has been conserved, it has been domesticated, and the commercial technology is almost standardized for this mushroom to be released. Uh, we have also been able to um, document the pink oyster mushroom from uh, Madhya Pradesh. These are the, the species of Pyrotus jamo from Madhya Pradesh, a white variant of that again from Madhya Pradesh, and also from the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Um, this is Termitomyces species. We have, we have uh, about 68 species of this in the country, but then we have been able to document it uh, you know, from the Western Hearts, you know, they call it as, uh, um, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a local name, I'm, I'm forgetting about the local name, and this mushroom has got a very, um, a very long uh, tapering stem, which has got, in fact, and uh, this is generally found in, in the soils where there are a lot of termites. This is how it is find, uh, found, and when you dip, uh, dig deep into the soil, then you get these uh, uh, long stems which are in association with the termite nest. So this is um, one thing which is found in Shimoga. People eat it a lot. And there's a smaller version of this is called as Termitomyces microcarpus, which I found in BR Hills. Of course, it is found in many places, but a uh, lots of it was uh, found in the BR Hills where people, the tribals of that area are still collecting and eating it. But then, you know, over exploitation is definitely happening. This is what we got in Gujarat, the species of Termitomyces in, in, sorry, in Rajasthan. Uh, this is in Gujarat, the white species. And this is what we found in the Andaman Islands. Again, a very distinct, a very big species, uh, you know, uh, very, with the long tapering uh, kind of root kind of a structure. And uh, people still collect it from the white and the uh, wild and they consume it. Then Termitomyces was also collected from a Madhya Pradesh. And uh, in Madhya Pradesh, in, in the Sinhara area of Madhya Pradesh, this was being sold in the local market. And um, by the time, you know, in, in, in the season, many of the families, they, they totally depend on the collection and sale of this mushroom for their economic activity, at least for three months in a year. And uh, we were also able to collect Termitomyces in Sikkim. Termitomyces medius, where people are still collecting it from the forest areas and eating it. Another very important species is Cutocybe maxima, which is uh, again being uh, consumed by the local communities in Rajasthan, Cutocybe maxima, and then in case of uh, Gujarat, where it is called as Vasroach, because it is found on bamboo. So it is called as Vasroach, and it is still collected from the uh, forest and it is consumed. And also it's traded during the season and the trading is done up to the borders of Russia. 
and it is uh, it is sold somewhere at around 700 to 800 rupees a kg. We have been able to conserve this culture and domesticate it, and we were able to get a few fruiting bodies because uh, you know conservation and domestication is a very very challenging job of any fungus. So we were able to get this. This is the domesticated fruit bodies of what we were able to conserve the species at IHR. This is a Clutocyde maxima in MP again, being sold uh, at the outside, uh, a very important activity for many of the tribals uh, during the season. Then another very important variety is Auricularia. It's also called as juice ear mushroom, or it is also called as wood ear mushroom. Um, a commercial species, in fact, uh, we have been able to uh, devise a commercial cultivation technology, Auricularia delicata and Auricularia auricula from Western Ghats. And uh, this is Auricularia polytrica from Sikkim, and again, Auricularia delicata from Andaman uh, and Nicobar Islands. And in the Northeast, this mushroom is very, very popular, extremely popular. And it is sold in the dried form. And uh, they practically put it in every food. Very important constituent of uh, the soups, what they make, and a very important mushroom for them. And then this is a species of calocybe, uh, popularly called as milky mushroom. The first calocybe, which was collected from the forests of West Bengal and uh, yeah, was again domesticated and commercialized by IIHR, is now totally a commercial variety, grown commercially in the states of Tamil Nadu, um, Karnataka, Kerala, uh, the hot, I mean, the, the tropical regions. And the second Kalasabi, once again, we have been able to, uh, you know, collect from Junagar in Gujarat, and they've been able to conserve it, domesticate it, and we are studying further for its commercialization. So this will be another addition to the tropical mushrooms. Then uh, we also uh, have been able to document uh, a very important mushroom called as Felorina from the Bhuj region of Gujarat, a very tropical region from Gujarat. And uh, we were able to conserve the culture. We are in the process of domesticating it. And this is how it is sold in the local markets, around 300 to 400 rupees a kg, uh, seasonally available, and a very important ec economic activity for the local travelers during the season. Then we have uh, something called as white jelly mushroom, a very important mushroom for medicinal purposes. Chinese have been growing and eating it. We were able to document it uh, from the Western Ghats, the white ones, Tremella fusiformis. And uh, we, were, we, have, we also could uh, document the yellow ones from Tremella mesentrica from Sikkim, also from MP. But then we have not been able to conserve that species. Then uh, we have also been able to uh, document another very important uh, and an edible variety called as uh, Dictyophora from the Western Ghats. In fact, from, from Dakshin Canada, we were able to uh, do this. And this is the Dictyophora induciata and uh, Dictyophora duplicata, the two species which we were able to uh, document. And this is also called as lady whaled mushroom. Again, a very important mushroom. The Chinese have been eating it since long. And, uh, but, but in India, of course, we have not been able to do any work on this. This is another desert fungus called as uh, Podaxis pistillaris, a very important uh, diet for the people in Rajasthan. Uh, it is eaten as long as, uh, you know, when you cut open this mushroom, when it is white inside, it is e eaten. And the moment it turns to this color, that means the spores, have, it first turns this and then it becomes black, which shows that the maturity has happened and it has uh, matured. So uh, it is eaten at, at this stage very soft, they are peeled and they are just uh, cooked and eaten, very important uh, diet. And uh, the, as per the local information, what we collected in the areas of Jodhpur and, and Jaisalmer areas, you know, the, the desert areas, because you can see it grows highly in sandy soil. Um, it, is, it is very nutritious and is given to pregnant women uh, in the form of dried powder. So uh, it, it's, and also it is dried and eaten in form of, you know, dried chips. So this is a very important uh, species for those people. And Philorina in, in, in Quinans, which, is, uh, which we have documented from, uh, um, again, from Rajasthan, a uh, very important edible species for them. Uh, conservation has been done as to the culture has been obtained, uh, but the production technology is yet to be standardized. 
Uh, another species which we have uh, been able to do it from Udaipur region of Rajasthan is, uh, is the species called as uh, cauliflower fungus, spirasis, but we have not been able to culture it. In fact, this is the only one place from where we have been able to document this. Helicium, a very important medicinal, both culinary medicinal mushroom, it can be eaten and also it has got a wonderful medicinal variety uh, uh, property as well. Uh, this mushroom has got a property of uh, uh, stimulating the uh, neuron regenerating uh, substance and it is able to cross the brain barrier uh, and enter into the brain and uh, is able to stimulate the degenerated neurons. And that is why this mushroom is finding a lot of uh, research is on for this mushroom to you know, utilize it for uh, neuron uh, uh, degenerative diseases like dementia and Alzheimer's and all that. So this is what we had it in dried form in the wild and we have been able to domesticate it, culture, and we have now been able to domesticate it and uh, bring it to fructification. The seed is available at IAHR and we have, we have uh, you know, we have almost, uh, you know, uh, conserved and, and is ready for uh, commercial production. Another important mushroom which we found in the Western Ghats was Scleroderma species found underground. And uh, this species is uh, locally eaten by the uh, population over there. They call it as cool and bay, and they um, eat it as long as the spore mass inside is white. The moment it turns grayish, then it is mature and then it is uh, not eaten. This is another, um, you know, uh, underground mushroom found from Andamans, uh, Scleroderma species. The local tribals they uh, eat it. It is peeled and it is eaten. We were able to document it, but then we have not been able to conserve it. So that is where very important uh, work needs to be done. And again, another important uh, edible mushroom, uh, Hepatica fistulina from Sikkim, uh, which we have been, which the tribals they eat it, but then we have not been able to conserve. And these are some more species, which mycorrhiza species, which we have, uh, you know, uh, done from Madhya Pradesh, but uh, yeah, this needs to be conserved. The milky caps, you know, these are the mushrooms which, which uh, give latex. When they are uh, uh, scratched, they give latex. Very tasty and very good mushrooms found in Sikkim. And the local people have been collecting and eating it, but then this needs conservation. Uh, Rusula species, again in Sikkim and Western Ghats, needs conservation. Bonitus edulis, very important edible mushroom. It's one of the prime edible mushrooms collected from the forest areas, needs to be conserved. Again, a mycorrhizal species. A lot of uh, medicinal mushrooms like Ganoderma, Ganoderma from Rajasthan, Ganoderma from uh, Gujarat, have, have been able to do it. Tramids, again, a very important medicinal mushroom. And this mushroom, uh, we have collected from the Western Ghats. We were able to domesticate it and conserve it. This is now undergoing phase two clinical trial for breast cancer. So again, a very important medicinal mushroom. Then Schizophilum commune, another very important medicinal mushroom, which we have been able to conserve from Andamans, from Rajasthan and Gujarat. And we've been able to conserve and domesticate it. Again, a very, very important mushroom, which is eaten. It is consumed in the Northeast. Uh, again, this is a, uh, you know, uh, cinnabarinus, uh, polyporous cinnabarinus. This mushroom is medicinal and also has got a dye, a water-soluble dye. And uh, these are some of the other species. This is an important species which we have collected from the Northeast and now we have domesticated it and released the commercial technology. A, a mushroom which is very high on protein. The protein content of this mushroom is 40%, higher than even soybean. So this mushroom is going to be a very important uh, part of the diet in the Northeast. And this we have been able to domesticate. Another variety from the wild, which we have been able to commercialize, domesticate and commercialize is macrocybe. A very important tropical variety, which can be grown at around 30 to 40 degrees centigrade. So this we have released, uh, we, are, we are in the process of releasing now. Uh, Pleurotus uh, pulmonaries from the wild, which we have uh, now domesticated and we are now in the process of, we have already conserved it and now we are, we are in the process of developing the commercial cultivation technology. So um, when, when it comes to utilization, it has been used as foods, as medicine. We are also propagating the idea of using mushroom technology for women, 
under Manrega for bringing it into the food system. So midday meals under the, you know, uh, for, for, for growing it in the uh, angan wise so that it becomes a part of the, uh, you know, everyday food for children. And of course, for agricultural waste management, this is a very important species. We grow it on the wastes. We can manage all the waste and we grow something very, very healthy. And in turn, we give back to the mother nature a very good form of organic carbon back to the mother nature, which is further enriched. So this is almost a zero waste technology. And then there are a lot of other mycelium based technologies, including the mushroom leather, which has become now a very important commercial technology in Finland, the vegan leather, which is now getting commercialized. So these are the ways in which uh, uh, mushrooms are being utilized uh, for, for various purposes, not only as food, but also as medicine or in the production of fungicides or in the production of packing materials, uh, organic packing materials, or including uh, vegan leather. So uh, I mean, uh, with this kind of uh, role which mushrooms play in our everyday lives, I think it's high time that we give much more importance to the conservation of these uh, species. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Meera, madam, for sharing the vast experience in mushroom within the stipulated time, its diversity in India, and its utilization also, and also congratulate the effort you made to collect the mushroom from nuke and corner of the country. Uh, madam, we have few questions also. Uh, yes. Uh, from Dr. G. Ramanandam, uh, one question is that uh, how to differentiate edible mushroom from poisonous one? Uh, it has to be identified. Uh, I mean, there's no single thumb rule. Uh, it has to be identified. But then let me just tell that just about, you know, 3% of the mushrooms are poisonous, just like the plants. Uh, but uh, the most poisonous group, which is the Amanita group, which is really lethal, uh, that can be identified as I showed you in my slides. There's a, there's a kind of a sac-like structure at the base of the uh, stipe or the stalk. So when there's a sac-like structure at the base of the stalk, if the cap is white, and if the gill region is also white and the spores are white, beware of those uh, varieties, those species. Because most of the people, you know, they have a myth about mushroom is that the colored mushrooms should not be eaten. In fact, that's a real myth because the most poisonous and the lethal mushroom, you know, where absolutely the antidote is not available, is uh, white, and that is Amanita the phylloidus. So uh, please don't go on that color of the cap and all that. It has to be identified. It has to be identified based on a number of characters. Ma'am, another question from Dr. Jayashankar. Uh, the culture, cultivation, and conservation of the diverse mushrooms you, you have identified, whether it is developed or we need to develop? Uh, many of them have been developed already. Many are in the process and many are still to be developed because, you know, the conservation of uh, mushrooms is a very, very challenging job. You know, in fact, when you go for mushroom collection in the forest areas, you have to set up a small lab in the forest itself because the material what you get is very little in quantity. Because it is in nature, it is not of, you know, it is, it is having a lot of uh, contamination. You have no time to bring it to the base station. So it's, it's a very challenging job. So uh, yes, uh, some of it has been done. Some, a lot needs to be done, in fact. Yes. Uh, Ma'am, another one from Dr. Rajit Baman. Uh, any species identified for decomposition of plastic? For decomposition of plastic? Yeah. Uh, I won't say yes to that, although there are some reports, but then uh, there, there is a big question mark on those reports. So till now, no, because these are the species which uh, require, in fact, uh, cellulose and the lignin for their growth. So till now, I won't say that uh, any mushroom is able to do it. Maybe there are fungi, you know, other groups of fungi, but no, I mean, as of now, uh, mushrooms, no. Ma'am, another from Dr. Binu Matthew, uh, where we can buy spawns of termitomyces species? Termitomyces has not yet been uh, cultured itself. It is such a challenging mushroom that at IHR we are trying. We have got some growth in our petri plates, 
but then we have to do it. So it's, that spawn is not available as of now anywhere. Nobody has been able to culture it. Globally, nobody has been able to culture it. Ma'am, uh, another few questions like from Dr. Praveen. Uh, shall we send pictures for identification to you? Um, picture, uh, through picture, it is not a very good method of identification because uh, it can be very dangerous, one thing. So I, I, I don't, uh, you know, unless until live sample is available and a lot of so many things have to be seen. So pictures will only give a probable, uh, you know, uh, identification. So I will, I, I say no to most of the time to pictures. But even for pictures, you know, when you have to take a picture for identification, it has to be through so many angles and so many aspects. You just take one mushroom, one picture and say, no, it doesn't work. The stipe, the gill, the spore print, the cap margin, the base of the cap, a lot of things. So uh, I would say, no, please don't get into the habit of identifying mushrooms based on pictures. Okay, ma'am. Uh, otherwise, uh, how we can identify that? So, next question. It has to be brought to the lab and studied. You have to see each character. Uh, a gross genus level identification can be done. But then otherwise, it has to be uh, further studied based on the spore characters, based on the... First of all, you know, unless and until you are able to kind of culture it, it doesn't make much sense to uh, study that mushroom. So first of all, when you are able to identify at least the genus, and if you are able to understand that yes, just this genus falls into the category of edible mushrooms, then please culture it. Once you have the pure culture with you, then authenticate it once again by taking the fruiting trials. Unless and until you are able to get even a single mushroom in the laboratory, you will never be able to judge whether the culture, the growth, what you have got in your petri plate or tube, whether it is belonging to that mushroom or it is something else. So once you have done that, then it's a whole series of studies which you have to do, which takes about anywhere between uh, three to five years. Ma'am, can you put some light on Pleurotus austriatus? Pleurotus austriatus is uh, the commercial species which is grown in the West. It's a low temperature species requiring temperature of around, say, somewhere around 18, 20 degrees centigrade. It's a dark colored, you know, it's a, it's a dark uh, oyster mushroom. And that is the commercial species which is uh, grown in the West. Um, thank you very much, ma'am. If uh, any Thanks, more queries are there, please uh, write down to ma'am in the mail ID, which was uh, there. Then we will move on to next presentation. Thank, thank you, you. ma'am. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I would like to introduce the next speaker, Dr. K. Pradeep. Uh, from principal scientist ICR NBPGR. Um, uh, Dr. Pradeep is working as a uh, principal scientist at ICR NBPGR, particularly in germplasm collection, characterization, taxonomic, and systematic st studies since 2003. Uh, doctor has explored through 51 trips in remote tribal, landlocked, and international bo border areas and covered more than 26 states of the country with an emphasis to Andaman and Nicobar Islands, Jammu and Kashmir, Northeast Hill region for variety of crop groups, including temperate fruits, vegetables, spices, ornamentals, medicinal plants, and forages. These efforts have resulted in collection of 4,489 accessions, including several unique germplasm and more than 85 CWR previously not collected. Producer has conducted nine trips exclusively in protected areas and four for trade specific germplasm collection. His specific research areas include systematic study of native taxa such as Zizamum, Trichosanthus, Zelium, Lufa, and Leafy amaranth developing field keys, their taxonomic identification, germplasm collection of CWR, and cucubitaceous vegetables, and buildup of correctly identified herbarium vouchers for NHCB. Dr. Pradvi has described four new taxa, reported nine CWR new to the country, soil taxonomic ambiguity prevailed in seven crops or economic species, and involved with the development of two crop varieties and registration of four germplasm. His book on Wild Relatives of Cultivated Plants in India was published by ICO, which contains details of CWR of more than 2,000 cultivated plants in India. With this brief, brief introduction, I would request Dr. Pradesa to deliver his lecture on Crop Wild Relatives, Treasure House of Genes for Mitigating Biotic and Abiotic Stresses. Yeah, very good afternoon to all of you. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. 
thanks a lot for this nice uh, introduction uh, i think that uh, our participants are a little bit bored due to many number of lectures in series in continuation so i shall be a little bit brief and uh, i will be delivering the talk on wild relatives of horticultural crops a treasure house of genes for mitigating the effect of abiotic and biotic stresses this wild relatives are now gaining much importance and there are series of papers appearing now in the recently concluded uh, second international agrobiodiversity congress held at home uh, there was a separate uh, theme on uh, ex situ and in situ conservation of crop wild relatives and land races so that itself indicates the importance of this topic in nbfjr at national level also we are gaining uh, giving more importance for the collection of crop wild relatives but certainly there are about uh, uh, 30 to 40 percentage of the germplasm collections belong to this uh, particular crop uh, group uh, crop wild relatives category and also there are many in, uh, young scientists who are working on uh, many uh, crop groups they are coming forward and asking about the germplasm of wild materials for systematic studies and for uh, uh, utilizing them in crop improvement programs so this chapter is gaining momentum so i shall be uh, talking a, a little bit about the uh, horticultural crops wild relatives and uh, more particularly about the biotic and abiotic uh, tolerant traits what they can offer with uh, what are the limitations available in the current uh, perspective like that so as we all know Shall I share my screen, or it should be? Hello, organizers. Yeah, you can share oh. from your side. Yeah, you have a control. If you share from there, that is advantage. Put it in the presentation mode, uh, Doctor. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. During domestication process, the crops have gained a lot of beneficial traits. Thus, we all know non-shattering, then dwarf plant type, determinate type, non-dormancy, like that. At the same time, the crops also lost. Importantly, the genetic diversity has been eroded, lost, and uh, resultingly, they are vulnerable to pests and diseases. So, the genetic basis. reduced due to domestication process but uh, that uh, genetic base need to be broadened because the modern plant breeding lies based on the broader genetic base otherwise uh, the crop will be susceptible to numerous natural calamities as well as biotic elements so uh, knowing about this fact breeders have started searching for the genes and they first started searching for the genes within the native within the crop species itself uh, there are many number of genes identified in most of the times especially for biotic and abiotic stress they don't normally get the genes for the uh, these uh, traits no normally for the qualitative traits people will get materials within the species within the crop but for abiotic stress we have to go for the nearby close relatives or the related species like that so here comes the role of crop wild relative what are crop wild relatives they are wild taxa closely related to crop plants including uh, wild progenitors or wild forms of crops that means that there are some native crops available in the country which has got both cultivated as well as the wild forms in india there are about 150 crops of uh, agricultural importance they are having wild as well as dd wild as well as uh, cultivated forms available in the country so that wild forms of the crops also included as the crop wild relative they also wild progenitor from which the crop has evolved closely related taxa all these comprises of crop wild relative sometimes the search has gone beyond the genus boundary also in case of commercial crops like wheat and barley even in horticulture crops you can say citrus uh, like that uh, in uh, 2018 
Khodjin and uh, Hajar, they surveyed 20 crops, out of which cultivars of 17 crops had genes from crop pollinators. And also there is steady increase in the uh, research on uh, incorporating the resistance from biotic and diabetic stress tolerance from the uh, crop oil relatives. How uh, crop oil relatives can be specified? Can we treat all the species which are coming under the genus boundary as crop oil relatives? No. Since uh, in many cases, like in Indian contest, we have more than 100 ficus species. Can we treat all the 100 species of uh, ficus under uh, as a wild relative, certainly no. We need to have some yardsticks available. Like uh, there is one uh, concept called the gene pool concept that is uh, by Harlan in the year 1971, he developed it based on the cross of the cytogenetic relationships. He has established gene pool one, gene pool two, gene pool three. Gene pool one belongs to the wild forms and the crop progenitors. Gene pool two materials can be easily, they cannot be easily crossable, but can be crossed. Uh, with the difficulty, GP3 needs some special tools to accomplish the process. In most of the crops, the gene pool concept, uh, this is not available. Since crossability studies have not been made, particularly in horticultural crops, uh, that has not been done in all the uh, important crops. So here comes the concept of uh, taxon group concept by Max Ted. He is a leading authority in crop world relatives. He hold this uh, concept based on the Infra generic classification, that is, every genus, uh, every uh, big genus, which has been divided into several subgenus, uh, some each subgenus with the different uh, sections, then each section with a different series. And uh, within the series, if a cultivated belong, uh, plant belongs to that particular series, then we can say that uh, those other species which are occurring in that particular series can be safely considered as crop oil relatives. Then there is a existence of natural hybrid. If there is a existence of natural hybrids or successful artificial hybrids, then we can say they are related species. Then homologous chromosomes or chromosome number is same. Then we can say they are more or less related species. Relationship can be further established through molecular means, polynological means, biochemical geography like that. There is many other informal ways of identifying crop oil relatives also there. Then, uh, as I already told that prioritization is crucial for the developing countries like India. And we have shortlisted 110 horticultural crops for which uh, 564 uh, crop oil relatives have been uh, shortlisted. Based on this further, we have made some prioritization based on the four criteria like economic fundus of the crops per se, the level of closeness of crop oil relatives to the crops, and then uh, if the crop oil relatives are uh, processing the traits of breeders' interest or they are already under the wide hybridization process, then we can give more priority for, the, for it. Then if they, if they are having narrow distribution or if they are threatened species, then we need to give more priority for that species. Based on this four point criteria from four, uh, 564 taxa, 163 taxa were further prioritized. Out of this prioritized species, we have collected only 100 species. Even in this 100 species also, ecosystem approach is missing. That is the representative sampling from uh, different ecosystems, different habitats, uh, different altitudinal levels are missing. That means we need to give a lot of emphasis in collecting adequate representations of the prioritized taxa. And uh, coming to the accessions collected, in vegetables, it, that uh, level is a little good since because it is easily bankable. We can easily conserve the seeds in uh, gene banks. In other crops like uh, uh, fruits, some are, most of them are orthodox and uh, they need to be maintained in the field or they need some special uh, storage situations like that. So the, uh, only as of now, only 3,825 accessions of crop oil related so Articles of crops are available in NBVGR particularly. As we all know, there are a lot of examples of uh, how crops benefited from the genes from CWR. Especially, I can say two major things uh, in horticultural crops, like it was a single gene from India for downy mildew resistance that has saved muskmelon crop in the United States. 
Then there is one more example of salt tolerance in cultivated tomato derived from the gene from uh, Galapagos Islands plant, that is Solanum cheese mani. Earlier it was called Lycopersinum like cheese mani. So these two are the good examples of how uh, that uh, crop oil latex were used in crop improvement and uh, it was a big success. Crop oil latex can be a, a, a material from exotic uh, places or it can be a native material. But for the crops of Indian origin, for native crop uh, crops, the native crop oil latex gains important. Why means, uh, according to Lipic, 1970, highest degree of pest resistance controlled by dominant genes can be expected from the center of origin, where the crop, its close latex and pest co-occur. So that means uh, if you want to have the, uh, if you want to have the resistance for the abiotic and biotic stress tolerance for uh, crops, then we can certainly uh, look into its close relatives, which are very well occurring within India. It, it is holding good for more than 150 native crops for which all close wild relatives occur in India. And this will work well. And for, uh, as I already told, for abiotic stress tolerance, habitat or environment has to be taken as a yardstick. And for the biotic uh, stresses, hotspots we need to identify. And we, in that hotspot, we have to go and uh, look for the resistant material in that hotspot situation. So, uh, coming to the different components of biotic and abiotic stresses, this I think you all know, so I can skip this slide safely. Importance of uh, biotic and abiotic stresses in horticulture crops, their yield losses and uh, what they do in uh, crops, uh, this also not important, I understand. I can straight away go to the subject. Uh, coming nowadays, now onwards, I will be talking about the different uh, uh, species and uh, their contribution for abiotic and uh, biotic stress tolerance. Mostly the information gleaned from this source, World Relatives of Cultivated Plants in India, ICR published book, from which the inform information has been generated. Uh, first, we will see the citrus fruits. Citrus is a wonderful genus where uh, we have got many fruit crops and also all the species of citrus are crossable with one another. That is a peculiarity. There are many natural hybrids also exist, hybrid species also available. Now, as far as India is concerned, Northeast India is a potential rich source of citrus genetic resources, wild species. And we have got citrus gene century also in Meghalaya. And uh, there are species which are, uh, which can offer scope for uh, uh, resistance to greening disease, very notorious disease devastated number of orchards in Northeast and other places. And uh, there are also solutions for uh, sclerosis and uh, viroid, excocortis viroid diseases. Cold, uh, there are species for cold tolerance and uh, high rainfall level, like that. There are many species in India we need to explore properly and we need to incorporate the traits to the cultivated background. In case of crops uh, like apple, we have two species of apple uh, wild species occurring in India, both in Himalayas. Malus sikimensis only confined to Eastern Himalaya and uh, Malus paketa variety Himalayaka, which is occurring in uh, inner Himalayas. And uh, uh, this paketa variety Himalayaka has got a lot of resistance. So, uh, it has resistance for many diseases in addition to that cold and drought. And Malus sikimensis less worked species and we don't have good collection also of this species, but it is reported to be resistant to powdery mildew and color rot. Coming to the mango, we have five, six species in India. Uh, out of that, uh, uh, Manchifera nicobarica is a very much endangered and a very restricted species uh, occurring in uh, Nicobar, uh, Great Nicobar Island. Uh, then Manchifera camptosperma is uh, another species uh, which is tolerant to submergence and it possesses ovipressional antigenosis to oriental fruphates, so work from IHR recently published. And uh, uh, there are sources for uh, submergence tolerance from uh, Mangifera andamanica. However, there are 
lot of uh, uh, lot of uh, problems associated with the mango cultivation like uh, we need to have the resistant sources for anthracnose disease mango malformation there is no clue nowadays also about the resistant source powdery mildew gall mites these are all urgently needed i doubt that uh, these uh, resistant sources are available in mango crop therefore screening the wild species is very uh, that assumes huge importance coming to banana the beauty of banana is that uh, both the uh, sections radaclivis and uh, musa available in india they are all x equal to 11 they are easily crossable to one another and uh, all the seeded bananas and uh, we have musa sicimensis tolerant to abiotic stresses musa balbisiana one of the parent one of the uh, progenitor for the cultivated banana and uh, we have uh, people have developed uh, plantain varieties with the black cicotaca resistance uh, this is resistance by utilizing this gene and uh, it is has it has good potential for uh, fast climate adaptation also uh, there are some more species like musa nagensium tolerant to drought musa pushpanjeliana this species i wanted to emphasize uh, since this species i we have found it in about 2200 meters altitude normally you won't find banana in such altitude it has got excellent definitely it may have cold tolerance in it and it's a very gigantic plant which reaches up to the height of 10 meters musa arnata resistant to cicadogal is spot a ornamental species musa itinerans tolerant to water logging and drought musa rubra it's a rhizomatous species and it has got good tolerance to cicadaca parama notorious uh, diseases of for uh, banana cultivation cambering banana cultivation it is also tolerant to drought coming to the prune species we have got more than 26 species available in india but uh, most of them are distantly related to cultivated crops uh, but there are few examples like uh, prune stomandosa it's a cherry relative it's a source of cold hardiness and it is resistant to powdery mildew and cherry leaf spot it is occurring in jammu kashmir inner himalayas then another species prunus mira it is available in uttarakhand and uh, himachal pradesh uh, alpine areas it is resistant to uh, peach aphid powdery mildew and nematodes and also it's one of the important sources for the early flowering of the peach very well extensively used by the uh, breeders uh, then vitis we have three species available there out of that uh, three species all uh, vitis species available in india are belong into the subgenus which is they are easily crossable so these characters which are uh, present in uh, this wild species can be easily transferable uh, then pear we have pyrus pasia a progenitor of pear which is extensively distributed in northeast india and himalaya and it is uh, resistant to root rot coming to the next crop group vegetables okra India is a wonderful country in the sense that we have got almost all the species of okra uh, in available in India except uh, obelmastus manicot true manicot is not existed in India otherwise all the species are available in India uh, that way india uh, india is lucky enough and uh, there are two important wild relatives of okra close relatives uh, okra that is obelmastus ficulnius and obelmastus tuberculatus Uh, they were uh, uh, tuberculosis is tolerant to bendy yellow in my suppliers important disease for hampering the uh, cultivation of okra it uh, leads to tremendous yield loss and ambelmastus ficulnius is resistant to inhalation leaf curl virus uh, then ambelmastus retrophilus little distant relative it is resistant to bendy yellow in my suppliers there is two more uh, taxa ambelmastus pungens and recently discovered species ambelmastus pungens variety misoramensis both have uh, found to be resistant to uh, yellow wing mosaic virus and a new species described by uh, nb bijar trishur abelmuskus nb bijarensis it is also found to be a source of uh, yellow wing mosaic virus it is a is a restricted distributed material coming to the next crop watermelon chitula scolot holos in this it is called tastumpa or kalingda Yeah, and it is a important source of resistance to various viruses white flies and aphids then uh, there is uh, uh, another crop let us called a uh, vegetable crop cold season vegetable crop 
Its progenitor species is Lactuca seriola, which is available as a weedy species in uh, northwestern plains, including Jammu Kashmir, Punjab. And it's resistant to downy mildew and to mosaic virus. And its resistance to downy mildew has been transferred to lettuce. That's a great achievement. Coming to cucumber, we have got two important uh, material. There are many uh, cucumber species available, but uh, from these two, some disease resistance screening work has been made. Uh, Cucumis hardwicki, progenitor of cucumber, and uh, some resistance to powdery mildew, downy mildew, viruses, nematode, cold tolerance also exhibited. In case of uh, uh, Cucumis hystrix, interconnection lines with the cucumber exhibited the resistance to downy mildew. And it is a very, very rare niche specific species occurring in selected packets in Mehalaya and uh, Mizoram and uh, Manipur. I mean, to musk melon, uh, it's a weedy form that is Cucumis mellows of species aggressive occurring throughout the country. And it is resistant to melon yellow virus, melon decline virus uh, disease also. And uh, it's, it's resistance to melon decline uh, disease has been transferred uh, to cultivated subspecies mellow. Then Cucumis callosus, it is a fruit fly resistant species basically. And it is also a yeah, resistance source for uh, fusarium wilt, downy mildew resistance, and also a tolerant down. This is also occurring in the drier part of the country. And coming to the next cucurbitaceous crop, that is bitter gourd. Uh, bitter gourd, uh, the wild form that is called Mamatica sherentia variety mirigata. It is tolerant to uh, pumpkin caterpillar, root knot nematode, and uh, several accessions have showed a tolerance to fruit fly. So fruit fly is an important uh, insect damaging the crop. Even in the immature stage also, it lays eggs and it is creating problem even for germ blossom collection also. When we go for collecting uh, this particular species, very difficult to get a record number of samples for uh, sending to gene bank. So this fruit fly is an important problem. Another important wild species close to bitter gourd is balsamina, Momatica balsamina. It also has resistance to various uh, stresses, mainly the biotic stresses. Then tisal guard, wild relatives, that is pine guard is a relative, that is Momadica diaca. It has got resistance to pumpkin caterpillar, gallfly, uh, root knot nematode. Then uh, there is a new species in, uh, by NPVCR, that is Momadica shadrika, that also has some resistance information. Coming to the next crop, brinjal. Brinjal is an important native crop of India and uh, there are many wild species which are closely associated with the brinjal. And uh, uh, Solanum insanum is a very common species. Uh, there are uh, literature sources um, that is mentioning that uh, Solanum incanum is tolerant to frost and it's uh, interspecific hybrid with the brinjal is tolerant, resistant to fruit borer and cereal bit. But uh, um, this is the real true picture of Solanum in Canada. Uh, the number of uh, spines based on the number of spines and the nature of the spines, tomatoes nature. Uh, but in most of the Indian literatures, what they claim as Solanum in Canada means nothing but Solanum in Sana. So whatever researches which are made for uh, Solanum in Canada are mostly uh, dubious material. Since uh, Solanum incanum is restricted only in a narrow packet of uh, Northwest India. Otherwise, whatever we are seeing in India are nothing but Solanum insanum project. So uh, we need to be very careful about the uh, taxonomic, true taxonomic identity of the material we are studying. Solanum virum, uh, it was informed that uh, gene has been transferred for fissural wilt, bacterial wilt, and uh, frost tolerant to brinjal. But when we see, look at that species for disease screening for resistance to bacterial wilt, we found it is susceptible to bacterial wilt. Maybe due to the existence of different strains or the genotype itself is susceptible that we have to see. There are one more uh, wild species, Solanum lasiocarpum, occurring in Northeast and Andaman Nicobar Islands. And it is resistant, so reported to be resistant to fruit borer, possibly because it is having woolly natured fruit, which is very difficult for the insects to lay the eggs over it. That may be the reason. 
then solana power boom is reported to be resistant to capital bit even in kerala agriculture university and many other universities they are trained to promote it as a root stock for brinza and then solana virginiana it is resistant to food borer bacterial wilt at formosis however under thrissur condition we found it susceptible to bacterial wilt coming to the other vegetable crops very important crop is onion we have got allium royale occurring in a very sporadic locations in jammu kashmir himachal and uttaranchal and that is found to be resistant to downy mildew and its downy mildew resistance has been successfully transferred to onion then there is one more species ipomia literalis a south american species now found to be naturalized in east coast of india and it has been reported to have some resistant to some diseases then another one uh, trichosanthus cucumina subspecies willowsula which occurs above 1500 meters altitude which may offer tolerance for cold coming to the other crops ginger and turmeric soft rot is important problem in uh, ginger cultivation and this wild species which is occurring in forest areas of india it can offer a uh, source of resistance like uh, gingerbread jirambat then curcuma aromatica uh, can be uh, it's a wild relative of uh, turmeric and is free from leaf blotch under the field condition it need to be tested artificially then black pepper the important uh, pest is pollu beetle the wild species like piper barberry and piper attenuator uh, their resistance were reported to be transferred then vanilla we have two wild species which are having some tolerance to diseases rose rosa clinophylla is a subtropical species which is a source of heat tolerance uh, reported to be source of heat tolerance then arica triandra is tolerant to mite uh, in, in the context of uh, arikanat improvement uh, coming to the uh, oh, wide hybridization work uh, which is done in nbpgr uh, that why uh, yellow and mice virus is important is serious this uh, uh, which is hampering the uh, yield uh, it has uh, it incurred serious loss in uh, okra cultivation and nbpgr team has Uh, worked on uh, their in the wide specific wide uh, hybridization program uh, seven uh, leading varieties of uh, okra have been taken and they were crossed with the eight wild germ blossom including nbbgrns pungens marshetus tetrapilus and manihot species and uh, as usual that inter specific hybrids were developed after that uh, the main problem here wide hybridization is that uh, they are having very different number of chromosomes and there are chromosome numbers are very vast array of chromosome numbers are there so uh, their fertility of the f1 is a question mark most of them 99% of the materials are sterile in nature so in order to restore their fertility colchicin uh, 0.1% have been applied in the two leaf stage in the collar region so resultingly out of 10 successful process we could able to achieve uh, ambi diploids in case of four combinations that is arca anamica into marshetus then arca anamica into pungens spusa savani into pungens spusa savani into pungens different uh, accessions so these ambi diploids they are further backcrossed with the cultivated okra and uh, we could find very good results on omb the uh, resistance under field conditions and it is now being carried forward here one thing we should note uh, the uh, all the 10 have flowered but uh, their uh, f1s have been found to be sterile and they are uh, not setting any seeds and uh, the uh, jrph material that is a collection from nashadan uh, they accepted good cross compatibility and growth parameters to wide OAV tolerance, and this has been found to be a good source of tolerance for crossing and development in ambi diploid program. This is the field view of that uh, uh, tolerant and uh, resist, uh, susceptible material. Susceptible material is uh, uh, okra, and the, these are the ambi diploids. You can see the very well their uh, resistance uh, expressed in the field. Uh, uh, kindly Coming point. to 
okay okay another two, one two minutes uh, uh, some important consideration i want to uh, mention here is that the correctness of the taxonomic identity we need to ensure uh, in most of the cases in npv in, in uh, icrld sa setups uh, it is not very uncommon that we are using the correct identity of the material. there are in some cases uh, identity of the materials need or seems to be doubtful that we need to ensure then adequate representativeness we need to uh, make uh, we need to uh, collect the germplasm with the adequate represent, uh, ecosystem representativeness. Since many times there is uh, there is uh, reporting information that uh, such and such species is tolerant to resistance to this so and so, but uh, when uh, researchers uh, uh, do actually the experiment, it may, may not be explicit. So our suggestion is that you try to have the uh, good number of uh, accessions in the trial then we can expect the resistance. If you uh, narrow down the uh, germplasm accessions, there may not be possibility to get the resistance. Then fine grain sampling is proposed for the disease-free uh, germplasm collecting from hotspot areas. And uh, the areas like Himalayas, uh, then coastal areas, Thar Desert will be the rich source for diabetic stress tolerance. Like here we can go for even fine grain survey of uh, germplasm collecting. Then here, out of 163 high priority taxa, only 57 have been found to be possessing uh, the traits that uh, this literature information is there. But uh, I am sure that uh, many of things need to be done. Um, uh, all the other species need to be thoroughly studied for various characters, various uh, traits. And uh, out of this 57 also, less than 10 only have been successfully incorporated into cultivated uh, background. But uh, now I don't know uh, whether they are continued or whether they will, that work is discontinued. This type of uh, work needs long time goal and uh, uh, commitment. And then screening wild species uh, for tolerance at the field in to do, then we need to go for artificial testing. Artificial testing is must. And more important is linking the tolerance traits with the associated morphologic traits. If we can do this job, then it will be easy while during going for exploration itself, collecting. Uh, this uh, uh, linked traits will certainly will have that uh, tolerance. Uh, uh, this is a problem, likelihood type. So this uh, associated morphology trait we need to uh, uh, we need to trace out. Then ample potential is existing in some general like citrus, mangifera, musa, vitis, tonis. Here, all the wild species occurring in India, uh, they have um, they can be easily crossable with the cultivated one. And they also possess uh, rootstock value. Then uh, we have to alleviate the problems associated with wide hybridization from biological, biotechnological intervention. And more important, we need to conserve the pollen of uh, perennial species. Since uh, many a times, like mango, uh, wild species, their flowering time is different from cultivated species flowering. And if we can conserve pollens, uh, if we can conserve the pollen in uh, pollen, in cryo bank, then uh, when we need a race, we can uh, do uh, wide hybridization. And also another one important thing is we need to shorten the breeding cycle, especially for the food crop, since the gestation period is very high. This is all about uh, my presentation. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Pradeep, sir, for briefing the crop wild relatives and how it's utilized in biotic stress and abiotic stress, specific to fruits like citrus, apple, mango, banana, pruna species, and whites, and vegetables like okra, watermelon, lettuce, cucumber, muskmelon, bitter gourd, diesel gourd, brinjal, onion, sweet potato, and snake gourd, and other crops also. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so we have not received any questions so far. Yes, okay. Uh, Dr. Pradeep, I really congratulate you for uh, taking us to the world of uh, wild relatives. It's uh, uh, you know, a real uh, pleasure to see that uh, you have become one of the uh, leading light in this uh, area. I have a few uh, <clears throat> few queries to you. Uh, in your uh, mango wild relatives, uh, you mentioned only about the Andaman collection. What about the Northeast, which uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Tridip Sariga was mentioning some three species. Yes, sir. Actually, hmm. yeah. 
uh, i understand sir actually manchifera sylvatica is a important wild relative that is the closest relative of mango and uh, as far as i understand there is no collection of that material available in any of our knox site no, and uh, it, yeah dr shankaran our uh, mango breeder is telling he is having that collection so he is not right because you are a better uh, taxonomist than uh, i uh, one year back i contacted uh, dr sangaran he told it is not there uh, with the with the ih yeah. yeah. see then uh, another issue which uh, uh, i am seeing with uh, all the breeders see, the breeders are very reluctant to deal with the wild relatives because you know you need lot of hard work and even if you do hard work there is no guarantee that you are end up in uh, very good results so because of that only few crops see for example in ihr we are successful in uh, tomato we are uh, successful in uh, uh, <clears throat> watermelon and uh, muskmelon uh, using the wild relative for getting the uh, stress tolerant varieties in other crops the breeders are very very reluctant i feel you know nbbjr has to do lot of uh, work like how i feel the success story of nbbjr in the abel moscus is a real eye opener and uh, what is the status of uh, those uh, uh, abel moscus uh, lines sir uh, back cross work is going on this year also we have raised that crop and the back crossing with the cultivated material is going on sir and it will take another 2 or 3 years to come out with some good results Okay. but they are interestingly interestingly omb resistance is still uh, there very good results is there Mean, means around 90 95% materials are disease free in uh, your view how to improve the use of these wild relatives uh, as you rightly mentioned we have uh, more than 3000 uh, uh, wild relatives of different uh, uh, crops available with us and uh, you have a very good collection at nbpr also but as far as the use is concerned it is not very you know impressive so what you feel you know what will make uh, us to use it better and i think uh, to deal with the climate change uh, this is the only way what do you feel sir more workforce has to be involved in this uh, particular subject there is to be many funded externally funded projects we yeah. should get and uh, we should start working on uh, screening all the wild species for important diseases important pests which are uh, affecting the uh, yield which are uh, affecting the last uh, yield uh, those things first screen and find the resistant material then we need to do in case of cottage crops very important thing is the shortening of breeding cycle that one if some uh, i am especially i am not in that field but that is crucial that is important Now, first of all we should have that uh, so material good material available with us in hand for that, for that we need to increase the screening work yeah that is uh, yeah uh, i agree with and uh, another issue which uh, you are mentioning is the you know ecosystem representative and i feel that, that is very difficult in this uh, species because uh, you know if you go to any place you will not get the sufficient samples to meet your uh, gene bank standards i think we have to relax uh, that uh, standards in the case of the wild relatives don't you think yes so? sir yes sir you are absolutely correct sir we also face the same problem nowadays uh, the gene bank people they have relaxed the standards even for uh, uh, important wild relatives uh, 200 uh, seeds also uh, they are considering considering yeah. for long term storage uh, but not for all the wild species but those which are difficult to conserve those type of groups uh, even 200 seeds now they are considering that is a positive development thank you very much for enlightening us on the importance of the wild relatives and uh, you know i think you have covered lot of area and i really appreciate your work and uh, i don't think uh, you know uh, in, now anybody is there other than you and dr joseph john who can uh, we can tell us you know uh, identify the species and uh, collections made from different area it's really wonderful to uh, see your presentation and uh, wishing you all the best uh, thank you for uh, once again for uh, joining online and enlightening the participants on uh, this aspect it is really wonderful thank you so much uh, organizers for giving me this opportunity i hope we will be collaborating soon in some any of some externally funded projects i yeah. hope
Thank you so much, sir, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, yes, we all know that the wild relatives and the wild species are the potential, potential genetic resources which can be made use in the future improvement programs. When we have to deal with uh, uh, breeding for uh, improvement, the improvement of the quantitative traits and also improvement uh, with regard to pest and disease uh, resistance or any kind of abiotic resistance. So that was a very informative uh, lecture from your side. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, with this, uh, we, have uh, we have come to the uh, concluding session of today's program. Uh, so we started with a very beautiful uh, lecture on strobilanthus, its diversity, and then uh, we continue to rose uh, the diversity of medicinal plants, followed by spices, the vegetable crops, plantation crops, and we have also seen the diversity. MCQ is there. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, one more MCQ is there. Uh, so, uh, Sridhar, sir, can you just uh, put in the chat box? Yeah, this is with regard to Dr. Pradeep's uh, lecture. So, participants can start answering. So now we have reduced to 102 participants. Hundred are hundred plus are there. Sir, please check the connection at your end, Subesh sir, because it's opening for others. Today, sir, it's available in the chat box. The link is given in the chat box. You can uh, show the answers, uh, the responses. Yes. I think Dr. Pradeep's uh, presentation is well taken by the participants. Mm, that is something. Only the, the yeah, question. last question is answered by most of the participants. Correct. Yeah. 
So what is the third question? I think uh, we can close. Sir, uh, we can close the link, sir. Thank people and uh, let them join tomorrow at the... Yeah. Thank so with this, we are concluding today's session. And uh, we will meet tomorrow at uh, 9.30 a.m. with the same link, with the same password. And uh, please uh, take care to be on time because uh, if we delay in the morning, then the entire program uh, will be delayed. Uh, uh, then again, we would have to reduce the time for lunch. So better uh, be on time so that everything goes on as per the schedule. Uh, so till then, uh, greetings to you all and we'll meet tomorrow. Thank you.